Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Joint Statutory Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission for a private meeting today from 3.30 p.m. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Pratt. President, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator. Yesterday, Black. I accidentally posted a photo on my social media, which I'm aware is not permitted within the standing orders, and I apologise to the Senate for this. I take the opportunity to correct the record on a statement I made to this place yesterday uh, in relation to when, the fo when photos were deleted. I had deleted photos from my phone uh, at the time I made that uh, report. Uh, the Instagram feed, which was accidentally made, I learned was not the case because I did not know of its existence. It has been deleted and I apologise to the Senate for this inadvertent mislead of the Senate and I take the opportunity this morning to clarify that statement at the earliest opportunity. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day No. 30, Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Nampajinka Price. Oh, beg you, oh, beg your pardon, I didn't see the crossed out lines. They're very light. Senator Van. Uh, thank you, President. Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Rights states that, and I quote, Everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realised. However, what we have seen in areas in the Northern Territory is the blatant disregard and blatant violation of this and many, many more basic human rights. 
And what is worse is that the violation of these rights are being fuelled by this government's incoherent, ideologically driven and socially destabilising policies. After the last election, the Albanese Labor government made a choice. They made a choice to actively do nothing and let the Stronger Futures Northern Territory Act of 2012 lapse, leading the Territory Labor government to implement an opt-in model rather than an opt-out model with communities not required to have any alcohol management plans in place. To be clear, this government, the Albanese Labor government, knew that the communities in Northern Territory had problems with alcohol and alcohol-related violence. And the choice they made was to do nothing. And by doing nothing, they increased people's access and its availability to alcohol. Not taking an action is a choice. We must remember that, Mr Deputy President. And the choice that the government made was to help fuel alcohol-related violence in our most vulnerable communities. And we see that this came true after all the warnings that were given to them. There was an increase of 54 per cent of alcohol-related assaults alone after this policy change. The explanatory memorandum states that the bill before us today, the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023, is a bill for an act to make provisions for all Territorians to be safe consuming and being exposed to alcohol and alcohol-related harm and violence in the Northern Territory. However, it is more than that. It is a bill that will undo the socially and economically destructive approach that the Albanese government has taken towards managing violence in the Northern Territory. This bill will reintroduce elements of the previous Stronger Futures Northern Territory Act and a legal framework to tackle alcohol abuse while putting in place requirements for the Northern Territory Labor government to work with communities to demonstrate a community-driven alcohol management plan for a reinstated opt-out model. It will also, importantly, ensure safe measures are in place for consumers of alcohol, their children, families and communities, upholding the human rights of some of the most vulnerable citizens of Australia right across the Northern Territory, and it will help do this by ensuring that the supply of alcohol is regulated, mitigating illegal alcohol supply and provide a framework for prosecution. Now, if the fly-in, fly-out Prime Minister spent some actual time in these communities, he would see the harm that he has caused by letting the <coughs> pardon me, Stronger Futures Northern Territory Act lapse after the last election. But no, we see that in his last trip to Alice Springs, he managed to spend more time at the Australian Open uh, across the following days than he did in the Territory. It was really just for a photo op. Spending less than four hours in Alice Springs and then holding a press conference is not good enough. That is not leadership. It is clear when he went there without an object it's clear he went there without an objective other than to get a photo. But that is a defining feature that we are learning about this government. They spend all their time making grandiose statements and make good sound bites for their social media pages and makes them feel good. But when it actually comes to delivering outcomes and improving the lives of Australians, they are failing at every step. As Senator Nabjimpa Price said in her second reading speech, and I quote, this bill was drafted in response to the calls from vulnerable community members across the Northern Territory, such as a letter dated 9 June representing nine separate Aboriginal organisations seeking urgent support from the Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians after failed attempts at communities, these concerns with the Northern Territory piles government. Unlike many Unlike many of the private senators' bill that we see come from the Greens or from Labor when they were in opposition, who put forward bills to grandstand and make themselves seem relevant, this bill before us today is because of an urgent need that the government has been ignoring. The Australian Institute of Criminology has told us that there is, a strong, that there is strong evidence 
of an association between the consumption of alcohol and violence. This fact has been known for quite some time. My friend, my good friend and colleague, pointed this out to this government from this place many, many times. All the statistics back this up. Alcohol-related assaults in Alice Springs alone have risen from December 2021 to December 2022 by 54.6 per cent, and property damage has increased by 59.6 per cent. Now, those opposites, opposites should just let that sink in a bit. Under this government, uh, under this government's watch, alcohol-related assaults in Alice Springs alone rose by 54.6 per cent. That is a damning statistic. And reports overnight show how effective alcohol restrictions can be. After some restrictions uh, were re-implemented in January, in just one month, youth disturbances declined by 36.36 per cent. Unlawful entries across Alice Springs between January 2 and 30 this year dropped by 45.96 per cent. Alcohol as a factor in domestic violence was down 27.7 per cent and alcohol has decreased to being a factor in 47 per cent of the 92 domestic violence incidents. Yet those opposite still decide to ignore the facts. They need to start listening to the experts and listening to the facts and stop applying this ideological driven approach to dealing with what is a very complex and difficult matter. Senator David Pocock spoke in this chamber earlier on this bill. And while I disagree uh, with him on his position on the bill, I do agree with him when he said that fixing these issues will be long and hard. And this is a step in the right direction. This government cannot be sitting on their hands and doing nothing anymore. With all the talk of the Labor government wanting to implement an Indigenous voice to Parliament, I think it would be more pertinent and useful if they stopped ignoring the Indigenous voices that actually are in Parliament. They are the elected representatives who are screaming out on behalf of their communities on what they want and what they need. But instead, they ignore the very voices that they say they need to listen to. This government must take urgent action to restore the rule of law. The federal government must provide law enforcement and social services resources to the Northern Territory to give the people of Alice Springs and other remote communities the law and order that they desperately need. The stories that we have heard coming out of Central Australia as a result of the alcohol fuelled crimes are heartbreaking. No one should have to live in those conditions. I encourage everyone here to vote in favour of this bill for the good of all Australians. Thank you. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023. I would like to thank Senator Nampajiba Price for providing an opportunity for us in this chamber to discuss the current situation in Central Australia. And I want to thank her for sharing her experiences with her family in Central Australia and some of her personal reflections on some of the heartbreaking situations. It's not often in this place that we get to share concerns about the same matter, but in this instance we do. I also want to thank Senator Malandiri McCarthy for her speech on this bill. Senator McCarthy spoke so openly about her experiences and I thank her for her strength in entrusting us to share in a small way her story. We as a country are made stronger by having First Nations Australians in, the, in federal parliament. And I'm looking forward to seeing our numbers continue to grow as the years progress. It is important that First Nations voices are listened to in these debates. Deputy President, it is clear that there is work to do in the Northern Territory to make communities safer. More needs to be done to improve community safety and support community members to thrive. And we know that when you work with and listen to local communities, you achieve better outcomes. This bill is, pri uh, pri is primarily a repackaging of the racist Stronger Futures legislation in that it imposes federal alcohol restrictions onto the Northern Territory. 
Since the lapsing of the Stronger Futures legislation last year, the Northern Territory Government has legislated new alcohol restrictions and are getting on with the job of supporting Territorians. Alcohol restrictions are only one part of the solution, and the Northern Territory and Australian governments are working together to improve the underlying causes of community unrest. Communities on the ground are already seeing a difference. I know my colleague, Member for Lingyari, Marion Scrimshaw, is working extremely hard and closely with local community members and organisations to deliver the best results in the Northern Territory. This bill is superfluous. In fact, last sitting week, when this very real bill was being debated, my news feed was flooded with some very interesting headlines, and some, with, some that I'll share with this chamber this morning. The Australian headline had the Australian had headlines that suggest that crime falls in Alice Springs after, after alcohol trial. The Daily Telegraph, crime plummets in Alice Springs after one month of alcohol restrictions. On Sky News, crime rates begin to decline in Alice Springs. Deputy President, uh, Senator Dodson tabled a report of the Joint Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs on, this, on its inquiry into community safety support services and job opportunities in the Northern Territory. I am proud to be a member of this committee that's doing incredibly important work, work, and I thank all witnesses who contributed to this inquiry. The inquiry was established in this very chamber to inquire into community safety, support services and job opportunities in the Northern Territory, with particular reference to the preparation of the sunsetting of the Stronger Futures legisl legislation, community safety and alcohol management, job opportunities and community development program reform, justice reinvestment community services, and any related matters. These matters were considered together because we all know that alcohol restrictions are only one part of the problem. We need to work on the social and economic drivers of community unrest. The committee's final report states, and I quote, it is clear to the committee that the Northern Territory Government has sufficient legislative means to manage alcohol-related harm within its jurisdiction where there is will to do so. This has been demonstrated by its recent legislative amendments to the Liquor Act 2019. It is the view of the committee that this is the appropriate role of the Northern Territory Government, informed by the view of the community rather than the Commonwealth. Deputy President, these are the words of the Joint Committee of this Parliament. Those opposite are already in agreement with that report. This bill is not necessary, it is not needed, and it is mostly just a lot of hot air. President, may I, Deputy President, may I suggest that Senator Nabajiba Price starts focusing on ways she can tangibly support her constituents, the communities she is here to represent. May I suggest that the Senator focus her efforts on ways to support territory residents. May I suggest that she has a word with her colleagues about the significant and hugely damaging cuts we saw in the last decade under the coalition government. Because we certainly know that these challenges in the Northern Territory didn't arise overnight, certainly not in the last, just the last 10 months. It's accumulation of a decade of neglect. We know that the only solutions that work are the ones that come from, commu come from the community by empowering them and working with First Nations communities to find solutions. When we thrust solutions onto communities, we know that those solutions don't work. We've seen under the previous government what it looks like when solutions don't come from First Nations communities. And I want to share just one example of what that is. The cashless debit card, a program crafted by, crafted by the coalition without coming from the community. It was shown that it didn't result in widespread or sustained benefits. It was poorly targeted, led to no discernible improvements in employment outcomes. It damaged financial management skills, led to social stigmatism and exclusion. It increased stress, financial harassment and discrimination. The Albanese Labor government has already made solid inroads to ensuring any income management programs are designed and managed according to what the community say they need. Perhaps the Senator has a word with her colleagues about the $245 million cut from Indigenous housing under the Turnbull government, while the findings of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to, the, to Child Sexual Abuse 
found Indigenous children are at greatest risk when they are removed from their homes and their families. Or the federal government's decision to cut funding into the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services Forum, the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander victim survivors of family violence and sexual assault. Then Morrison cut a promised $10 million from the Indigenous Student Success Program to support First Nations students who are financially disadvantaged and or from remote and regional areas. And the list, of course, goes on. Maybe if there were a voice to parliament, the coalition would have been aware of just how horrendous these policies would end up being for First Nations communities. But unfortunately, the coalition doesn't listen to First Nations communities. A wasted decade would be a generous term to describe the last coalition's impact on First Nations people in this country. The coalition can't hear the gracious request for recognition and consultation, the simplicity of recognition and consultation in this country being made by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples through the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It is owed to First Nations community in this country to listen, at the very very least, to listen. For far too long, this place has told First Nations communities what was good for them. Now it's time to hear their voice. You have cut services, passed oppressive legislation, taken what meagre offerings were available to First Nations people and defunded them. Now it is time to listen to the impact of the cuts made over the last decade. And now is the time to hear them when they come to us with solutions. Instead of subjecting First Nations Australians to oppressive legislation like this that continues not to work, now is the time to listen. You're putting up legislation that is categorically redundant, while the closing the gap statistics are going backwards. Talk about not being able to focus our efforts in the right areas. You cut funding to the National Family Violence Prevention and Legal Services Forum, the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander victim survivors of, Aboriginal, of, of family violence and sexual assault. And now you're saying that you want better outcomes for First Nations Australians, but your only solution for that is to ban alcohol. Talk about tunnel vision. We're trying to fix the mess that you've left and undo the massive damage you have inflicted on First Nations communities right across the country. This government is here, is here to hear the voices and move forward with real actions that put communities first. The Albanese Labor government has already invested $250 million in a better, safer future for Central Australia. We're focusing investment on those who need it most. We're getting on with the job and working collaboratively with the Northern Territory government. We're certainly not trying to tell them how to suck eggs with legislation that is not actually necessary. We're investing in our youth through on-country learning, improving school attendance and increasing completion rates through caring for culture and country. Moreover, we're investing in youth engagement and diversion programs. Labor is investing in families, listening and supporting elders and parents and boosting domestic violence services. Labor is working to address and prevent fetal alcohol syndrome spectrum disorders, both through better responses within the health and justice systems. Labor is working to relieve the stress on, on the services in Alice Springs healthcare. So Labor is working to relieve the stress on the services in Alice Springs healthcare services by improving the services in surrounding communities. We're creating jobs focusing on and around Alice Springs, making changes to current programs to make them work for communities. On top of that, this government is also investing an additional $48 million in community safety measures, including support for domestic violence services and support for young people to access safe places and support at night. It is through empowering communities and investing in support services and local stakeholders that we will improve outcomes. Getting young people off the streets and into homes will have a direct impact on breaking the cycle that some are in, giving them the stability to reach out for help 
and guidance will have significant and positive impact on their lives. We are hearing the voices of the community and we know that we can do more. But to ensure that voices of First Nations people are heard, we are fully committed to delivering a successful referendum on a voice to parliament this year. It's about giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Torres Strait Islander people a say in matters that affect them and their communities. It's really that simple. It's about creating practical and lasting change that will lead to better policies and improve the lives of First Nations people in areas like health, education and housing. And if those opposite really cared about those things, they would be supporting a referendum. Whilst the opposition have sought to distract attention from the core purpose of the voice, Uncle Patch, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, Minister Burney, and Melinda Yu McCarthy, many, many others continue to share information about what the voice is about. Two simple things, recognition and consultation. Those opposite are so deeply out of touch with the needs of First Nations communities in this country. It's almost like they don't have a set of ears themselves. The Australian people support reconciliation. They support give, giving First Nations people a fair go. I urge the coalition to do the right thing by First Nations communities and walk with us to reconciliation for a better nation for all of us. Senator Little. Thank you. Well, I rise to speak in support of the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023. What more proof do you need that the Federal Parliament, the taxpayers of Australia, Central Australia, Barclay and Top End residents should not trust the Northern Territory Government? Even the most vulnerable people in the NT surely have endured and experienced enough. On a recent trip to Central Australia, I heard a resounding and reverberating message. The message was of bringing to an end the failed service delivery and poor outcomes they've seen delivered by the NT government and service providers, government, non-government and private providers. They're not referring to all of them, but the names of the organisations and their leaders they are referring to come up often. Time for some truth-telling. The people of the Northern Territory will make their choice in an election in 2024, but what I'm talking about is the Commonwealth intervening and protecting its interests where it has the responsibility and ability to do so. The Albanese Labor government has, as it does, been blinded by ideology and political posturing that saw it not intervene until the tide of public opinion left it with little choice and the media doggedly maintained its focus on their failure. What more proof do we need? It was the Northern Territory government that spectacularly sacrifice the right to safety, the right to live free from harm and the right to go about their everyday lives to prioritise what the NT Attorney-General lauded was human rights, the consequences of which will be felt for some time and for some people forever. The end of Stronger Futures legislation and its alcohol restrictions without an appropriate transition plan prioritise the rights of addicts and abusers over that of residents, men, women and children the human rights of everyday Territorians just trying to go about their everyday lives. No accountability, no responsibility, no idea and, it seems, no consequences. The NT leadership is the same. The accountability sits with the same people who triggered the chaos. They remain in charge of the Treasury benches and the programs funded by the rivers of taxpayers' money to respond, in not small part, to an issue largely of their own making. Despite warning of what would happen, despite immediate confronting evidence of the consequences, it still took around seven months and federal intervention for a proper circuit breaker. What the NT government presided over was a jump of 54 per cent in alcohol-related assault. House break-ins rose by 22.5 per cent. Commercial break-ins increased by 55 per cent. Motor vehicle theft was up 31 per cent. Property damage jumped by nearly 60 per cent, and when cost of living hits regional areas hardest and remote areas hard, the human, social and economic toll rose to dizzying heights for Territorians. Tourists stop coming in the same numbers, locals don't move around so freely, and many residents have simply packed up and left after experiencing or witnessing ongoing damage to property and or person. 
to do what they did to allow alcohol restrictions to lapse with no proper consultation, with no transition plan and, worse, ignoring the pleas of key organisations is what led to an escalation of community chaos in Central Australia. Even the Commonwealth Agency, whose purpose is to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, got it wrong when it supported an opt-in clause for those who wished alcohol restrictions to remain. There were voices of several key organisations who wanted an opt-out clause, but they were simply ignored. Nine organisations, key organisations who for decades have worked to improve the lives of Aboriginal people in the NT, wrote to the Albanese government pleading and warning of the catastrophe about to unfold. Those key organisations argued in a Senate inquiry that positive discrimination was an appropriate response to protect the most vulnerable and to stop the unravelling of hard-won gains that had been made to close the gap in important health indicators. You can't stand up and talk about closing the gap while not responding to issues that are widening them. The NT government, in the face of consistent warning, precedents and overwhelming evidence, showed no foresight, had no consideration for the most vulnerable and, with no meaningful consultation or transition plan, showed they had no idea. That's why it's not feasible, plausible or responsible to dismiss this bill outright without some serious checks and balances that it asks for. Sure, the NT government has put in place its own legislation, but that lacks detail and oversight. Sounds like a familiar story. The bill introduced in the Northern Territory is the Lick Act 2019. In its six pages, it talks of who can make an order, how alcohol management plans will be agreed to and how views of specific stakeholders will be considered. The bill lacks detail. Nothing that suggests how it will ensure that voices won't be silenced so that a 60 per cent majority endorsement can be obtained. It is with consultation, I repeat consultation with police, the government and the relevant local health organisations before approval is granted. I want to know exactly who is going to be consulted. They didn't listen to the most vulnerable or those who worked with most vulnerable people. This doesn't go far enough to protect elders, leaders, men and women who'd want, who would want to object to allowing alcohol in their communities and ensure their safety in the process. This private member's bill requires a review within one year by the Senate in relation to the effectiveness of these laws. It is not seeking to remove the ability for these communities to have alcohol management plans, but what it does is describe in greater detail the framework for decision-making in much more detail than the Northern Territory legislation does. It deserves support. I raise also my advocacy and that of Senator Jacinta Price to get a family with children and sick adult homeless people, homeless for almost two years, living on a cement slab in Alice Springs, exposed to the elements and the issues impacting the region off that slab. The NT government had to be dragged into action by the Commonwealth, by the minister and local member to find a safer place, a more reasonable place, permanent housing. But their job is not done yet. You can't take your eyes off the Northern Territory government. Need more proof about the common sense, the competency of that government and its agencies? Then let me explain how it took three and a half weeks to get that family off the slab. How can they do it? Take three and a half weeks to get that family and the job now is to fix an entire region. Guess what? When they were moved off the slab, they said to me, you know what? They've told us we need to provide a tenancy reference. Can you believe that? A tenancy reference. They were told they had to get a tenancy residence, a reference to trigger the process of securing a greater place of safety. It's disbelief. They have been neglected for years. Service providers, people who should have known they were there, drove past them and now they want a tenancy reference? I'm talking about a young woman with advanced kidney disease on dialysis three times a week. Up to nine children and their family were on that slab, enduring 40 degrees heat in summer and below in winter. I invite anyone to do that out the front one night. 
There was no running water, no sanitation, just beds made up neatly on a concrete slab each day, while six of the nine children who were school age went to school. I can say that because I wasn't a thousand kilometres away, two thousand kilometres away. I saw it for myself. There was no running water, no sanitation, just unbelievable in the middle of Australia. They were non-drinking, non-gambling, and they still have to mount a case of being a responsible family. And last night, it continues. You can't take your eyes off the Northern Territory government, I say again. Instead of sending social workers, financial counsellors, the support they need to set themselves up for success, to build a better life themselves, they don't need government to do that for them. They just need the things that allow them to do it themselves. They were told Centrelink's coming to build them $500 a week for their stay. Right from the very beginning, the only people that have been telling the truth about what's going on in the argy-bargy of negotiations between government and service providers about how to respond to these people is those people. Miranda, Bessie and Kate are their names. Real people just trying to do their best. So why doesn't Centrelink say, Look, we're coming out to check that you're all on the right payments, that you're getting the right money to support your family, giving them an update on a more permanent housing outcome, and making sure they don't go broke while they're in temporary housing. They wear the same clothes every day. They're coming from a slab trying to build a future for themselves, and now they're being asked to pay that kind of money while they transition, wait for the Northern Territory government and others to make sure that they follow through on what they say they were going to do, provide a better future for them. I would say to Minister Burney, it's a black backflip when I'm told their accommodation in a government statutory facility, Aboriginal Hostels Limited, will be covered until they are permanently housed. That gave me and them some comfort and should give all Australians some comfort that at least the effort is being put in to find them a permanent place, that action is actually happening so that they can get on with improving their own lives. You can't take your eyes off this. If you are serious about confirming greater safety for women in the Northern Territory, then you have to also tell the Women's Domestic Family Violence Services, give them some comfort that their funding will continue. It's a little over 12 weeks before the end of the financial year, and they don't know if in the middle of a crisis for women, children and the elderly, that they've got funding to continue their important work, or that they've got increased funding to continue their important work. Stop talking about it. Stop putting those services and the people that rely on them at risk and confirm their future funding. These are the reasons why it's not possible to support this bill, given the weight of evidence against leaving the Northern Territory government to get this right. These are real examples. They're not made up. I'm happy for people to challenge it and I'm happy to provide the evidence. You can't take your eyes off the Northern Territory government. You can't take your eyes off these situations and we can't take our eyes off the Albanese gov Labor government in doing the right thing and not just talking about it but making a difference, a real difference to the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That's why I support this bill. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator Marielle Smith. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to make a contribution on the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023. Um, and in doing so, I do want to thank all of the colleagues who have come before me and made a contribution 
to this debate. And I do acknowledge Senator Nampajimpa Price's genuine concerns and for the Northern Territory and her community in Alice Springs as well. We have heard throughout this debate some very deeply distressing and personal stories from a number of senators, and I acknowledge that it can be a difficult thing to bring these stories into a public forum. This has been a moving debate. And it is really clear to us that people in Central Australia are doing it really tough right now. The, the sticking point here is a difference in opinion over the solutions. I don't think there is any difference in opinion throughout this debate in the challenges and the problems. And I agree with everyone who has come and spoken before me and who has put forward the view that we, of course, need to be putting women and children first, prioritising their safety. But again, it's the solution here that we have a disagreement with. The government has a disagreement with the solutions put forward by the senator. And that comes down to this question of whether federal legislation is required. I just don't, I haven't heckled anyone during this debate, um, so I would appreciate being able to be heard. Um, so order, uh, and Senator Smith, you have the call. Fundamentally, this comes down to a question about whether federal legislation is required, whether federal intervention is required. And we have seen in the Northern Territory significant steps being taken by the Northern Territory government, them step up and take responsibility legislating new alcohol restrictions. And I'll come back to that point shortly. But there is always a challenge for us when we have debates in this place about matters as serious as this between how we bring what are very, very difficult things and very challenging things into the light in order to get action, to drive momentum, to get change, but also how we talk about communities as well and how we, and we talk about them, the need to empower them too. And our communities aren't ever served by quick headlines and they're never served by becoming political footballs in here. And that's why I think the tone of this debate is really important. I've seen that happen in Sojourner. I've seen that community over the years being used as a political football, and it's no good. And people in that community tell me it's no good when they're used as a political football in this place. So we do need serious solutions to serious challenges. That work is always done, in my view, when the different levels of government work in partnership together. The Commonwealth Government working in partnership with the Territory Governments working in partnership in different parts of Australia with local government. It's when government works together well and when communities are engaged and consulted and brought into the solutions that we see the best policy. And I note the member for Lingiari in the other place has said about some of the challenges before us that this is beyond the political games that get played. And I quote, this is about people's lives. It is about Aboriginal women and children. There are many men who are not drinkers, but we forget about that because of the cheap politics. She has called for a stop to the political games. And I want to acknowledge her work and her advocacy in this place. She's been one of the loudest speakers for, for more support for Central Australia and for more support for some of these challenges. I've seen her work in the First Nations Caucus Committee, and I want to acknowledge it here today. Acting Deputy President, as I said in my open remarks, there is no doubt of the genuine intention across the chamber here to improve the lives of women and children, particularly in the Northern Territory. But this is about the component and the level and degree of federal intervention. We have seen in the Northern Territory the introduction of the NT Liquor Amendment Act in 2023. The effect of this legislation is that across the NT, town, camps and communities have reverted to dry zones. And my understanding is that through this legislation, there are clear and robust opt-out processes requiring the development of, our, of community alcohol plans. I also note that the Chief Minister has announced other measures to address crime and antisocial behaviour in Alice Springs. And I don't think anyone here doubts that these reforms and these changes and measures were necessary. But we also need to be honest about why they were necessary. They came into place because the former government allowed the Stronger Futures legislation to sunset. When it did, these restrictions sunsetted too. And it is appropriate at that point for the Northern Territory to step up and show leadership. Indeed, it was incumbent upon them to step up and show leadership and to legislate 
and to introduce policy for these changes. And, that, and that's what these changes that we have seen in the NT are all about. And Acting Deputy Speaker, I acknowledge I'm not on the ground in Alice Springs. I represent the state of South Australia. That's where I'm on the ground, that's where I travel, that's where I'm talking to people. And I acknowledge that this is not my personal lived experience and I don't speak for these communities. But from, I, I, I have listened carefully to the contributions in this debate, listened carefully to the contributions of Senator Malandiri McCarthy, listened carefully to the member for Lingiari in the other place. And, and I see and acknowledge and understand the challenges and the problems we have here. But the thing is that the Northern Territory Government has the authority and the responsibility to act in this place. That's appropriate. Just like every other state and territory, they are the ones who hold responsibility for alcohol policy and regulation. And we have seen what happens when the Commonwealth overrides the states and territories. And indeed, we have seen the Commonwealth make grave errors in overriding the responsibility of the territories before in legislation. Commonwealth interventions in the past have caused significant distress and disempowerment. On this matter, it is the responsibility of the Territory Government to legislate regarding the issues of alcohol and alcohol access. This power is contained within the Northern Territory Liquor Act of 2019. That Act governs the sale, provision, service, promotion and consumption of liquor with the purpose of minimising alcohol harm in the Northern Territory. That has been looked at in this parliament, a committee, a cross-party cross parliamentary committee has looked into this issue. The Joint Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, which has cross-party membership from Labor representatives, from the Coalition and from Independents, found earlier in this year in its report into the inquiry on community safety, support services and job opportunities in the NT, and I quote, that it is clear to the committee that the Northern Territory Government has sufficient legislative means to manage alcohol-related harm within its jurisdiction where there is the will to do so. This has been demonstrated by its recent legislative amendments to the Liquor Act 2019. It is the view of the committee that this is the appropriate role of the Northern Territory Government, informed by the views of the community rather than the Commonwealth. That's what a committee of, of this chamber, of this parliament, found. And I respect the views that they have put forward after their inquiry and after their consultation. Passing this bill would be supporting a federal intervention. And I appreciate that is what a number of senators in this chamber want to see. But federal interventions like this have caused significant distress in the past. And the scars caused by the Howard government's federal intervention remain and live on in communities. The intervention that stripped community and territory government of capacity, and I reflect on the words that Senator McCarthy shared in September last year about the intervention when she spoke about the impact it had on her as a member of the, of the Northern Territory Parliament. And I quote Senator McCarthy, in 2016, when I entered the Senate, I spoke about what happened in the NT in July 2007, when the Northern Territory Parliament, the Northern Territory people, were intervened on in such an incredibly dramatic way, without any input, without any view. It was certainly when I was the member for Arnhem in 2007, standing in the Parliament of the Northern Territory, the most disempowering moment, not just for me as a member for Arnhem, but for all of those constituents that I was there to represent. I could say nothing, I could do nothing, the humiliation of people, the shame that people felt, all carried through with the Northern Territory intervention, which saw the arrival of the Basics card. Supporting this bill would be overriding the Territory's role in legislating for itself, in legislating on the topics which it does have, jurisdiction and capability to legislate for. But those considerations is this question that where there is a difference here, around how an intervention should happen, whether a fed the federal government should intervene or not. This is a question about a response and a solution. It is not a question about need. It's not a question about need for people living in Alice Springs and Central Australia. And there is no doubt that they are doing it tough, seriously, seriously tough. And there is no doubt, and I do not undermine or devalue any of the stories which have been brought forward to this chamber today and in the other days we've debated 
this topic and indeed whenever we have a debate on these matters. They are nothing short of shocking and distressing. But it is the government's position that overriding the powers of the territory government and overriding their responsibilities through federal legislation disempowers local communities. And that would be the opposite of what we're seeking to achieve. Policy solutions always work best in partnership. They always work best where people take responsibility and they always work best when they're co-designed, when they take the community seriously in designing and implementing the solutions they want and need to see for the problems which they are living, far away from this building, far away from Canberra, indeed far away from where many of our officers are around Australia. And that requires willingness to listen and to learn, a willingness for engagement. And that is the focus of our government. Our, our Minister for Social Services has said very clearly that co-design is one of her key priorities in the social services portfolio. And I quote the member for Kingston, Amanda Rishworth, when she said, our focus and our objective as a government remains clear, to empower people, empower communities, and provide individuals and communities with a range of supports that they can choose to use when and how best it suits them. This is really important, and many of the challenges that we see in Central Australia, they are not unique to these communities. We've all read the latest Closing the Gap report. The data is there. We don't need the data. I mean, I'm sure all of us spend time in our states and our communities talking to people. But that report did make for pretty harrowing reading on some of the indicators that I think there are, is a, a strong degree of, of willingness and desire and motivation to improve on, where a whole lot of good intention has never been enough. And there has been a lot of good intention in this building. I think there's a lot of good intention in this chamber today. But we aren't making enough progress on these issues. Of course we're not. And again, I reaffirm that in this debate, I don't think anyone is standing here diminishing the challenge before us or diminishing the motivation of why these challenges have been brought to this chamber or diminishing the challenge ahead of us. This is a question around federal intervention and it's a question around legislative need and whether this bill would have an impact on these issues when it steps into an area of um, an area of authority and delegation which is held by the Northern Territory Government and where we have seen in recent weeks a willingness of that government to take some responsibility and to legislate these matters to see alcohol restrictions be reintroduced. These are not easy matters. None of the matters before us are easy matters. And there are, there are many things we need to do, and there are many things that we know we need to do as a government to improve on these issues. And I know the Minister for Minister Burney, I know Minister Burney takes these views very, very seriously. They are prioritised in Cabinet and they are prioritised in government. They are prioritised in some of the programs we are funding, and there will be more work to do. But I do note the Commonwealth Government's investment in the $250 million plan for a better, safer future for Central Australia. And that plan is about job creation. It's about better services. That plan is about improving community safety and cohesion through more youth engagement and diversion programs. It's also about preventing and addressing the issues caused by fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, including through better responding through the health and justice systems. We are investing as a Commonwealth in families. We're investing in on-country learning. And that investment, that $250 million program, is on top of the $48 million investment in community safety, which was announced by the Australian Government in January this year. And that investment, including projects designed to have immediate impact on the safety of the community in Alice Springs. Our government does take these issues seriously. I do again want to acknowledge the contributions of senators in this chamber. I do not in any way diminish the motivations or the challenge before us. This is a question about an appropriate response and federal intervention. That's the debating point here. 
Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I find it remarkable that um, the stronger futures legislation introduced in 2012, introduced by a then Labor government, is now being called racist by the new Labor government. Um, it's, uh, it's quite incredible. Racist policies. Racist policies. Order. Senator Davey, you have the call. Up. Uh, Senator Davey, resume your seat. Senator Smith, on the point of order. On a point of order, I didn't call that policy racist. I'm not sure if that's what the senator is referring to. Uh, uh, yes, um, Senator. There is no point of order made by the senator opposite. Um, it's a debating point, and I would ask you to rule that out of order. Thank you. Um, Senator, <laughs> the minister, uh, Senator Brown. On the point of order, um, she, uh, Senator Davey was reflecting on the contribution made by Senator Smith. Okay, just thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think I got your point there. I, I'm happy to have a have a discussion in the chamber. I'm happy to. Do, are you, Senator Cadell? Reflection on any individual senator. It was a debating point that it was used as a policy comment, not towards any senator. Um, senator Davey, it may have been noticed that uh, the clerk was consulting with me about a different matter at the time that you were making your comments, and I therefore didn't hear them. Uh, senator Smith. Um, on, the, on the point of order, except if you weren't making a reflection on me as an individual, I accept that, but that's how it came across to me. So I'm happy to let the point okay. of order go. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, Senator Davey, I'm not calling you yet, sorry. Senator Davey, I just uh, understand that this is a highly sort of sensitive debate that people have really strong views about, uh, which is perfectly reasonable, but I would hope that when I give you the call, that you move on from that particular statement um, back to, to your speech. Senator Davey. Thank you. And it was not, uh, I was not impugning that a specific, reflecting on any specific individual, just comments that have been made during the debate. But I will move on. I, um, I want to congratulate my colleague, Senator Nampajimpa Price, on bringing this legislation to the Senate. I also want to commend my colleague, Senator Little, for her advocacy and for what she did for the family that were living on the concrete slab. Had Senator Little not raised this, not been there and taken a photo and uh, put this before the Australian public, that family would still be on that slab, would still be under a tarpaulin uh, and would still be being treated in a way that is completely would be completely unacceptable anywhere else in the world. I, am, I applaud both of them, their tenacity, their commitment and their passion to deliver a better life for their community, a better life and a better future for all Northern Territorians. Because I want to make the point that this legislation is place-based, not race-based. This private senator's bill is evidence of their commitment, their tenacity, and that's why we on this side are supporting it, because we support them in their efforts to make their communities a better place. We are listening to their voices. Unlike claims from those on the other side of the chamber earlier in this debate, when we first debated it uh, a while ago now, this work is not redundant. It is absolutely essential. Earlier, when uh, Senator Mallandiri McCarthy shared her story, a very moving story and a very important story, a story of breaking the cycle of education and of support to show there is a better way. There are other options other than grog. 
But then Senator McCarthy said the Northern Territory government is best placed to manage the harm reduction policies. Really? Really? Ironically, she said that she had raised the sunsetting of the Stronger Futures legislation with the previous coalition government, who, in her words, did nothing. Yet, when they came into government, the Labor Party, still with time between being sworn in and the actual sunset, her government did nothing. Senator McCarthy said she and the member for Lingiari contacted the Northern Territory government way back in August last year, who, until February when this issue hit the headlines, also did nothing. And now Senator McCarthy is saying it's OK, the Northern Territory government is alive to the issue. We can leave it in their hands. I beg to differ. We know the Stronger Futures Northern Territory legislation was introduced in 2012. It was also tied with a $3.4 billion commitment and a 10-year sunset clause. Some of that financial commitment was renegotiated midway through to extend the partnerships to ensure maximum potential for success. The aim of the legislation was to give the Northern Territory government enough time, 10 years, to develop strategies to minimise harm, reduce alcohol dependence and work with Aboriginal people and their communities to incite positive change. Sounds like a great plan. Five years later, in 2017, the Northern Territory Government commissioned the Alcohol Policies and Legislation Review to deliver a cohesive approach to alcohol harm reduction. Commonly known as the Riley Review, the Hon. Justice Trevor Riley chaired the expert advisory panel and they delivered their final report in October 2017. And a comprehensive report it was. It observed a recurring theme throughout the review, and I quote, was the lack of coordinated, long-term, appropriately resourced programs targeting alcohol harm reduction is a major contributor to the lack of reduction in alcohol statistics. The report acknowledged that the then regulatory framework for alcohol in the Northern Territory was not fit for purpose and that the Territory Government needed to deliver a cohesive approach to alcohol harm minimisation for all Territorians. The report and the 220 recommendations contained therein were handed to the then Attorney-General in the Northern Territory, Minister Natasha Files. That's right, the current Territory Chief Minister was the Attorney-General at the time who accepted this report, who took 220 recommendations. But to date, what has she done with them? To be fair, in 2018, she did rewrite the Northern Territory Liquor Act as recommended. But it is very hard to see what has been done in communities to prepare for the end of Stronger Futures, which was always on the cards. The chapter on harm prevention in the Riley Report offered advice on pricing, on taxing of alcohol, on whether safe and vibrant entertainment precincts should be extended, on delivering better community policing patrols and st studies into alcohol treatment services, including identifying and relocating drinking away from roads, trialling residential managed alcohol programs and providing sobering up shelters where they're needed and would be used. As I said, the report was very detailed. That was in 2017. As we know, cultural and alcohol issues in the Northern Territory have a long history, and a report is not a silver bullet. But when it is such a comprehensive report with so many recommendations, not to even look and implementing those recommendations, knowing that there is a sunset on the federal legislation that is providing 
a sense of safety and security is absolutely remiss. And the Northern Territory government should hang its head in shame. And it is because of their inaction that we are here today debating a reintroduction of federal legislation to provide some safety, some stability and some certainty for our vulnerable Northern Territory communities. So, as the Stronger Futures legislation was coming up to sunset, as I said, and the new government did nothing. In fact, the new government was completely silent on the issue, but very active in other areas, like removing the cashless debit card for welfare recipients, something that many elders, particularly aunties, in the vulnerable communities of the Northern Territory asked them not to do. In fact, warned them what the results would be if they took away the cashless debit card for welfare. If they put cash back in the hands, allowing the practice of humbugging. So when, when a person gets their welfare, gets their cash and goes home, they actually get stood over. You know, it's like the olden days. They get stood over and demanded their cash be handed over. The cashless debit card prevented that from happening because you couldn't take the cash and go and buy your grog. You couldn't buy grog with the cashless debit card. You couldn't gamble that money away. But you could feed your family. You could buy clothes or books for school. That warning was made loud and clear to this government and they ignored it. They didn't listen to the voices of the people of the vulnerable communities of the Northern Territory and North West and Western Australia and some communities in South Australia. The Northern Territory government introduced legislation that made provision for communities to opt in to alcohol restrictions instead of opt out. So they flipped it on its head. They also said communities would not be required to have any form of alcohol management plans in place before they chose to opt out. Chief Minister Files has said that to do otherwise would implement racist policies. And again, I point out, prohibitions are not race-based, they're place-based to ensure the safety of our most vulnerable, regardless of what their heritage is or their background. The blanket policy shift and the inaction of the federal Labor government has resulted in a devastating increase in both consumption and alcohol-related harm. This was what people warned the government about. Alice Springs had amply identified to the world just how serious the problem is and how floundering the federal and territory governments have been in addressing the issues. It was only after the issues made headlines, not just in Australia but internationally, when people saw what was happening in Alice Springs, when it became news headlines, when people saw the amount of kids roaming the streets in Alice Springs because it's safer to be on the streets than to go home. I mean, that alone is an indictment on what we have allowed to happen in those communities. And it was only when this made headlines that both the Northern Territory and the Federal Labor Ministers decided that they actually might have to show their faces. Of course, we know the five-minute visit by the Prime Minister to Alice Springs was not the cure-all. We know it was actually a media opportunity. We know he had to race back to Melbourne for the Australian Open, after all. Um, excuse me, Senator Davey. Senator McAllister. 
Point of order, Chair. Um, oh, my apologies, Acting Deputy President. Um, the standing orders prohibit reflections on the motivations of others in the other place, and I'd ask uh, you to consider whether the Senator's contribution is consistent with the standing orders. Senator Davey. I won't reflect on the motivation behind the Prime Minister's short visit to um, the Alice Springs, but I will observe it was a very short visit to Alice Springs, and yet he managed to find three days to spend at the Australian Open. What we do know is that the media focus actually did force change, finally. It did force a recognition of the issues that governments had been warned would happen if they removed the cashless debit card, if they reversed the onus of the alcohol prohibitions. Senator Price, Senator Little, and others from the Northern Territory, from their communities, who have constantly brought light to the real tragedies occurring in these communities each and every day, deserve to be commended. Yeah. Senator Price's bill's intention is to protect all Territorians, but especially those most vulnerable ter Territorians who face alcohol addiction or the associated harms from family members with alcohol addiction, the related harms that brings for them, their families and the wider community. I congratulate Senator Price. I thank her for her tireless work. I thank her for bringing these issues to this place, raising them so that we should all be listening. What is happening? in the communities in and around Central Australia are a tragedy that need not be. And with this bill, we can start to put in place mechanisms that allow communities to introduce harm reduction policies, to look at what can be done to ensure that their children are safe, their wives are safe, their families are safe. I thank her for her tireless work, and I trust and I implore all senators in this place to have the courage and the decency to support this bill. I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, and um, I'm pleased to make a contribution on the Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023. Can I thank colleagues for their contributions on this bill, especially those who have shared their personal stories and experiences? I should indicate that in speaking on this bill, I am not speaking um, in my capacity as the minister. I am simply making a personal contribution as a senator participating in the chamber. And it is important that the Senate hear about these issues, work on these issues. We know people are doing it tough in Alice Springs, and more needs to be done to improve community safety and particularly to protect women and children. And it has been my privilege in my time in this place to have had some responsibilities um, that have seen afforded me opportunities to work with the many people in community who every day get up and apply themselves exclusively to protecting women and children um, right across the country. We need to keep women and children safe in all communities all around Australia, and we need to keep people safe in Alice Springs. But the government and I disagree with the proposed solution to this problem in the bill. This bill is not necessary, and federal legislation is not necessary, and federal intervention is not the right step. We have recently had a big and important step in the right direction. The Northern Territory Government has taken responsibility and recently legislated new alcohol restrictions. Uh, sorry, Senator McAllister, the debate is interrupted and you'll be seeking leave to continue your remarks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, leave is granted. I, the Senate will now proceed to consideration of
government business. I, sorry, Senator Lambie, are you seeking the call? Uh, I am, um, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion for an order for the production of documents regarding the transparency of official appointments. Uh, this motion has been circulated. Is, I'm just looking at. I'm in the hands of the chamber. No. Leave, leave is not granted, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to an order for the production of documents. And you'll be speaking to that, Senator Lambie? Uh, yep, I move that, yes. Acting you Deputy speak, President. In the coming weeks, in the run-up to the budget, the corridors of this building will be swarming with lobbyists, big business representatives and political donors seeking to influence government policies and decisions and beyond. They'll be having quiet words with ministers and their staff. They'll be greasing the machinery of government to ensure that their interests, not the public interest, are protected and promoted. Publication of the people who lobby government is a vital transparency and integrity measure for this place. But yesterday, Labor and the Coalition combined forces to block a motion moved by me that would have provided the quarterly publication of who, outside of government, are meeting with ministers to influence government policy or decisions. There, were, this is nothing, there was nothing radical in this motion. That proposed scheme was based on the New South Wales Premier's Memorandum M 2014-07 on the publication of ministerial diaries an arrangement that has been in place for nearly nine years. The Premier's memo was born out of the 2010 New South Wales ICAC report titled, and I quote, Investigation into Corruption Risks Involved in Lobbying, end quote. Publishing ministers' diaries is a key anti-corruptive measure. Official ministerial diaries are already published in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT. It's also done in New Zealand. Even the United States President releases and publishes White House visitor logs. This is a baseline anti-corruption measure that should stand alongside the new National Anti-Corruption Commission and political donations reform. So it's an absolute disgrace that Labor and the Coalition combined against the crossbench and the Greens to block this transparency measure. It's, and it's all the more shame because Labor and the Coalition have both previously expressed support for ministerial diaries to be transparent. In the previous parliament, Labor, notably now Attorney General Dreyfus, supported public disclosure of ministerial diaries. The then Coalition government resisted. In this parliament, the Coalition initially developed a newfound interest in transparency. Following the government's obstruction of efforts by journalists to obtain FOI freedom of information, access to the Prime Minister's appointment diary, Senator Birmingham pursued the matter with Senator Wong in question time. After former Senator Senator Patrick was in the news, having been asked to pay $13,444 for 197 days of the PM's diary, paying the deposit and then being told that he was not going to get them anyway. Senator Birmingham pursued the government at February estimates. Senator Wong says there is no need for a general disclosure scheme, claiming that FOI was still an effective transparency mechanism. Despite knowing full, full well that, thanks to our broken freedom of information system, the government can delay access for years, if not indefinitely. However, Senator Birmingham's transparency enthusiasm apparently evaporated up in a puff of smoke yesterday. And now the coalition's on a unity ticket with Labor against the openness and in integrity. One wonders what happened. Perhaps former Prime Minister Morrison's secrecy obsessions live on inside the Liberal Party. Perhaps Senator, Senator Birmingham just has no ticker. In any case, the truth is both major parties are allergic to integrity measures in this place. Shame on you. In coming weeks, there will be plenty of lobbyists scurrying along the corridors of power, and if you turn on, turn on the lights, the cockroaches head for the exits. That's what we need, and that's why this motion is urgent. I relented. Instead of taking my ideas, which came from a very normal disclosure arrangement in New South Wales, my motion lets the government decide the best way. How reasonable is that? 
I have tried compromise. We need this motion passed now that can, so we can have some resolution by next week. It gives the government another chance to do the right thing and live up to his, its promise in the last election. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Oh my goodness, isn't that evaporating at the speed of light? How's that going for you? More broken promises and transparency is a big one. And if they don't, then I have to ask, what are you hiding? What are you so scared of to show in those diaries? What don't you want the public to know out there? I cannot implore you enough to come back to the transparency you measure you promised the people in the last election and do what you said you Thank would you, do. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Walters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The Greens strongly support this motion. After years of political scandals, secrecy, misuse of funds and the trashing of conventions, the community has little confidence that politicians in this place will act in anything other than their own interests. And too often their own interests are influenced by industry lobbyists offering cushy post-parliament roles sweetened by the winking promise of political donations. Far too many deals in this place are thrashed out between ministers and their donors behind closed doors. You only have to see the number of orange lanyards in the hallways to understand that lobbyists are constantly in and out of ministers' offices. And you only have to look at the policy outcomes to see that the influence that has over decisions. Privileged access, generous donations and promises of a cushy role when they're done clearly influence political decisions. We know that the minister responsible for regulating gambling has met with the gambling industry seven times more often than she has met with gambling harm reduction advocates. And we only know that because it was interrogated through estimates, not because that information is put out in the public for all to see. So it's safe to assume that the ministers responsible for the safeguard mechanism are being lobbied by the very industries that will be regulated by the mechanism. And it's no shock that many of them have loudly supported the weak proposal that would let them keep polluting. Remember when the Minerals Council toppled a Prime Minister over a proposed super profits tax? Or when casinos were exempted from COVID restrictions? It's a level of access and influence that most community organisations working in the public interest can only dream of and it undermines democracy. The very least that the public could expect is for ministers to be open about who they're meeting with and what they're talking about. Labor should be supporting greater transparency. The current Attorney-General took legal action arguing that former Attorney-General George Brandis should release his ministerial diaries. The Queensland state Labor government has been publishing ministerial diaries for years, and the sky hasn't fallen in. The Greens want to get big money and corporate influence out of politics altogether. We're calling and have been calling for a National Integrity Commission for about a decade um, before Labor finally saw the light, and we're glad that we'll finally see one this year, albeit without the public hearing and whistleblower protections that we'll keep calling for. But a strong corruption watchdog is just one step in restoring public confidence in democracy. Cleaning up politics is not just about exposing corruption and punishing the corrupt. It's about getting rid of the conditions that allow corruption and poor standards to flourish in the first place. We need better checks and balances on who gets to bend the ears of politicians. A strong lobbying code that lets people see who's meeting with who, and one that would put an end to the revolving door that sees politicians and staffers take on highly paid senior roles in industries they used to regulate within moments of leaving parliament. Lobbying is defined under the current weak lobbying code of conduct as people or companies lobbying on behalf of a third party. This excludes in-house lobbying, lobbying directly for a company or an industry, which is a loophole the size of a mining truck. Ministers exploit that language to treat in-house lobbyists and post-ministerial roles to fall outside the lobbying regulated under the code. It clearly undermines the objectives of the code and it must be fixed. We need an enforceable code of conduct for politicians with meaningful consequences for misconduct. And we've recently strengthened the code to address harassment and bad behaviour, but we need to go further and address integrity. We need a strong public sector providing frank and fearless advice to ministers and curbing their excesses. We need well-resourced oversight agencies like the ANAO and freedom of information laws that actually promote transparency. We need a culture that encourages people to expose misconduct, knowing that there are strong protections for whistleblowers and a genuine expectation that the misconduct they've exposed will lead to punishment for those who are abusing their positions. 
and we need to remove the corrupting influence of political donations. We want to ban donations from industries with a track record of buying influence, like fossil fuels, weapons, gambling and pharmaceuticals, to stop those industries standing in the way of science-based reforms and humane policies. But we also want to ensure that all donations over $1,000 are disclosed in real time, not up to 19 months after the gift, um, which is currently the case. And noting that that definition of gift, we want that to capture the full gift, not just the money explicitly given as a donation, but exorbitant memberships, meeting fees and expensive dinners. Real-time disclosure of gifts would allow people to know who's funding the parties that they voted for. Everybody benefits from a culture of honesty, integrity, transparency and accountability in politics. Let's just get on with it. Thank you, Senator Walters. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. We don't support um, the suspension motion that the chamber is currently debating, although we have, as usual, traversed into the substance of the, the motion that was being sought to be moved. The reason we don't agree with the suspension is that we, the Senate has a number of pieces of legislation that this is the time. Um, that is meant for government business. Uh, I note it wasn't moved at the beginning of the day to allow for private senators' time to be dealt with, um, but it's eating into government business time, of which we have a number of key pieces of legislation that we would like to progress, including this morning, if possible, the closing the gender pay gap bill, which is very important, as people would understand, uh, to progress and provide, um, put in place new arrangements. It is time critical. It needs to pass this week so that we can put in the arrangements um, that are required for reporting at, an at, a, at a business level about the steps gov uh, organisations are taking uh, to close the gender pay gap and to, ex to um, publicise the gender pay gap that exists in, in businesses, because that is a real handbrake on women's economic equality. So that is the reason we won't support the suspension. There are a range of forms and times in this chamber where um, this motion could be being moved. Um, it could have been given notice uh, to be moved on Monday. We, ha we dealt with a motion yesterday. Um, so there's simply no argument to say that this has to be done at this point in time. I would also say that it is usually courtesy to provide some heads up that that this is happening so that we can uh, prepare. That is the way you know, the chamber operates on these conventions. Yeah, well, we do. We do try and talk with people ahead of time. We are, yes, we do. We are trying Order. desperately to put in place arrangements in this place that give respect to every member of this place about what is happening, when it's happening. I reach out to people. I contact people before each sitting week. Is there anything we can do? Are there any issues you want to raise? how do we deal with them during the sitting week so that it's done in an orderly fashion and we aren't dealing with situations like this. Now, in terms of the substance of um, the motion that's being sought to be moved by Senator Lambie and in the fact that people have um, chosen to take their five minutes to concentrate on that rather than the suspension debate, uh, the Albanese government does take transparency and accountability in government seriously, and we are implementing a higher standard. We have the National Anti-Corruption Commission. We have, through the Joint Standing Committee of the Parliament, agreed on draft codes of conduct for parliamentarians. Um, we will progress that uh, through the enhanced PWSS and the arrangements that are being put in place by set the standard that Senator Waters, Senator Hume, um, Senator Farrell and myself um, sit on, amongst other members from, from the other place. Um, Senator Davey, I think, is also a member of that, through the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, to, in, in, to put in place um, appropriate conduct and standards for parliamentarians in there and make them accountable uh, through their chambers uh, to the people for standards and behaviour. That is happening. We have uh, whistleblower reform underway. We are uh, uh, dealing with the boards and appointment processes through reviews. We've got the attorney's work that he's doing uh, through um, uh, the AAT and improving processes there. Like there is a whole range of work that's going on about cleaning up the mess and putting in place the right infrastructure to make sure that uh, governments and the rest of us as MPs and senators uh, are transparent and accountable. And we, of course, have the FOI Act. Uh, and the FOI Act is followed uh, and um, is applied in, a, you know, in accordance with the law that's been established by this place. 
uh, to ensure that there is a mechanism for people to provide, have access uh, to documents where they meet the requirements of the FOI Act. And on the Prime Minister's diaries uh, in particular, or any ministers, I think mostly you can see the Prime Minister's diary every day because he's out and about. Um, you know, doing meetings, doing functions, meeting with people, holding press conferences. I mean, you will not find a busier person in this place than the Prime Minister, uh, and he is ha more than happy to be accountable for uh, the, the people he meets, the decisions he takes, uh, and the positions of the government. There are laws um, that apply to the seeking of information. Uh, they are, will be uh, are being followed, and in accordance with. Uh, the approach that we have taken, we are raising the standard of accountability and transparency in government. We do take it seriously, and there are plenty of opportunities for us to have a longer debate on this thank should the you, Senate thank you, choose. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I welcome Senator Lambie's focus on transparency when it comes to diaries. And I would remind Mr Gallagher that we only hear talking about this today because the major parties voted against what I really see as the bare minimum when it comes to transparency of ministers, who they're meeting with and who is influencing the decisions that they make. They wield a huge amount of power and Australians deserve to know who is feeding into the decisions that, that affect so many Australians. We hear that the government takes transparency seriously. Yet they don't want to allow Australians to see who ministers are meeting. The NAC won't have public hearings unless you know, there are exceptional, uh, only in exceptional circumstances. And the government doesn't want people to know who the hundreds of in-house lobbyists are, the hundreds of people who have sponsored passes in this building are. They point to the lobbyist register. As a, as a new senator to this place, I have been shocked at how many people have access all areas passes to this building. Currently, there are 700 people who have sponsored passes that Australians have no idea who they are. They walk down these halls, they have meetings, and I, I, have, no, I have no issue with that. I, I really have no issue with that. It is the sign of a good democracy that this place is open, it is accessible, but Australians deserve to know who they are. Australians deserve to know who has that access. It's a, it's a check on all of us. If you're going to give someone a sponsored pass, you should have to think, this person will be on my register of interests and the public will know. The public will know who I'm vouching for to have access to this building. As I said, there's currently 700 people with sponsored passes. At the end of the last parliament, it got to 2,000 people. That's 2,000 people on top of the lobbyist register. And the government's argument, to me, doesn't, doesn't stack up. You'll hear all sorts of excuses, and yet this is disclosed in the UK, in the US, in New Zealand. If we're going to take transparency seriously, we've, we've got to stop seeing this situation where the major parties team up against the entire crossbench to protect themselves. They know that they'll have their, have their turn at, at some stage. And you know, I thought this was summed up in, in question time uh, a few back, a few, a few weeks back, when um, Minister Wong was asked about. Uh, releasing her diary, and her response was, I bet you didn't release yours, did you, mate? And it's, sim it's simply not good enough that when you're in opposition, you can say all these things about transparency. When you're in government, do it. Australians want more transparency. The crossbench is listening to our commu community saying, we deserve more transparency. And yet yesterday, you vote against Senator Lambie's motion to do that, to just get in line with all of these countries across the world that have de decided that this is a bare minimum uh, in a democracy, that people should know who are meeting with decision makers and feeding into these big decisions. So 
I thank Senator Lambie for this opportunity. I thank, you, I thank the crossbench, uh, including former Senator Rex Patrick, for his work in this area. And this is something that the crossbench will continue to push the major parties on, because it's not good enough. And Australians are demanding more. We're here to represent them, and we will keep pushing you on this issue. Thank you. Senator Babbitt. Thank you, Senator Lambie, for what you've done yesterday. Um, I think I, I, like everyone else here, or like most of us here, would like to see who our elected members of parliament are meeting with in their offices in the halls of power. Now, our liberal democratic system of government is based on trust. That's what it's based on, which is why it is both the strongest and, at the same time, the most fragile form of government on earth. Liberal democracies are strong because of the compact between government and citizens. Governments like ours, we do not rule by force, but by the consent of the governed. Now, citizens grant elected officials authority to govern in return for these officials representing them well. And if we do not represent the people well, well, what happens then is we get tossed out at the next election, at the ballot box, and rightly so. Now, Abraham Lincoln, he described government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's what he said. Winston Churchill, what did he say? He says, it's the worst form of government aside from all the others. That's what he said. But here in Australia, our system of government has served us well. Since Australia was federated, we are one of the freest, most peaceful nations on earth. We all agree with that one. Liberal democracies are the envy of every person who has ever been doomed to live under autocratic rule. That's why people flee to the West. That's why people never flee to those countries where more coercive forms of government exist. But yet, our system of government, like I said before, is fragile because it's built on trust. The strength of our democracy depends on trust between everyone in this place and the public. Now, I know it's popular to joke about trustworthiness or otherwise of politicians, but by and large, despite some scandals here and there, most people still believe that in this place, most of us are here with the best of intentions. And I believe that for the most part, that's true. Now, it is incumbent upon us here to do everything we can to ensure that that sacred trust and that belief remains and it grows. It is for this reason that I support the idea that ministers should make their diaries public. It's just a good idea. It's essential to a well-functioning democracy. When people suspect that things are hidden, even if they're not hidden, but if they just suspect it, trust is eroded. But when people see that things are put into the open and freely available for inspection, then trust is built. There can be no faith in government when government officials are exempt from scrutiny. If we in this place want to be well respected, we must respect our electors by committing to transparency wherever it's possible. Once again, transparency builds trust. It's not like we're asking ministers to disclose their, you know, their secret teenage D diary entries from when they were kids. These are official meetings, and for the most part, these meetings are in the public interest. We are elected in this place to serve the public, and as part of our public service, it is only fair that those who hold powerful positions release their diaries to this public. Ministers have power. Ministers have influence. It is important that that power and that influence is scrutinised. We know, like has been mentioned, that in this place there exists many lobbyists, many special interest groups, many individuals seeking to exert influence over everyone here. Trust in government ministers benefits those ministers, since the public probably more likely to vote for them if they trust them. Yeah. That's right. And trust in government ministers benefits the nation more broadly as greater trust means a stronger democracy. Now, I'll point to a recent example uh, where the Prime Minister met with our 
with, with our, our mate Bill Gates recently in a secret meeting. Well, we know that he met with him, but we don't know what they talked about. This man is one of the biggest funders of the World Health Organization in the world. And having just come out of a pandemic, I'd love to know what the Prime Minister and Bill Gates talked about. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Working to serve the people of Queensland and Australia, I normally oppose suspension of standing orders because I don't want to interrupt the working of the Senate. Integrity, though, is vital to the effective working of the Senate. So I compliment Senator Lambie for raising this to this morning. So I'm giving considerable thought to whether I vote for suspension, and I will. The minister just referred in her response to offers of discussion on integrity, but nothing specific. No time, no date, no when will it be. No commitment to it. A lack of integrity always hurts our country and hurts the Australian people because it leads to uncertainty, which leads to fear. And who pays the financial burden for this integrity, lack of integrity? We, the people, pay for this. The people watching at home. Bills withheld from one... I'll give you some examples of lack of integrity and transparency in this current government. Bills have been withheld from One Nation scrutiny, yet freely given to the Greens and Teal, uh, Senator Pocock, two weeks earlier. Lack of integrity. Gas industry nationalisation. Lack of integrity. That will lead to increased prices. Climate change bill. It contradicts the empirical uh, statistical evidence, scientific data, and contradicts the logical scientific points. That was bludgeoned through the Senate with the help of the Greens and, Senator, and Teal Senator Pocock lack of integrity from the government. The Fair Work Act amendments, including compulsory bargaining. The topic was not even raised in the, in the uh, Industrial Relations Summit. Lack of integrity. And added to that, Dan Rep Mr. Dan Rapacoli and his, and his uh, predecessor, Mr. Joel Fitzgibbon, protected this Hunter Valley CFMEU from our scrutiny. Look at COVID mismanagement. That was a uniparty collusion between the Labor state governments and the Liberal National Coalition in the, in the federal parliament. It led to massive wealth transfer that the people pay for. It led to massive control, unnecessary control, bore based on deceit. Why? Because the health was never the concern. The objectives were control and, and um, wealth transfer. Look at the TGA bill that was passed two weeks ago. The health, health department secretary alone can approve drugs without testing lack of integrity. That same bill destroyed legal fundamentals. It removed natural justice, procedural fairness. It removes the right to due process. It reversed reversal of innocence until proven otherwise. Strict liability it introduced. Incorporation of external material at the Secretary's whim. How the hell can people comply with the law when they don't know what the law says? Then we've seen the Aboriginal grog uh, ban, uh, ban lifted and abandoned this government abandoned mothers with the help of the Greens and mothers and children and the community a lack of integrity the voice they are deliberately trying this government to deceive the people go around our constitution not let the people know what's involved because they won't they're hiding the details they broke their superannuation promise a lack of integrity the treasury bill they've dismissed from the from the parliamentary um, agenda because they want to protect their bankers' mates. So the Senate won't even get consideration of it. A lack of integrity yet again. So I want to, want to say that One Nation is founded on integrity and service. Our founder and our leader, Senator Pauline Hanson, went to jail at the hands of leaders like Labor's Premier Beatty, who showed a lack of integrity. Pauline knows that honesty is best. Pauline knows we are under constant scrutiny and misrepresented. That's why it has been a blessing for Pauline Hanson and myself to always act in integrity, because we're strong and principled and people sense that. That's why One Nation is growing around the country. We will be supporting you, Senator Lambie. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, of course the Greens will be supporting this motion, and we commend the Senator for bringing it forward. The Greens will always stand for transparency. And what we can't understand is how the club, the club of Labor and the coalition, join together every time 
to protect their self-interest and to protect their secret contact with their donors and big business. Because that's what this motion is about. It's exposing how the corporate donor turns up to a minister's office on Monday and gets the policy outcome on Tuesday, turns up and, 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 and talks to the minister privately on Wednesday and gets the legislation introduced on Friday. That's how the system works. And it's no wonder that the club is protecting it. It's no wonder that Labor and the Coalition are joining together to prevent showing us who ministers are meeting with. These are public officials delivering billions of dollars of public money, major policy decisions, and they won't even tell us who they're meeting with. That's hardly revolutionary. State governments manage to disclose who their ministers meet with. Even the New South Wales government, not known for its amazing integrity levels, will tell you who the ministers are meeting with. That's how we know the coalition planning minister in New South Wales met with a major property developer on one day and on the same day killed most of the environmental uh, regulations over planning. What are you hiding? Thank you. So the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those uh, against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Luck for Jules. And I'll call uh, Senator Tyrrell as the teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes. The results of the division are uh, no, 26 noes and 15 ayes. The division is resolved in the negative. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, workplace gender equality amendment closing the gender pay gap bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I rise to speak on the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. Uh, the opposition will be supporting this bill for a number of reasons, uh, and we're pleased that the government has chosen to implement the reforms which importantly began under the former coalition government. In 2021, the coalition government commissioned a review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act. In the 2022 Women's Budget Statement, the Coalition also provided $18.5 million to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to support the implementation of recommendations from the review. The review itself was released in March 2022 and concluded that the gender pay gap in Australia was not closing at a fast enough rate. Whilst there has been much progress and work, to progress women's economic equality in Australia, there has been slow progress on closing the gender pay gap, with progress stalling at 22.8% in 2021 and 2022. The review considered if the agency had the appropriate powers, tools and levers to achieve the objectives as stated in the Act. The review made 10 recommendations to accelerate the rate of change on workplace gender inequality and reduce the reporting burden on business. The measures contained in this bill implement, in part or in full, the following recommendations from the review. Recommendation 2. Publish organisation gender pay gaps to accelerate action to close them. Recommendation 3. Bridge the action gap with new gender equality standards. 
Recommendation 5, support respect at work implementation to prevent and address the workplace sex-based harassment and discrimination. And recommendation 9, set the Workplace Gender Equality Agency up for future success to support employers to drive gender equality in Australian workplaces. Again, as I stated, the opposition is proud to support this bill, uh, given in particular that it implements decisions taken by the former coalition government, and we commend the government for picking up on the work that was undertaken by the former coalition government. The bill includes six amendments to the Workplace Gender Equality Act. The amendments are it requires the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to publish gender pay gap information of relevant employers of over 100 people for each reporting period. It requires relevant employers to provide executive summary and industry benchmark reports to all members of their governing body. Uh, it will rename the current minimum standards as gender equality standards. It will include sexual harassment, harassment on the ground of sex or discrimination as gender equality indicators. It will change the title of the director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to Chief Executive Officer. And it will also see a technical amendment to the definition of reporting period. The Coalition is supportive of the fact that the government has chosen to implement this in a way that ensures that there is no further regulatory burden for businesses under these proposed amendments. No technical changes required by employers in terms of reporting processes or the type of data that is provided to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency in this bill. Currently, organisations with over 100 employees already must provide remuneration data to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. The main change, therefore, that we're looking at in this bill is to allow the agency to publish this data publicly by organisation as opposed to just by industry type. It is also important to note, though, that businesses in Australia were first required to report this data to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency under the relevant Act from 1 January 2013. The reporting requirements for businesses, therefore, are not new and, in fact, have now been in place for over a decade. This is a set of reforms that the Coalition itself would have introduced if we had continued in government. And I do reiterate that we are supportive of implementing them. Uh, again, as I said, uh, when we were in government, we had provided $18.5 million in funding to ensure that these important steps could be undertaken. The Coalition also has a proud record on reducing the gender pay gap, as well as boosting workforce participation for women to record highs. After we were elected to office in 2013, the former Coalition government created in excess of 1.9 million jobs. And importantly, when you look at the breakdown of those 1.9 million jobs, it was around 60 per cent of those jobs went to women. Female workforce participation, again, was around record highs at 62.2 per cent when we left government compared to when we were elected to government in 2013, where you had 58.7 per cent. The gender pay gap reached 13.8 per cent under the former coalition government. And in fact, when we assumed office in 2013, uh, it was actually at 17.4 per cent, where it sat under the former Rudd, Gillard and Rudd Labor governments. We also, as a coalition government, delivered landmark funding of $5.5 billion for women through our two women's budget statements. In 2021-22, we delivered the $3.4 billion 2021-2022 women's budget statement. And the 2022-23 budget statement, well, we delivered $2.1 billion in the women's budget statement, which included $1.3 billion to drive change for women's safety and additional funding to increase women's workforce participation, support women in leadership and improve health outcomes for women and girls in Australia. 
These budgets built on the coalition government's 2018 and 2020 women's economic security statements. These reforms are just one of the important actions that we undertook when we were in government to boost women's participation and position in the workplace. Subject to the passage of the legislation, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency is planning to publish the first round of organisational pay gaps in early 2024. I'd like to thank the major business peak bodies, as well as the many women's organisations who have engaged in the reform process from the commencement when the coalition first undertook the review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act. Groups like the Business Council of Australia, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Industry Group are all supportive of the Chambers. Groups including the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, the Minerals Council, COSBOA, Woolworths, the Law Council of Australia were also consulted during the review process. Again, as I stated at the outset, the Coalition will support this bill because it implements the important reforms that we had commenced whilst we are in government. We are proud to stand on a record of dramatically reducing the gender pay gap in Australia and raising workplace standards for women in Australia, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Cash. Oh, Senator Waters. Yes, thanks very much, uh, President. I rise to speak in support of the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. And it was well timed that the Workplace Gender Equality Agency released its most recent progress report last week. That report shows how Australian employers are tracking against key gender equality indicators, and it confirms the role that transparency and public analysis plays in driving cultural change to close the gender pay gap and tackle inequality. It marks the improvements that have been made in the decades since the Workplace Gender Equality Act was introduced. But the report also records that progress on gender equality is moving far, far too slowly. In the 2022 Global Gender Pay Gap report, Australia ranked 43rd in the world for gender equality. It's a move up from our lowest ebb of 50th under the previous government, but it's still too low for a wealthy country that prides itself on equality. The overall gender pay gap went backwards during COVID, and it's now stalled at 22.8 per cent. We cannot allow equality to go backwards again. In the words of Wajia Director Mary Woodridge, the slowing pace of change signals the need for a renewed approach. Which brings us to this bill. The Greens have long called for reforms to address the key drivers of the gender pay gap. Fairer paid parental leave, more equal sharing of care, accessible and free early childhood education, leadership quotas, supporting women in male-dominated industries, valuing unpaid care work, higher wages in the paid care sector, flexible work arrangements, positive duties to create safe workplaces, strong anti-discrimination laws and greater pay transparency. We have also called for measures to strengthen the reporting regime under the Workplace Gender Equality Act. You cannot fix a problem that you don't understand, and you can't understand a problem without clear, consistent and meaningful data. Improving data collection on diversity, workplace harassment and discrimination and on actions to address shortfalls is key to improving workplace diversity, safety and equality, all of which help to close the gender pay gap. And while data collection is critical to understanding the problem, it can't be an end in itself. There must be compliance measures and incentives to drive change. Once companies have identified a gender pay gap, they need to take action. They need to be supported to do that and there needs to be consequences if they do not. As part of the 2022 Wajia review, the Greens called for a number of reforms, including extending Wajia's coverage to the public and private sector organisations with more than 50 employees, not the current threshold of 100 employees. Measuring more than just whether policy exists, but actually looking at whether those policies are implemented and what impact they're having publishing employer-level pay data rather than just sector by sector, naming and shaming, if you like, to encourage change, requiring employers to take action to close the gender pay gap 
and making employers not working to reduce their pay gap ineligible for government grants and contracts, requiring employers to report on the number of sexual harassment complaints made and the action taken in response, collecting intersectional data to identify hurdles for particular groups of women and design targeted approach to addressing specific pay gaps. They were the reforms that we called for, and I'm very pleased to see that many of those recommendations were reflected in the final report of the Wajia Review. And I was pleased to see in particular the Government Act on Pay Transparency in the private sector, an issue in which I had a private member's bill on in this chamber in 2015. And I was pleased to see confirmation that the whole Commonwealth public sector will be reporting against gender indicators by 2024. I'm pleased also to see more of those recommendations being implemented in this bill and the revised minimum standards instruments. This bill will require WGIA to publish employer-level gender pay gap data. It will require relevant employers to report to their governing bodies, and it will recognise sexual harassment and discrimination as gender equality indicators. The new minimum standards instruments provide for more detailed reporting to bridge the gap between policy and action. In combination, these changes will help shine a light on pay inequality and encourage employers to take meaningful action. Greater transparency will allow employees to see where they're being shortchanged, to call out their employers for lack of action or to make the decision to move on if they feel like they're not being valued. The changes will also allow more data on the intersectional pay inequality experienced by First Nations women, culturally diverse women, LGBTIQ plus women and women with disability. More work needs to be done to secure robust data collection for non-binary employees and to align data collection protocols across the public sector, but I do note the government's commitment to continue working on that. But some of the things that we've called for have not yet been delivered. Firstly, what's reported? Many organisations who've made submissions uh, on the inquiry into this bill call for employers to submit data on both base salary rates and also total remuneration packages. Sectors that regularly use incentives or bonus schemes, such as law, finance and tech, are often male-dominated, and failure to account for extra payments, generally weighted towards men, risks disguising gender pay gaps within those industries. Reporting on salaries should also capture overtime payments. Without that information, pay gap data in professions with high proportions of part-time and shift workers, such as retail, nursing and aged care, get distorted. Women are often least able to accept overtime shifts due to caring responsibilities. As I said at the outset, you can't fix a problem that you don't understand. We need to make sure that the data, is being that the data that's being collected helps to understand workplace dynamics and why a pay gap persists in some sectors. Wajir should undertake a review of the new gender equality indicators and reporting requirements within three years to identify any key data gaps and assess whether greater transparency on the listed indicators is driving meaningful change. Now, in relation to who has to report, as I mentioned before, the current threshold for reporting to Wajia is companies with 100 employees or more. And only companies with more than 500 employees are required to report against the more detailed gender equality indicators. This means that pay disparities and the volume of sexual harassment in many small and medium-sized businesses, a sector that does employ a significant number of people in Australia, will remain underreported. The Global Institute for Women's Leadership looked at gender pay gap reporting in a number of developed countries. And the institute concluded that gender inequality is too important for gender pay gap reporting regimes to only target large employers. The median reporting threshold amongst countries with gender pay gap reporting is 50. This is the case in France, Belgium, Spain and South Africa. In Sweden, companies with as few as 10 employees are required to report. So it's no coincidence that these countries have some of the lowest gender pay gaps. We will continue to call for the government to lower the reporting threshold and require companies and public, se public sector entities with more than 50 employees to report against all the gender equality indicators. Small and medium-sized businesses must be supported to meet those new reporting obligations. We urge the government to expedite work to bring state and territory public service bodies under the Wajia reporting regime. 
while various states require gender pay gap reporting without harmonisation, WGIA can't gather a consistent national suite of data to inform its analysis. Now, in relation to compliance, as identified in the WGIA progress report, reporting obligations have driven action in the past decade, but it's been too slow and too patchy. To drive a rapid cultural shift and close the gender pay gap, WGIA needs powers to monitor compliance. They need to be able to hold employers to account where they fail to report or where their reports are incomplete or misleading. The workplace gender equality procurement principles already on paper seek to stop non-compliant employers from receiving government grants, tenders or contracts. But in previous years, many non-compliant employers continued to receive government funding and contracts. We welcome commitments from the government to ensure that the procurement principles are given effect and provide a positive incentive for employers to walk, work towards closing their gender pay gap. Companies with long-term government contracts must meet their annual reporting obligations and take meaningful action to address gender pay gaps, or they must risk losing their contract. We strongly support that approach. Public funding and procurement is an effective lever to drive change. Critically, WGIA needs to have adequate resources to monitor compliance and to identify companies struggling to close their gender pay gap. Companies should be supported uh, with targeted training and workplace consultation, assistance to develop action plans, or by encouraging managers of similar uh, types of organisations that have successfully closed their pay gap to mentor others. We welcome the additional funding uh, allocated to WGIA in the 2022-23 budget. The government must consult regularly uh, with WGIA about whether any additional resources or powers are required to enable WGIA to achieve the aims of this bill. Closing the gender pay gap is everybody's business. We welcome this bill as a positive step and urge the government to use its promised second tranche of reforms to implement the outstanding recommendations from the WGIA review and drive the change that all employees deserve. The gender pay gap is about equality and economic security. But I want to finish my contribution by talking about the fact that we have more women and children than ever before sliding into poverty. So we can't just have a tick and flick on this issue. We welcome these reforms on the gender pay gap reporting requirements, but we have a disproportionate amount of women sliding into poverty, a disproportionate amount of women that are reliant on the inadequate job seeker payment, and a disproportionate amount of women who are single mums who are currently receiving the inadequate single parent payment. And once their oldest, uh, youngest child turns eight, they then get punted onto the even lower job seeker rate, which is a drop of approximately $200 a fortnight. Now, we, ha we held a very uh, moving uh, forum yesterday morning where we had some amazing speakers, including Dr Anne Summers, um, uh, Sam Mostyn, who's now advising the government through the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, um, and a number of other um, really passionate advocates, including Therese Edwards from the Council of Single Mothers. And they are calling for the government to reverse that terrible decision to drop single mums off single parent payment once their youngest child turns eight. And the Greens strongly back that call. They've done the figures. It's a $1.41 billion cost, but it would be life changing for 500,000 single mums. Now, single mums are the hardest working people that I know, and we will stand side by side and fight for them to have enough money to live on. So it's great that we're talking about the gender pay gap in workplaces, but we need to broaden the conversation and talk about the gender wealth gap, talk about the fact that we still do not value women's labour and the unpaid care that we do every single day disproportionately more than our male counterparts. We have a lot of reforms that need to happen, and I'm encouraged that the Women's Economic Equality Task Force have quite a broad remit, and I'm really looking forward to their recommendations. And I'm urging the government to get serious about gender equality in the budget. We've waited so long. Things aren't getting better. Women are getting poorer and poorer. And this is a budget priority issue for this government. It should be. Never mind the $368 billion for the subs, never mind the $254 billion for the wealthy. Of course, most of them are men. Actually start funding women, value their unpaid labour, increase those rates of income support, both for people on JobSeeker and for those single parents. They are desperate. They are living in their cars or their tents, and it is not okay.
Uh, thank you, um, Senator Waters. Um, Senator Smith, you've got about a minute and a bit. Well, in my minute and a bit, it's uh, great to be speaking on a bill called the Closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill about time. Um, but I just did want to respond to something that Senator Waters uh, just said around the collection of data by Wajir. My understanding is actually that Wajir does use total remuneration, um, including on super overtime bonuses and other payments. So I just wanted to make a, a statement about that. Um, but, President, um, it is absolutely a privilege to be standing here talking to a bill called Closing the Gender Pay Gap about time. We have been talking in this chamber for many, many years about the inequity that exists in earnings for working women as opposed to working men. And the reality is, for all of us who believe in a more equal future for working Australians, that more equal future requires and necessitates equity between women and men in the workplace. Because we know when women go into the workplace, as well as <coughs> Senator Water said, all the additional caring responsibilities that they hold um, the additional burden of in most households, to be frank, in Australia, they also then enter the workforce and for the same job are not being remunerated equally to their male counterparts. And that has to stop. And there has been a lot of, a lot of advocacy in this space over many years, indeed many, many decades, um, to close the gender pay gap. But what we do know is the work we have done to date hasn't been working fast enough and hasn't been working effectively enough. We need to change our approach. We need to get tougher Thank with our you, approach. Thank you, Senator Smith. The time for this matter has um, expired. I'm now being 11.15, we move to um, notices and motions. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none. Um, there is a report from the Selection of Bills Committee, Senator Urquhart. There is, um, President. I present the third report of 2023 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the report be tabled, uh, be adopted. Uh, Senator Chisholm. <coughs> uh, I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add, and in respect of the Financial Accountability Regime Bill 2023 and four related bills, the bills not be referred to a committee. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, President. Um, the Greens do not support this amendment, and that's because we do think an, in, uh, an inquiry into uh, the financial accountability regime bill and its related bills is warranted. And that's because an inquiry could have helped us get to the bottom of uh, the extraordinary influence that uh, the Australian Banking Association has over uh, both the government and the opposition in this place. Because we all recall that uh, the Australian Greens had an agreement uh, with um, Minister Jones to uh, include uh, into uh, the financial accountability regime uh, the capacity for million dollar fines to be levied against dodgy bankers. Uh, and history shows that uh, very quickly after striking that agreement uh, with the Australian Greens, Minister Jones backflipped. And I have no doubt that that's because uh, the Australian Banking Association uh, reached in not just into his office but into the Treasurer's office and the Prime Minister's office and made it very clear. That, uh, that those fines were not to be included. And as a result, uh, there will be no civil penalties in the financial accountability regime for dodgy bankers who uh, do not take the necessary steps to ensure that their customers aren't ripped off. And uh, the Australian Greens very firmly believe that we should be um, allowing the disinfectant of sunlight to, to shine on uh, exactly what went on there and exactly why it is that uh, this is a second-class financial accountability regime <coughs> framework, because it doesn't actually provide for the capacity for million-dollar fines for dodgy bankers. And once again, the political donations that occur uh, in this place that poison so much of our 
political debate are again poisoning public policy in this country because, of course, the big banks are major donors to both the Australian Labor Party and to the Liberal and national parties, and it's very instructive that the only uh, significant party in this place that doesn't take donations from the big banks, that is the Australian Greens, is the only party standing up and fighting hard for the inclusion of million dollar fines for dodgy bankers mm -hmm. into the financial accountability regime bill. So there was every, um, every need that a reasonable person uh, could see for an inquiry into exactly what happened, exactly what is the power and influence of the big banking corporations on the major parties and, by dint of their numbers, on this chamber as a whole. And make no mistake, it is dirty, toxic political donations, the institutionalised bribery that has become normalised in this country, that is, uh, that is corrupting our democracy and corrupting the legislation that this chamber is passing. So it's a sad day, a sad day indeed, where uh, both the Australian Labor Party in government and the Liberal and National parties in opposition are going to collude to ensure that that disinfectant of sunlight is not able to shine on, uh, on the dirty and disgraceful machinations that happened that forced uh, the government, the minister, to walk away from an agreement that they had to include million dollar fines for dodgy bankers in the financial accountability regime bill. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is, the amendment as moved by Senator Chisholm to the selection of bills committee be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Um, so I'll now move the selection of bills committee report as Amended. So the question is that the selection of bills committee report as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Chisholm. I move that today government business orders of the day as shown on today's order of business be considered from 12:15 p.m. B government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1.30 p.m. and see general business notice motion number 195 be considered during general business. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Um, leave of absence or am I calling the clerk? No? No, no leave? Done. Okay. I'll call the clerk. <laughs> uh, President, a postponement notica notification has been lodged by Senator Rice in respect of General Business Notice 197, postponed to the 27th of March. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Uh, so I'll move to Government Business Number 1, standing in the name of the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. I ask that. Government business notice and motion number one relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher and moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 194, standing in the name of Senator Babette. I ask that. Uh General business notice of motion number 194 be taken as a, as a formal uh, motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Babette. I move the motion. Oh, uh, I think you got there first, Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement of no more than one minute. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank, Thank you, Senator you. Roberts. We, we've witnessed in this country an increased death rate due to COVID vaccines, the evidence is quite clear, that excess death rate is around 17 per cent. Unexplained. No one in the health sector will explain it. No one in the health bureaucracy will explain it. Uncaring. Didn't let, let this go. It is a cover-up. There's been gross mismanagement with COVID because it has never been about health. It has been about de using deceit to ensure wealth transfer and control over people. 
The government has just been belted this morning by the crossbench for the lack of transparency and the lack of integrity. <coughs> show some guts, show some integrity, show some transparency and support Senator Babette's, Babette's motion. One Nation will be supporting Senator Babette's motion. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. His leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, President. Uh, the Coalition uh, thinks this is a very important issue. Uh, given the number of select committees on foot at the moment, and I think there might be four at present currently, uh, five in fact I'm advised, being operated by the Senate, uh, our preference would be to see this issue interrogated through the Community Affairs References Committee and have an inquiry into these very terms of reference there. Uh, as such, we won't be supporting the motion before the Chamber, but as stated, it's an important issue. It requires a bit of sunlight to coin a phrase from Senator McKim. Let's have a look and interrogate the matter there. Uh, Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, the government opposes <coughs> this motion. We oppose it on the basis that there are already mechanisms that exist to undertake the analysis that the motion contemplates. Trusted organisations, including the ABS, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and the Department of Health and Aged Care, work together to ensure that we have a robust system of reporting the mortality and morbidity at the national level. This work, of course, is informed by the work undertaken by state and territory health departments and their disease surveillance and health reporting frameworks. Our existing framework of disease surveillance and reporting has been built up over decades and continues to provide the data required by public health ex experts to undertake the detailed epidemiological research into issues such as social determinants of health that is contemplated in this motion. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 194, standing in the name of Senator Babette, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <coughs>
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that general business notes of motion number 194, standing in the name of Senator Babette, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Yes, I appoint Senator Babette as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being four ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to general business notice of motion number 196, standing in the way, name of Senator Cash. Senator Cash. President, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 196, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. So the question is: the mo uh, is, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Cash. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Cash. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. An act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. Senator Cash. That this bill we now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cash. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, are there any committee memberships? Okay. And are there messages from the House? Uh, formal business is concluded. I'm doing messages now. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and Other Legislation Amendment Modernisation Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the oversight of intelligence services and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, workplace gender equality amendment, closing the gender pay gap bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith, you're in continuation. Thank you, President. Um, I just had a, a few remarks remaining in my contribution. As I said, I 
I wanted to keep it brief, but it is a privilege to be speaking on a bill called Closing the Gender Pay Gap. We know the work that has been done to date hasn't been happening fast enough. And the bill before us presents a new or a, a much tougher requirement in terms of reporting, in terms of the information businesses are required to provide to WGIA. And the impact of this will be uncomfortable for some businesses. We know it will be uncomfortable for some businesses. But it's these uncomfortable truths which will make a difference to closing the pay gap. We have seen in other jurisdictions what happens when you put that additional layer and burden of proof on businesses to come to the table with the problem, when even well-meaning businesses have to come to the table and explain their gender pay gap. That transparency will drive action. And that's what this bill really is about. It's about the concrete steps that we take. Yes, they will be uncomfortable for some. They will be uncomfortable for some. But that discomfort is our opportunity to drive change. We know that the gender pay gap has been too stubbornly persistent for too long. We know that women are retiring with a massive gap in their superannuation earnings. And we know when they're ending their careers, their superannuation balances are far lower than their male counterparts. There are ways to change this through superannuation. There are ways to change this through participation. There are ways to change this through support for education and training and time out of the workplace. But this is going to be a really significant reform as well. Data matters. How we collect data matters. How we require companies to come to the table with data matters. And despite that discomfort, I hope business comes to this with enthusiasm and support. Because we know that if they do, if they come to this with the, with the same degree of enthusiasm and the same intentions and goodwill that everyone in this chamber is supporting this legislation with comes to it, we know we will see some really, really great results. Um, we know that we will see a change and an impact to the, to the gender pay gap. Um, and I really hope that the two-year-old climbing up my back behind me, when she enters the workplace one day, when she, when she enters the workplace, um, unlike Senator Waters and I, who have been campaigning on this issue for many, many years, my daughter will be able to enter the workplace and know that she's paid fairly and appropriately and adequately compared to her male counterparts. That's a future we can all strive to work for. There is a lot we need to do, of course, to make women's futures more equal. But in the workplace, this is one particular thing we can do today, and I'm really pleased and enthused by the support across the chamber for it, to make a difference to the gender pay gap, and I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Shall we try again, Senator McKim? Thank you, President. I'll just draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, yes, I believe we need a quorum called. Quorum has been reached. I'm calling Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, 
President, I rise to speak on the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. The Albanese Labor government is delivering on an election commitment to help close the gender pay gap at work. The Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023 will work to ensure this occurs sooner rather than later. The bill will publish gender pay gaps of employers with 100 or more workers, a key reform to drive transparency and action towards closing the gender pay gap. No longer can bosses around the country hide in terms of paying a man and a woman different wages or salaries. For too long, on average, women working full-time can expect to earn 14.1 per cent less than men per week in their pay packet. What does that look like in dollar terms? Well, the average weekly full-time earnings of a woman in Australia across all industries and occupations was lower than the equivalent for men by $263.90 per week. All Australians should be rightly shocked and outraged. The gender pay gap is also holding our economy back, with $51.8 billion a year lost because of the lack of gender equality on pay. If you look at the date on current projections, it will take another 26 years to close the gender pay gap if no action is taken. Now, those opposite may want to continue on that path, but the women of Australia, every woman in every sector, deserves pay parity. Women have waited long enough for the pay gap to close. Let's not wait another second, hour, day, week, month or year, let alone another quarter of a century. At its core, the bill makes employers more responsible with greater accountability towards gender equality in their workplaces and helps drive the actions required in the workplace to ensure pay parity. Advance Australia Fair, they are the words of our, con our country stands by, the way we live as people, and that needs to be applied to pay across the workforce, from the shop floor to the boardroom and even on the basketball court. Australian women and girls deserve fair and safe working conditions. They deserve equality of opportunity. They deserve equal remuneration. No more excuses. It's time. We know that women have an average of 23.4 per cent less super when they come to retirement age than men. We know the cohort of homeless women is growing. Ultimately, what has been happening is still happening is wage theft and women are the collateral damage during their working lives at retirement age. I remember when I was working in the finance sector in Melbourne in the 70s, it seems such a long time ago, but women in that company were only invited to join their superannuation scheme after 10 years. So if you were a young woman like myself and you were taking time out to have a family, you had no hope, no hope whatsoever of being able to join that super fund. And even it was you may be invited, there was no guarantee. It's time to change that once and for all. We deserve pay parity and that's what the Labor government is working very hard with this bill to close that gap. Too many women in Australia can't afford to retire. Women make up half of Australia's workforce. They represent less than a quarter of all chief executive officers. Of course, gender discrimination in the workplace just doesn't impact women. We understand that. In 2021, a review of the Act made 10 recommendations that would help Australia accelerate progress towards workplace gender equality, as well as making reporting easier for employers. The review identified where further action was needed to strengthen the Act. Therefore, the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023, together with the remade instruments under the Act, fulfils most of all the recommendations of the review requiring legislative amendment. The current approach of publishing aggregate industry gender pay gap is not creating the transparency, accountability and insights we need in order to close the gender pay gap fast enough. But now, change is here under the Albanese Labor government. Research tells us the value of that publishing employer gender pay gaps in encouraging employers 
to address adverse gender dynamics in the workplace and ensuring individuals, both employers and employees, towards real-world action that will make change in their workplaces. The bill will align the Act with the workplace gender equality matters in relation to gender equality indicators instrument 2013 number one by including sexual harassment, harassment on the grounds of sex or discrimination as gender equality indicates in the Act. Rather, this change recognises the importance of these core gender equality indicators and updates the Act to bring it in line with its instrument and the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, as well as other recent legislative changes, including the Respect at Work reforms. The bill ultimately reflects the increased ambitions of all these measures to strengthen gender equality and improve outcomes for both women and men in the workplace by amending the Act to rename current minimum standards as gender equality standards. This bill is the first step. There is more we want to do, and until gender equality occurs in all facets, we are not there. We, are not, we will not be advancing Australia fair. There are further reforms to come, and the Office of Women in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet will continue to work to identify the best pathways forward. Every measure in this bill has been designed in close consultation with stakeholders across Australia, including the business and not-for-profit sectors, employee organisations, higher education providers and the women's sector. The bill represents a critical piece of the government's ongoing commitment and action towards gender equality and empowering every woman and girl across Australia. I have two daughters and four, uh, four uh, granddaughters. They deserve to have the same opportunities to succeed in life and be paid as much as their male counterparts. Just to have that gender balance, I have three grandsons as well, so we want equality for both genders. Together with our new strategy to achieve gender equality and working in concert with the respect at work, secure jobs, better pay and improvement for fairness and improvement for families and gender equality legislation passed by this government. The bill will help us to achieve our goal of being one of the best countries in the world for equality between women and men. We have already passed the paid parental leave, which gives that access to both partners and both parents of that child. That is another reform. So we are taking action immediately on coming to government. Reporting will commence in 2024, drawing on data already provided by employers. Companies' gender pay gaps will be published on the Workplace Gender Equality Agency website. There will be nowhere to hide. Enough is enough when pay parity is concerned. This reform was recommended by the 2021 Review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. And I proudly stand on this side of the chamber because the Australian Labor Party and the Albanese government will always fight, always fight for fairness, fair pay for women and girls and equality in the workplace. That will ensure that we have the best possible outcomes for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Pocock. I rise to speak to the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment Closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. Um, and I have a very sensible speech written by my wonderful staff about this bill, but I turned 68 yesterday and I'm feeling cranky. Um, and uh, in the last two weeks, um, I lost a very dear friend who, like me, has given 40 years to the project of, of collecting data about women's gender pay gap. And uh, in my view, there should be more cranky women in this parliament with that kind of experience who can say, we need to do what this bill proposal certainly. We need more transparency in our data uh, on the gender pay gap. But data is not going to cut it, my friends. I've spent 40 years collecting that data, or I've written the books. And my friend, uh, Michelle Hogan, uh, who we've lost, spent many of those years working alongside me amongst low-paid women trying to improve their conditions of employment. And Michelle's 40 years are measured in many ways in activism and in making a difference through the union movement and the women's movement. I have on my desk today a photo of us together at a round table on gender pay inequity in 1991 
out of which came a book about what's wrong and what we need to do. So we worked together for many decades, and our data have not changed. This is not to diminish the incredible work that the Workplace Gender Equality Agent does and efforts by governments, people in this place, over decades to attempt to shift these numbers. But they will not shift through the collection of transparent data. That will not be what is necessary. Because what's going on in our labour market is not just about the gap between people in workplaces on full-time earnings. And we cannot deal with the gender pay gap just by looking at pay data. So I support, as my colleague Senator Waters has pointed out, all of the measures in this bill and the need to go further on better data collection. We need to look at what's going on, for example, at the gap between part-time workers' earnings, men and women. That's where the gap is very wide. And we need to look more carefully at total earnings, at bonuses, at superannuation, at cars, at all the things that men get more of and women get less of. But we need to do a whole lot of other things too. And I think of my friend Michelle as I talk about them. And I want to firstly mention what's going on amongst our low paid workforce. Unless we lift the pay of women in feminised occupations, as is recommended, and I see my um, fellow colleagues from the Select Committee on Work and Care, as is recommended in our recently tabled report out of the Select Committee on Work and Care, unless we lift the pay in those feminised occupations, that is, the childcare workers, the aged care workers, the disability workers, the nurses, um, the people in all of those systems of care, a huge economy of the services sector, where 90 per cent of people work and women work in every workplace at the bottom. Unless we lift those pay uh, rates of those workers um, and also improve their conditions, we will not narrow the gender pay gap. And a group of very sad parliamentarians will be standing here in 40 years lamenting the pay gap. We have to do better than that. And one of the ways we have to do better is by changing the conditions of employment for women in those low-paid low service and care industries. They need more than an improvement in their pay rate. They need more security in their jobs. So many of them are casual. So many of them cannot predict what hours they're working tomorrow or next week. They're in the retail sector. Their employers can predict how many Granny Smith's apples are needed in aisle six tomorrow, but they can't tell those workers what their hours will be. They can't tell those workers what their pay will be. And unless we fix the rostering systems, the uncertainty around rostering, the insecurity of employment, we can sing in here all day about the gender pay gap, but we will make no difference. We have to do more than that. We also have to improve the conditions and system of work that supports women. Women's pay is low because they take time out of the labour market to care for others, for their kids, for their parents, for their friends and their partners. We can afford to move our paid parental leave as a first step beyond 26 weeks. It's a good thing that we're going to 26 weeks paid parental leave, but that's not enough. That takes us to half the international standard. We've recently had costings done on what it would take to take our paid parental leave system to 52 weeks at minimum wage. It'll cost $2 billion a year. That is 10 per cent of the amount annually of the stage three tax cuts. And we women have to come in here and beg for those menial, I mean, it's not nothing, two billion, but by hell, it's not 25 billion, which is going to mostly men on higher pay. It's time we lifted our paid parental leave system to reach more seriously towards the OECD average. We are at the bottom of the heap, along with the US, and we should do better in a very wealthy country that can afford to buy very expensive submarines. We hear and give a tax cut to mostly men on over, 20, uh, over uh, 120,000 a year, over 200,000 a year. The third thing we need to do, um, we, uh, the, uh, uh, just these are my top, I could go all day and I have a limit, which is just as well. The third thing we need to do uh, was referred to uh, by my colleague, Senator Waters. Yesterday, we were at a meeting uh, which at a committee of the Friends of Working Women in this place, and it was a very interesting morning looking at data that Anne's, Dr Ann Summers has collected and put before us about the relationship between poverty and violence. So we have good data on this now, which tells us that so many sole parents are in, uh, alone because they have escaped a violent circumstance, and they are at the bottom of the labour market, insecure in their jobs, where they can find them, and dependent on a payment which in 2013 was cut, as my colleague said, by $100 a week. And Anne Summers made the point 
that if our Prime Minister, if, Alban, if um, the Prime Minister had been brought up by his mother under the regime, the current level of job seeker payment, he was more likely to be in juvie than in the Prime Minister's office. People who grow up in poverty have a higher rate of imprisonment, have a lower rate of, of opportunity throughout their education and into employment. And what we've done since 2013 is confined so many sole parents to poverty with dire consequences for their children, for their families. We lose them, at the very least, as taxpayers. We lose them in our professional workforce. They're one of the reasons that poor payment system is why our labour supply is short. If in other countries where good support is given to sole parents, where good support is given to working mothers, where labour systems don't let 25 per cent of the labour force be casual, casualised or insecure, they have a higher participation rate. No surprise. In a country like Sweden, an average participation rate of women that's eight percentage points higher than here. That's an average increase in the participation rate of four percentage points, and that's worth $100 billion a year. Even if you want to spend it on submarines, God forbid, or on tax cuts for people over, on over 200,000, we could pay over and over again for a much better regime of support for our working women. And God knows we could support a Rolls-Royce system of data collection. It wouldn't be worth the paper it was written on unless we did the essential support changes that our women in our country need. And it is time that we stopped collecting en endless amounts of data uh, without taking the action, which is not to diminish uh, the important work that feminists throughout and workers throughout our public sector do in collecting that data. But unless we are putting alongside that collection the actions that will make a difference, the policy supports that will make a difference, and the real interventions that we have known for decades. My friend Michelle Hogan known, has known for decades. I have known for decades. Any amount of research evidence will tell you the solutions are there, but they do not collapse a lie in collection of data. They lie in action, and that's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Walsh. Thank you very much, President. Uh, well, colleagues, 2049, that's currently the year that the pay gap between men and women is projected to close. Uh, in 26 years' time, on current trends, women can expect to be paid equally to men in the workplace. Well, I am proud to be part of a government that is not prepared to wait. I'm proud to be part of a government that is ready to act. And I'm proud to be part of a government that is not willing to leave it to the next generation. Because too many generations of women have had to suffer the indignity of being paid less than men for doing exactly the same work. And too many women have had to suffer the economic insecurity of their work being undervalued and underpaid because their skills are just not properly recognised. We're calling time on that inequality. <clears throat> and this bill is part of the solution, ensuring that employers report on their gender pay gap, that they provide that information publicly and that employers are part of the solution, not the problem. Because we are a government that sees women because we are a government of over 50 per cent women and because our economic team understands the critical importance of women's work to the economy, women's work in the care sector, women's work in non-traditional industries and women's workforce participation everywhere. This bill is just a part of our commitment to make sure women are respected and valued at work and that they have the security that they need to thrive. So too is our work supporting higher pay rises for people on the minimum wage, many of whom are women. Our work supporting a historic pay rise for aged care workers. Our work recognising the critical importance of the care economy and investing in its workforce, who are overwhelmingly women. Women deserve to be equal and respected at work, and to be equal and respected, you need to be paid equally. And that is what this bill helps to achieve. The gender pay gap alone costs the country over $51 billion a year. And compared to other countries, Australia ranks poorly. We are currently ranked 43rd in the world for gender equality, 
43rd. Uh, it is absolutely not good enough. It's holding our country back, and so we are not wasting any time in taking action. This bill is about two things, accountabil accountability and transparency, because we know you can't fix what you can't see. To truly close the gender pay gap, you need data from employers and you need to hold employers accountable. Gender equality in the workplace starts with pay. That's why this bill will require employers with over 100 staff to report their gender pay gap. It will provide more information on existing inequalities and it puts employers on notice that they need to take action. Because this information will be published publicly on the website of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And the bill will also require relevant employers to provide reports of that information to their governing bodies, providing even more transparency. Having this data available for all to see is a critical part of holding companies to account. So with this legislation hiding the pay gap between men and women, it is just no longer acceptable. Undervaluing women's work is no longer acceptable. Transparency is powerful. Not only will government be able to see exactly where inequalities occur, but so will current and prospective employees. And this allows those employees more power in negotiating for fair wages, and it puts the onus back on employers to fix the pay gap. This bill was an election commitment made by Prime Minister Albanese, a commitment for reform that has been long overdue. But we are a government that is committed to making gender equality a national priority, as it should be. Australian women deserve fair and safe working conditions. They deserve equal opportunity and equal pay. Women have waited long enough for the pay gap to close. So let's not wait another 26 years. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to support this bill, which is part of how the Albanese Labor government is working to close the gender pay gap. It charges employers with greater responsibility and accountability towards gender equality in their workforces and helps to drive the actions required to bring about higher levels of gender equality in our country. You see, women on average have 23.4 per cent less super when they come to retirement age than men. They are overrepresented in industries with lower wages and underrepresented in positions of leadership. And this inequality doesn't just impact women, it restrains the entire economy. The gender pay gap alone represents a cost of $51.8 billion a year. In 2021, the Act was reviewed and 10 recommendations given that would help Australia accelerate our progress towards workplace gender equality, as well as making reporting easier for employers. This bill, together with the remade instruments under the Act, fulfils almost all the recommendations of the review requiring legislative amendment. It also fulfils a key election promise to close the gender pay gap, including by boosting pay gap transparency and encouraging action to close gender pay gaps within the organisation. This bill will drive employer action, transparency and accountability to help us progress towards gender equality in the workplace. This bill will achieve this by allowing the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to report gender pay gaps at employer level. Currently, the approach is publishing aggregate industry gender pay gaps, and this does not create transparency or accountability required to close the gap. Publishing employer gender pay gaps encourages employers to address the causes of the pay gaps internally, and it also encourages individuals to take action to change the workplace. <coughs> Along this, alongside this bill, the remade instruments will streamline aspects of existing reporting, um, reducing regulatory burdens, and freeing businesses up to focus on the efforts of gender equality um, gender equality action. 
This bill will align the Act with the Workplace Gender Equality Instruments 2013 by including sexual harassment, harassment on the ground of sex and discrimination as gender equality indicators in the Act. Now, this does not change reporting obligations, but rather recognises the importance of these core gender equality indicators. And the bill goes on to reflect the increased ambitions of all these measures to improve gender equality and outcomes for both men and women in the workplace by amending the Act to rename minimum standards to gender equality standards. It is the first step, but there is much more this government wants to do to improve workplace gender equality. While closing the gender pay gap is a major commitment and a priority of this Albanese government, it is also personally an important issue to me. Before I was elected to this place, I was an organiser at United Workers Union, and that union covers a range of different industries which are highly feminised, highly diverse, and where the workers are often overworked and underpaid. From cleaners to aged care workers to early childhood educators, these industries are majority women and are absolutely essential for the well-being of Australians. My time at the union, hearing many tragic and devastating stories of women trying to make ends meet, ignited the desire in me to become involved in politics. It pulled me to join the fight for these workers because something needed to change. The Australian people voted in a responsible, mature and compassionate government and in the process elected me as Senator for Western Australia. My constituents in the West know that I take my responsibility to stand up for workers and for women very seriously. Gender equality is important for all West Australians and there is clear evidence that increasing participation of women in the, in the workforce brings economic and social benefits to everyone. This bill represents a critical piece in Labor's commitment to gender equality, which will benefit all Australians and it will help us achieve the goal of being one of the best countries in the world for equality between men and women. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. Now, this bill is yet another example of the way the Albanese government is delivering on its commitment to grow wages, improve gender equality and close the gender pay gap. It delivers on recommendations of the 2021 review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act. Most importantly, the bill allows the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to establish gender pay gaps at the employer level rather than just the industry level and to publish those. And most importantly, why is this bill so important? Well, last year, the gender pay gap in this country was 14.1 per cent. In the private companies with over 100 employees, that balloons to 22.8 per cent. Now, that is an unacceptable and, at the current rate of progress, it would take 26 years to close the gender pay gap. Australian women do not have 26 years to wait for equality. They deserve equality now. They deserve equality yesterday, and they certainly deserve equality through this legislation that will help achieve it. That's why this government has treated gender inequality with the urgency it deserves. We supported the $1 increase to the minimum wage, an increase that supported both men and women in low-paid roles, but 55 per cent of workers in low-paid roles are women. That were and, of course, that was opposed by those opposite. And no doubt that we'll see them oppose a minimum wage increase for low-paid workers again this year. We made it easier for workers in low-paid, feminised industries to bargain collectively across workplaces. And that is a move that this will see this agreement making and wages increase. And, of course, that was opposed by those opposite. We, want to make, we made gender equality an object of the Fair Work Act and again opposed by those opposite. We prohibited the use of pay secrecy clauses, which have long been used to stop women from finding out that they are being paid less than their male counterparts. That was opposed by those opposite. We strengthened the right to request flexible work. That was opposed by those opposite. We prohibited sexual harassment in the Fair Work Act, and that was opposed by those opposite. 
We are introducing the Housing Australia Future Fund, which will provide 4,000 homes for women and children facing domestic violence, and that is being opposed by those opposite. We have introduced 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave. We have made reforms which made, make childcare cheaper, ch early childhood education more available, a measure which enables greater parental workforce participation. And we have made significant improvements to paid parental leave. I want to commend again the trade union movement for being at the forefront of driving these reforms. I particularly want to highlight the tireless efforts of the Australian Services Union in the continued fight for gender equality at work. And I use this, the word fight deliberately because it has been a fight every step of the way against those opposite, those opposite either by inaction or direct opposition. Now, it's just easy to forget how we've come to this point. Less than 10 years ago, the Abbott government had just one woman in cabinet. Just one. Now, this time last year, we had a Prime Minister who told women protesting outside these walls that they should be grateful they weren't being shot at. We had a government that cut penalty rates, a move which disproportionately attacked women who make up a majority of retail and hospitality workers. We had a government that delivered, delayed an increase in the superannuation guarantee, a move that cost every worker in this country tens of thousands of dollars at a time when the average woman already has 23.4 per cent less in their super when they retire. We should be finding ways to close the gender super gap. Instead, there are members of the opposition who want to destroy superannuation entirely. Of course, I have to mention Senator Bragg. Bragg, the representative of the Financial Services Council in this place, is obviously one of them, but he's one of many on the opposite side. There are members of the opposition who prefer to see Australian retirees, including women, retire, retire without super and into squalor and poverty, at a time when the fastest growing demographic suffering homelessness is women over 55. This opposition doesn't want them to have super. This opposition is opposing 4,000 new properties for women and children suffering domestic violence. This opposition doesn't want them to have housing. This opposition doesn't want them to have a fair pay rise. This opposition is opposed to everything that stands and stands for nothing. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment, closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. As we have heard, this is a significant step forward in advancing gender equality in Australian workplaces. This legislation will be instrumental in ensuring that the gender pay gap will continue to close through employer action, greater transparency and accountability and progressing gender equality in the workplace. Within our government's term, we've already seen the gap decrease. This is certainly attributable to Minister Gallagher's advocacy in bolstering Australian women's economic empowerment. I would like to commend Minister Gallagher on her incredible dedication and work in introducing the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment Bill 2023 to help close the very real gender pay gap in our country. I also believe the historic representation of women in our government has made a considerable difference in how this government is approaching public policy. You can't replace lived experience and Australian women can rest assured their experiences and needs are being considered now more than ever. This bill will see employees with 100 or more work workers publicly publish data on, the gen on gender pay gaps on the Workplace Gender Equality Agency website. Red tape for businesses will be reduced, reduced so this will be easier for companies to do. This is a key reform to drive transparency and action towards closing the gender pay gap. Data collection and publication of these statistics is so important in furthering our knowledge of gender pay gaps progression. From international experience, we know that publishing employer-level gender pay gap data can drive organisations to take action on closing the gender pay gap. Having more clarity on a problem will mean we can build and design better policy and programmatic solutions. And it means we can track our progress and best direct future efforts to closing the gender pay gap once and for all. On our current trajectory, 
it will take roughly 26 years to close the gender pay gap. Recently, the United Nations announced that at the current rate of progress, it will take almost 300 years, 300 years to achieve gender equality worldwide. Currently, and you may have seen the recent statistics, in Australia, women earn 87 cents in every dollar that men earn. You may also have seen the figure that working women who work full-time earn $253.50 less than men every single week. Senator Stewart, I'm loath to interrupt, but it being 12.15 p.m., I now call the clerk. Government Business Order for Day Number 3, Australia Council Amendment Creative Australia Bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pocock? No. Senator Hanson-Young? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to um, uh, speak to this piece of legislation today, uh, a bill that the Greens uh, will be uh, supporting. But I want to put on the record first up just how long uh, the Australian arts community and creative industry has waited for a proper cultural policy um, in this country. For over a decade uh, or more, Australian artists and creative workers have been sidelined. Year after year, budget after budget, the government hasn't just ignored them. In a number of ways, under the previous government, they were actively undermined and attacked. And I remember uh, standing in this very place uh, only um, <laughs> you know, uh, eight or nine years ago uh, when the arts community in this country was under full-blown attack from uh, the then uh, minister responsible, um, Senator George Brandis, inf infamously now referred to as the Brandis Cuts. And this industry these creative workers, our Australian artists, our cultural heart of the nation, has never actually recovered. This bill before us today goes some way to uh, starting to repair the over decade long damage to our creative industries and artists, our cultural institutions like the National Galleries and Libraries, have been starved of funding. And then, in turn, those of us, our communities, our children, our educators, our thinkers, have been starved of their effective resources. Of course, we know that when COVID-19 hit our economy, and impacted on our communities, it was our creative workers who were hit the hardest. And again, they were ignored and sidelined by previous government responses. Artists who were already vulnerable and fragile to even the smallest of economic bumps were left suffering with very little to rely on. Little savings, little infrastructure and very little care from the previous government. Oh, this particular bill is, is, should be fairly uncontroversial, but it does present a big idea, and that is that art matters. That is that artists matter. That is that artists' jobs matter. And that if we are to be a bright, smart, resourceful, innovative country, a nation that is prepared for the future challenges, we need a strong foundation of supporting creativity, creative thought and artistic talent. That is a big idea. And whether it is through music, whether it is through performance, whether it is through 
visual art, photography, challenging debate, whether it is seeing our own lives reflected on our screens as a mirror of who we are and what we, what we aspire to be. It is a big idea that these are foundations for a smart, innovative nation. So this is only the first plank in this government's proposed cultural policy. There is so much more work that needs to be done. We need, to, we need to have the funding align with this agenda. We need to make sure that our cultural institutions, who are on the bare bones of their backsides right now, have the support not just to fix the leaky roofs, to protect the billions of dollars' worth of collections that they have, but that they can open their doors and their resources uh, to the next generation. We need the funding for our cultural institutions to be prioritised, and I presume that we will have that debate in this upcoming budget. We will need to uh, have further conversations about how we support our storytelling in this nation, whether it, that's through song or through uh, our television screens our devices, our digital devices. We're going to have those battles coming forward. And I, I want to put it on the record today that up until now, so far, my conversations with the government have been very, very positive, very constructive. But don't think for one second that the Greens will simply roll over and think that this job is done, because it is not. We have to prioritise artists in this country like never before if we want to deal with the challenges, the big challenges we have for our future. It is creativity that drives innovation, connection and understanding. Fostering creativity is essential for any nation that wants to be at the forefront of the next industrial revolution. And I say to the Minister Tony Burke today, I'm, I will be there to help you prioritise this big agenda, but don't go and weak on me now. Don't go weak. Stand strong. Have those debates in the Cabinet room over what needs to be funded, why it's worth it, why the soul and heart and creative beat of this nation needs to be at the forefront once more. Don't come in here in, after the May budget's been handed down and say, oh, we just didn't have the money. Because it is about priorities. And I think every child in this country deserves access to art classes, to music, to the ability to expand and enhance and understand their creativity. Every child in this country deserves to learn about art at school. Every child in this country deserves the opportunity to learn music. That is the big thinking we need after this piece of legislation has been introduced and been passed. Because if we're going to put in place a Creativity Australia agency, we need to back it up with money and back it up with policy priority. I say this as a proud South Australian. And if you want to, if you want, for, for those of you across this chamber who have never been to Adelaide in March, you've just missed out 
on the best few weeks ever. Adelaide has been a city celebrating the very essence of art and creativity over these last few weeks. A big shout out to the Adelaide Fringe that sold over a million tickets this year. A million tickets. The largest festival in this country. Second largest in the world of its kind after Edinburgh. The WOMAD Music Festival sold out. So while creativity is fundamental to the heartbeat and soul of our nation, it underpins the economic foundation of my hometown in Adelaide. And I'm incredibly proud of that. But I want to see this grow. I want to see this continue. And I ask the government, don't just put up policies that sound nice on paper, that look good on the glossy pamphlets. Let's fund this properly. And don't come in here on budget day saying you couldn't find the money. Because, <laughs> because we all know where the money is currently going. It's going to the stage three tax cuts and some weapons grade powered nuclear submarines. That's not going to build a smart nation. That's not going to invest in our children's creativity to be the innovators of the future. We need a huge investment in skills and training in creativity in this country. We have a massive opportunity. And it's not just about starting at school, although I reiterate again, every child in this country should have the opportunity to do art and to do music and to learn about the capacity to think critically through creativity. But once you've been through school, we need our educational institutions to value and be funded to also train and teach in the creative sectors. Our educational institutions in the creative industry right now are struggling and they need investment and they need support. And there is a huge drought of skilled, trained, creative workers and we are missing out in this nation to harness their power and we need to get that right. So I say again to the minister, Good start. Let's finish it with proper funding and proper support. I look forward to uh, getting into the detail in these issues with the Senate inquiry uh, that um, we have established through the Environment and Communications Standing Committee, because this issue is not just about art in this country. This is about what kind of economy we want, the strength of, this, of the future economy, a decarbonised economy. It is about the strength and level of education of the next generation. And it is about Australia wrestling with this ability to tell our own stories, who we want to be, where we've come from and where we want to go. And I'm sick and tired of every time government wants to claim some win that they've funded the arts, they've handed a bunch of cash to, to some Hollywood film that's come here to shoot for six months and that's it. Or to subsidise some rock concert of Guns and Roses. Fine, let's have Guns and Roses in Australia, of course. But what are we doing to fund and support Australian musicians? What Australian shows 
particularly in relation to kids' television, are we supporting? So there's a long way to go here, Mr Acting Deputy President, and just putting this government on notice. Art does matter and it needs to be funded. And we'll have this battle in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. If there are no further speakers on this bill, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I just would like to thank senators for their contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Now, the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australia Council Act 2013 and for related purposes. Thank you. Now, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the third reading. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. I'll try again. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. I thought I heard that the first time. Thank you. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Well, for an act to amend the Australia Council Act 2013 and for related purposes, Government Business Order of the Day number 4, Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure, National Interest and Other Measures Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it is my pleasure to rise and speak on the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure. National Interest and Other Measures Bill 2022. And I am um, very pleased to reiterate the Coalition's support of this bill because it builds on the Coalition's strong record of taking steps to improve communications services to better support the safety of Australians and the work of our law enforcement and emergency services agencies. The background to this bill is, is well understood. It arises from a recommendation of the New South Wales Deputy Coroner to remove the threshold of imminent from rules around authorities accessing location data from telecommunications providers. Accessing this data is important because authorities can use a clever system called triangulation to locate missing persons, suspects or those who may have met foul play. The problem has been in getting the timely approval from the telcos while they dealt with the threshold of whether a serious and imminent threat had been met. Removing the imminent threshold in the view of the coalition is reasonable, particularly as the request has come from a coroner's court recommendation. The bill adds an important safeguard, being that the entity or person being asked to disclose the information needs to be satisfied that it is unreasonable or impracticable to obtain the other person's consent to the proposed disclosure or use. There were concerns about privacy and whether there had been enough engagement with relevant stakeholders. So it was only fair and reasonable for those matters to be fully explored as part of an inquiry by the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. Uh, the committee has now tabled its report and has recommended that the bill be passed. I do want to draw from that report and reference the statement uh, which said Overwhelmingly, the, sorry, the committee made it clear it was overwhelmingly supportive of the bill's intended objective of protecting the lives and well-being of Australians. Uh, it also dealt with the issue of balancing privacy and protection. The committee's view was that the proposed changes did not provide new or additional access to information, but was more about the timeliness and utility of existing provisions around accessing data. It cited evidence by the Department that there were well-established protocols and mechanisms at a federal level by a number of oversight bodies to protect the information obtained from the telcos. 
The report referred to evidence from the Australian Federal Police, suggesting the amendments would be particularly beneficial to vulnerable people, as they would expedite assistance to missing persons at additional risk of harm due to their personal characteristics. The bill would also require more detailed record keeping by the telecommunications providers. Just in reference to industry consultation, we heard that the government carried out what is called a targeted engagement process, uh, but the report stated that the Internet Association of Australia described the process as involving only select industry representatives, which um, it argued was not good practice. Uh, yes, the government said it consulted with 20 organisations, and these included Commonwealth government departments, uh, but clearly there are industry question marks about whether proper consultation um, was um, conducted. Uh, most of all, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, it is important that this bill be ab above politics. And I do regret to say that the Minister for Communications in the other place could not help herself when she made or attempted to make some cheap political points in debate on this bill. In her second reading speech, the minister said, I regret to advise the parliament that this is not the first time that this issue has been raised, referring to a coroner's case dating back to 2020. But uh, I do want to advise the Senate, despite the minister's attempt to make a cheap political point, in a de departmental briefing that I had when I was the Shadow Minister for Communications, um, it was confirmed that the government had not received a written request from um, the coroner in relation to um, amending the Act prior to October 2022. So it's important that we work together as a parliament to be constructive on addressing uh, these issues. Um, but in a way that is above petty politics. As I said on, at the start of this speech, the Coalition supports this bill because it builds on our work in office, particularly uh, on this important issue in the communications portfolio. Uh, the Senate Review report covers this work, and it is, um, and this was referenced in the Coalition's additional uh, comments in the report. We were leaders when in government in rolling out advanced mobile location or AML technology. The coalition's rollout of AML technology built into the operating system of Apple and Android telephones was completed in August 2021. What AML does is provide greater location accuracy to triple zero during an emergency call from a mobile telephone with the objective of saving lives and improving outcomes for mobile callers in Australia. It works by recognising that when an emergency call is made to triple zero, um, if not already activated, AML activates the telephone's location service functions, uh, assesses the location information available to calculate the caller's location and automatically sends an SMS with the estimated location to the triple zero emergency call service. In 2017, the Coalition announced it would issue a request for tender to deliver the next generation triple zero emergency call service with integrated location-based data services, including AML technology. In 2018, the Coalition noted discussions with Telstra to implement a new internet protocol platform to facilitate next generation triple zero capabilities, as well as AML to provide more accurate location information by automatically sending location coordinates to triple zero. In 2020, the coalition announced that AML technology was available for Australians calling triple zero on mobile phones. And on the 25th of August, 2021, the coalition announced the completion of the rollout of AML technology for the triple zero emergency call service. These are really important developments under the former coalition government. And of course, it builds on the many achievements of the former coalition government in the communications portfolio. 
Uh, this includes funding more than 1,200 mobile base stations and delivering record investment to support regional connectivity and improved telecommunications infrastructure for disaster resilient resilience, particularly um, under circumstances where the previous government, the Rudd-Gillard governments, had not invested um, any money at all in mobile base stations. So it is a very proud legacy of this government. Um, we also rolled out the MBN to 99 per cent of all Australians, including upgrading the network so that 75 per cent of premises will receive ultra-fast speeds by the end of 2023. And it is with a great deal of pride that the uh, Labor's former policy um, of rolling out the MBN to every premise uh, in the cities, not in the country areas, any town under 1,000 people, uh, which of course was going to always get fixed wireless or satellite connections. But it is very significant that Labor, this government, has now adopted the coalition's NBN rollout methodology and is building on that very significant work. Of course, we also established the world's first e-safety commissioner, including delivering the Online Safety Act, which extends important online safety protections to adults. We held the global digital platforms to account, including under the news media bargaining code, and we passed a wide range of new regulations to combat telephone and SMS scams. So very significant work, and I do note with regret that we have seen very little action from this government on combating scams, which is costing Australians, as the ACCC um, has made clear, um, several billion dollars a year, potentially up to four billion dollars a year, and yet we have seen no action from this government on combating scams on the over-the-top platforms such as WhatsApp. Uh, Australians would be aware of scams like the Hey Mum scam on WhatsApp, and it is astonishing to me uh, that we have seen so little action from this government on an issue which is impacting. Uh, so many Australians. Nearly every Australian has a digital device of some kind and combating scams is incredibly important. And so I say to the government again, the government must get a hurry on with this very important issue. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, we very much trust that this amendment, this bill, will give the police and emergency services greater support into responding to future emergencies. We are, as I have reiterated already, very happy to support the request from the New South Wales Deputy Coroner made in 2022, and we commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, oh, thank I you, apologize. Acting. Sorry, Senator Shoebridge, I apologise. Two of you jumped up at the same time as I was looking at Senator Henderson. Um, has anyone got any time constraints? Got to get somewhere else? Send the poly you seek to call. Send the shoebridge, I will go to the government, then I'll come to your good self. Thank you. Is that send okay? The, send the poly. Is that okay? I'm just checking with the whip. Okay. Yes, it is. So, thank you, thank you. Uh, Acting President. I rise to speak on the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure, National Interest and Other Measures Bill 2022. This bill is about trying to save Australian lives, so it is of the utmost importance to the Albanese Labor government. The intent of the bill is to improve the operations and transparencies of the relationship between law enforcement agencies and telecommunication companies. For the smooth operations of daily life, the relationship between telecommunication organisations, the public and law enforcement is particularly important. It needs to be a solid and well-functioning relationship. Disclosure of the telecommunications data to save a life or a missing person has a too high threshold to reach, and it's arguable that it has previously cost Australian lives. Therefore, the bill before us responds directly to these recommendations to better protect the safety and well-being of Australians who may find themselves in dangerous and life-threatening circumstances. And secondly, the bill increases accountability and transparency through enhanced record-keeping and requirements for disclosure. That's a key difference between this Albanese Labor government and the previous Liberal national governments. Currently, under the law enforcement, it's undue 
and duly obstructed in locating missing persons because telecommunication companies can only help determine the location of a person and if there is a perceived threat to a person's life or health is serious and imminent. Therefore, the bill before us removes the requirement that the threat be imminent. This will allow greater flexibility in cases of life and death or missing persons, a reasonable and a just change under the law. Further, in the interests of public safety, the bill enhances emergency disclosures from the integrated public number database known as the IPND, the database of all Australian phone numbers and associated names and addresses. Currently, if the number calling 000 is unlisted, the IPND manager is prohibited from disclosing the associated names and addresses to emergency call persons, even when that information is necessary to provide someone with life-saving emergency services. The bill amends the Act so that the IPND manager can disclose information about a subscriber to the 000 emergency call person in connection with a call to 000. This will again provide provide emergency service personnel greater flexibility to locate individuals in need of emergency assistance. As part of the National Emergency Declaration Act of 2022, these provisions were broadened to allow telecommunication companies to provide reasonable and necessary assistance to emergency service organisations. However, that Act unintentionally did not include protections for telecommunication companies acting in good faith from liability for damages. This bill corrects that error. Following the recommendations from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the bill improves the record-keeping security. The bill provides the record-keeping requirements on the telecommunication industry to include more details about the authorisation of disclosures under the Act. Major tele communication providers and the Communications Alliance have been consulted on the bill with amendments made in response to their requests. These proposed amendments are good for our country and the people of Australia's personal safety. Paramount has to be Australian persons' safety. They minimise regulatory impact and provide benefit to industry, law enforcement agencies and emergency service organisations, I firmly believe that this bill from the Albanese Labor government will in fact save lives. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate the Greens won't be opposing the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Information Disclosure, National Interest and Other Measures Bill 2022. Um, uh, and, I, and I note the work of my colleague, Senator Hanson Young, um, in, on both the committee and on the substantive work in relation to this bill. Uh, the Greens have long-standing concerns about the history within a variety of law enforcement agencies of non-compliance with key reporting and record-keeping requirements for telecommunications in intercepts and other secretly obtained information. That includes repeated failure to properly store, to properly protect um, or to destroy, as required under legislation, sensitive data. And, and whilst we accept that with this bill there is an intention to use these powers in strictly limited circumstances, um, those relating to serious threats to life, there is the possibility of the powers being used for broader law enforcement measures, which will require real and ongoing oversight to prevent mission creep. Mr Acting Deputy President, we've, I've read the report from the Deputy Coroner and understand the circumstances that led to that recommendation. And, and implementing those recommendations is a public good. And hopefully um, this will give a power to enable the AFP and state police the power to where there is that serious threat to life to find somebody and help somebody. And I think we're all on, on board with that, the overall objective in this bill. And we understand, those of us who've read the Deputy Coroner's report, understand the rationale behind this. Um, but that being said, this parliament has previously passed laws that have put in place constrained powers for telecommunications intercepts, clear reporting measures, and 
the AFP and state and territory police have routinely ignored the legislative bounds, have routinely um, breached privacy laws and routinely breached the laws of this parliament and the, and the restrictions that they have. The, um, and, and this isn't simply my assertions. I say this having read repeated reports from the Ombudsman, who has an obligation to oversight telecommunications intercepts. The Ombudsman, in a series of reports, has found that the AFP, among other law enforcement agencies, including, as I said, state and territory police, repeatedly break data protection laws, including by wrongly accessing personal communications data, failing to properly store, protect or destroy it. And those breaches are reported year in, year out by the Ombudsman. The, report also, the, reports, the Ombudsman's reports also have found repeatedly that police across the country are not even aware of their legal obligations for data collection, not even aware of the steps they have to undertake when they make the requests, and not aware of even key provisions that you think would, would ring bells with them, warning bells with them, like record keeping for journalist information warrants. And the Department of Home Affairs has been woefully inadequate because it's provided no materials or guidelines for authorised officers when making, when making requests. And this isn't one ombudsman's report. This is ombudsman's report after ombudsman's report after ombudsman's report going back years. So yes, when you read this legislation, you can see that there are checks and balances in the legislation. But our fear, the Greens' fear, is that whatever we put in the legislation, the people who are meant to be enforcing the law will just ignore it particularly the, AF, the Australian Federal Police. Whatever we put in the law, they'll just ignore it and use the powers regardless. And, and we have that fear because that's what they have repeatedly done in the past. So given the evidence that police and other agencies routinely break the existing laws to protect our private data, um, we have a very real concern about how they will use these laws going forward. And we will keep a close watching brief on how these laws will be used going forward. There is a serious lack of transparency in this country for how police gather and manage people's data. And we will closely and critically examine how these laws are operating to ensure that further infringement on people's privacy, unlawful infringement by law enforcement agencies, particularly at a time of unprecedented cyber attacks and other attacks on our personal data, will not be a part of the landscape. Because Acting Deputy President, I'm sure we have all been concerned about how our private data is being unlawfully accessed through cyber attacks by unlawful operators, by criminal gangs, by people who want to use our data for their own financial advantage or to, or to blackmail um, corporations or governments. But we should be even more concerned when our law enforcement agencies are unlawfully accessing our data, unlawfully breaching our privacy. And, and, and tragically, they have a, a real documented, repeated record of doing that. So yes, let's pass these laws. Let's put the protections in place, and they're right to put these protections in place. But let's not pretend that by passing the laws, the police will comply with them, because they probably won't. And we should commit collectively to holding the police and other law enforcement to account for the laws that this place passes. Thank you, Senator Shrewbridge. Are there any further speakers? Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank senators who have contributed to the debate on telecommunications legislation amendment information disclosure national interest and other measures bill 2022, and I thank the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee for its detailed report on the bill and its recommendation that the bill be passed. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of the opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend legislation relating to telecommunications and for related purposes. Thank you. Now, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Thank minister. Thank you. I move that this bill be read a third time. And the question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. 
A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to telecommunications and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number One: Workplace Gender Equality Amendment, closing the Gender Pay Gap Bill 2023. Resumption of second reading debate. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In Australia, women earn 87 cents for every dollar that men earn. Full-time working women also earn $253.50 less than men every single week. There is no justifiable reason for this, no rationale as to why this is the case except to say that women's contributions are severely undervalued alongside their male counterparts in the workplaces across Australia. It's certainly not about our skills or our capability. It is about systemic barriers. We shouldn't have to wait three decades to achieve pay parity. Through these reforms, we're taking serious action to speed up the processes and close the gender pay gap. For First Nations women, women of colour, women with disabilities, LGBTQIA plus women, migrant and refugee women and women from all culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, there is a gap within the gender pay gap. For First Nations women, the gender pay gap compared to non-Aboriginal men is a mammoth 32.7 per cent, more than double the statistic, statistic we so often hear. The gap between First Nations women and non-Aboriginal women is roughly around 19.7 per cent. Currently, these statistics aren't readily available. The new reporting requirements we are discussing here today will go a significant way towards remedying this lack of information. As I've said, we will be able to develop stronger and more effective solutions to these disparities when we understand the problem properly. We must place front and centre the experiences of black women and women of colour in all that we do. We have a collective responsibility to leave no woman behind. Not only do we need to ensure there is understanding, but that First Nations women and women of colour are given the tools and opportunities to maintain a seat at the table and make decisions on an equal playing field. The gender pay gap is not just a conversation. It has real and often life-altering implications for women. It can be the difference in our career choices, influence our decision to have a family and our financial futures and ability to retire. And for First Nations women and women of colour, these decisions become even more profound. We are so fortunate to live in a nation home to many culturally and linguistically diverse women, and what a wonderful thing that is. We are much better for it. Our government is committed to ensuring that women have economic autonomy and opportunity, and we continue to close the gender pay gap for all Australian women. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, Minister, uh, thank you, and I thank um, other senators for their contribution on this bill. When I introduced the bill um, just earlier this year, projections showed that it would take another 26 years to close the gender pay gap. Women have waited long enough for the pay gap to close, and they shouldn't have to wait another quarter of a century to see their work equally valued. Today, with the passing of this bill, we're taking action to close that gap. This bill will be a key driver for employer action, transparency, accountability, and it will help speed up progress towards gender equality in the workplace. It will do this by, for the first time, allowing Wajia to publish gender pay gaps at employer level, not just industry level. This is a critical reform and one that I'm proud to be uh, passing through this, with this legislation today. The bill responds to the review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012, and I recognise the role of the opposition, and I think uh, Senator Cash outlined that in her remarks, in commissioning the review in the first place and responding positively to its findings. I'm pleased to see the broad support for the review's recommendations and for the steps we are taking through this bill to progress implementation of those recommendations. I thank the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration for its report on the bill, and I thank those who have taken the time to make submission. It's heartening to see that these were overwhelmingly positive and showed a commitment to making progress to close the gender pay gap. Government has an important role to play in advancing gender equality, but government alone cannot do this work. 
We need to work with employers, unions and the broader community. We can see that willingness to work together in the response to this bill and to the committee inquiry. I look forward to continuing that work together. I also acknowledge the contributions of Green senators on the committee in welcoming the report while urging further work and for Senator, Walt, Senator Waters um, and her colleagues for their long-standing advocacy in this area. We will keep working on this because this bill is just the first step. There are further reforms to come, especially in collecting diversity data and lifting the standards for larger employers. The Office of, uh, for Women and Wajia, who I would lo both like to acknowledge and thank for their work in getting to this point, uh, Mary under her leadership at Wajia um, and the team there and the Office for Women who have worked so hard to get this bill done and in time uh, so that we can actually start collecting this data um, next year. Wajia will work with employers to ensure they are supported and able to step up to the plate. This bill is a critical step towards achieving women's economic equality because it is getting on with the job of closing the gender pay gap for women in Australia so that they would not have to wait another quarter of a century uh, to, get to achieve equality with uh, male colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you. So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012 and for related purposes. Uh, I understand no amendments have been circulated. Uh, does any member senator require a committee stage? Uh, if not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. I move that the bill be read a third time. Uh, so the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the National Health Amendment Effective uh, Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporations Bill 2023 be called on immediately. I'm going to put that question to the chamber. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. National Health Amendment Effective Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporation Bill 2023 Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Dunham. Acting Deputy President, thank you. And on behalf of Senator Rustin, who is unable to be with us today, I'll deliver a contribution on behalf of the Coalition in relation to the National Health Amendment Effective Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporations Bill 2023. Um, the opposition will be supporting this bill as it provides greater protection for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme from fraud and from abuse. And we've always been strong supporters of the access to affordable medicines that the PBS provides Australians and Australian households. And we know that ensuring continued and improved access to affordable medicines is now more important than ever before, with the cost of living continuing to put significant and rising pressure on Australians. The National Health Amendment Effective Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporations Bill 2023 amends the National Health Act 1953 to support the sustainability and the operation of the PBS. The bill extends the discretionary power of the Secretary and the Minister for Health and the Age, uh, Minister for Health and Aged Care, I beg your pardon, to suspend or to revoke an approval for a pharmacist to supply pharmaceutical benefits at a particular premises, irrespective of whether the approval is uh, held by an individual or under a company structure where they've been charged with a PBS-related offence. By way of background, where a pharmacist has been approved to supply pharmaceutical benefits at a particular premises, the approved pharmacist can make uh, then claims for payment from the Commonwealth in relation to the supply of pharmaceutical benefits. An approval to supply pharmaceutical benefits can be held by a pharmacist as an individual or uh, a body corporate. However, the power to suspend or revoke an approval currently only applies to an approved pharmacist who is an individual. 
if a pharmacist operates under a company structure and they are charged with a PBS-related offence, there is no ability for their approval to be suspended or to be revoked. This means, for example, that if the director of an approved pharmacist corporation is charged with a PBS-related offence, they can continue to receive payments from the Commonwealth despite being charged for fraudulently claiming payments. So we understand the importance of the change contained in this bill, which will help to ensure the sustainability of the PBS by strengthening the compliance powers and ensuring that they are equally applicable to all types of approved pharmacists. Uh, this will better protect the PBS from further fraud and provide greater deterrence for those who would seek to abuse the scheme. The Coalition has always been a strong supporter of the PBS, which ensures Australians have affordable access to critical medicines and will support this bill to protect uh, the sustainability and integrity of this important scheme. Uh, we remain absolutely committed to supporting Australians to have access to affordable medicines and when they need them most. And we're proud of our strong, a strong track record in providing Australians with timely and affordable access to effective medicines, cancer treatments and services. Uh, when last in government, the Coalition listed almost 3,000 new and amended medicines on the PBS, representing an average of around 30 listings per month. But we know that when Labor were last in government, they had to stop listing the medicines on the PBS because they couldn't manage the money needed to fund these listings. The government has stated that the measures contained in this bill support the integrity of, pub, uh, of public funds and to ensure they mm. can be invested in access to new and improved medicines, and we'll hold them to account on this. It's vital that they continue our strong track record on investing in improved access to affordable measures and medicines for all Australians. However, we do already hold concerns that this government is not prioritising investments in improved access to potentially life-saving or life-changing medicines particularly following their decision to remove an innovative diabetes medicine, FIASP, from the PBS. 15,000 families have had the rug pulled out from under them by this government, this Labor government's decision to remove this life-changing diabetes insulin from the PBS, which will send the price soaring once it's off the scheme. The former coalition government ensured that diabetes patients have affordable access to FIASP by listing this fast-acting insulin on the PBS back in the year 2019. We understood that FIASP is an innovative uh, mealtime insulin that improves blood sugar um, control at a faster rate than other diabetes medications, resulting in an improved quality of life for patients. Uh, we note that Minister Butler's Band-Aid announcement to ensure diabetes patients have access to FIASP for an additional six months if they are able to secure a script in time to cover them by the 1st of April. But the minister needs to be transparent with Australian diabetes patients and admit whether he's actually considered all possible steps to ensure FIASP can remain permanently on the P PBS. Because we know Minister Butler has the power to come to a solution with the manufacturer, but sadly it appears that he's not chosen to use that discretion. The government needs to understand that this callous decision will tear away at the quality of life that this medicine affords over 15,000 people and their families across Australia. Labor went to the election with a promise to ensure cheaper medicines for all Australians, but this decision means that they've already broken that promise. And for all their posturing on their promises, uh, Labor shows time and again that their rhetoric in opposition is not matched by their actions in government, and it's costing Australians lives and livelihoods. The decision to break their promise on affordable medicines comes on top of a growing list of broken promises from this government, including their promise to bring down power prices by $275, uh, a promise made on 97 occasions. They also promised they wouldn't make any changes to superannuations, but, uh, superannuation taxes, but one in ten Australians will be affected by the changes they've now announced. And it's clear this is just the groundwork for more taxes and more changes to come. Labor promised to strengthen Medicare, but so far they've only weakened it. They slashed Medicare mental health support in half. They've cut 70 telehealth items from Medicare, and bulk billing rates have plummeted after being at their highest levels when the coalition was in government. Labor said they'd make it easier to see a GP, but they've ripped GPs out of rural, regional and remote Australia by changing the distribution priority areas. Labor promised cost of living relief but the reality is life is only getting harder for Australians. Right now, to borrow a phrase from those opposite, everything is going up except for wages. 
Australians with a mortgage now buckle under the pressure of a tenth consecutive interest rate rise, which means a person with a typical mortgage of $750,000 is now paying $1,700 more per month than they were when rates started rising in May. Electricity prices are continuing to spiral out of control, with new increases of up to 23.7 per cent for households and 25.7 per cent for small businesses uh, now announced. More than 100,000 small businesses will also be impacted by increased bills of up to $1,151 a year. And it's these rising cost of living pressures and indeed the cost of doing business in this country, uh, the pressures on Australians that make access to affordable medicines so critical right now. So once again, the Coalition strongly supports this bill to support the sustainability and the operation of the PBS, which provides Australians with affordable access to potentially life-saving and changing medicines. However, we will continue to ensure that we hold the Albanese Labor government to account on investing in and maintaining continued and improved access to affordable medicines, particularly in the midst of this cost of living crisis. Thank you. Senator Steele John. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Chair. And, um, lovely to be in the chamber with you this afternoon in that role. Um, I speak uh, on behalf of the Australian uh, Greens in support of the National Health Amendment, um, Effective uh, Prosecution Approved Pharmacist Corporation Bill 2023. Um, it really is an energising title that they've given to this piece of legislation. Um, however, I want to use the opportunity to say to the Senate that the availability of medication um, on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme um, has been uh, insufficient for our community time and time again. We have seen, um, I've seen in the role of, of health spokesperson uh, for the Australian Greens, on, on multiple occasions community groups have uh, come to us and very clearly said that either they can't access uh, the medications that they need under the PBS or that it just doesn't go far enough uh, in providing the financial subsidy needed for them to be able to access it affordably. Um, for instance, my office is contacted daily um, by people fighting uh, to get access to insulin, uh, fighting to get access to cancer medications, uh, fighting for basic medications um, that they need um, and rely on, quite frankly, to prevent um, their pain, to manage their, systems, uh, their, their symptoms and to provide for an effective, uh, to provide uh, them with effective treatment. Now, there's many people in the, the chamber this afternoon who I'm sure you know, live with uh, competing medical conditions. Um, and it's, it's really hard to manage them and life uh, with the meds that you need um, to be able to manage them properly, let alone um, if you're managing the condition, life, and not being able to access the meds because you can't afford them, um, or they're not on the PBS in the first place. Now, the Greens have welcomed Minister Butler, uh, Butler's announcement um, of a six-month uh, access period um, to fast-track insulin uh, medication uh, FASIP um, and also FASIP FlexTouch um, as to be part of the, the, the uh, PBS, uh, particularly for people with type 1 diabetes. Um, now, you know, it's a step in the right direction. We've, we have welcomed it, um, but it really is on the government to do a bit better in this space. I mean, we've got a situation where people's lives are actually at risk here. They shouldn't need to share their story to the media to achieve an outcome. Like we can't, I would imagine many people here are quite used to that phenomenon, right? There's a situation where somebody needs a medication urgently. They raise it you know, with, with their local member. Maybe they raise it with their minister. Nothing happens. So they go to the media. A fuss is created um, and then eventually something happens. Occurs. Now, you know, that's great community advocacy and congratulations to the people for doing it. But I think we should just stop for a moment like, and consider whether that's actually how the system should work. You know? 
Like, like people aren't, ministers are paid very well for their time, very large staffs uh, working alongside massive departments. Um, I think most people would assume that you know, people become the minister and people work for the department and so on and so forth in order to like, do a job, right? And that job should be, surely, proactively going out and finding the gaps before they have to be brought to the government's attention uh, because somebody's in crisis. It's hard enough to be in the crisis yourself, let alone uh, feel comfortable disclosing it um, to the media, you know, going through the stresses and strains of that um, to then get your medication, and then that just solves that one thing. And yet ministers are applauded for doing this, you know, for, for um, responding to, you know, individual case-by-case -case basis issues. But really it speaks to that deeper systemic problem. What is the job of a minister and a department? What's the point? You know, surely it should be to do work on behalf of the people to proactively get ahead of these things. Um, we need to see foresight in this space. We need to see medications uh, coming onto the PBS in a way um, that ends this kind of perpetual catch-up that has to be played and this individual crisis by crisis based. Um, action. The community need to be consulted sooner and better. Like, actually, if you go out there and talk to people, if you talk to patient advocacy organisations, they'll tell you what needs to be added. Because often these folks have gone to um, those uh, organisations first to flag the concern. Um, so a bit of authentic engagement with patient advocacy groups and maybe, you know, his, his radical idea, maybe engage on, with them uh, in the same way as you would engage with uh, very well cashed up, very uh, influential organisations that might lobby you. You know, put the hat on and think, well, pff, you know, this is a, it's a rare condition. Uh, this is a small cohort of people. It's a pricey drug. But if this was the AMA, you know, maybe we'd pick up the phone. Maybe we'd sit down and have a conversation earlier, because we know if those people get in the media, we'll have to deal with it. You know, like I understand why, uh, you know, good, effective, and I say good in the sense that they have mastered the art of lobbying, um, I understand why these organisations are responded to by uh, government in the way that they are. But again, just because I understand it, just because it there's a logic to it, doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean that's how it should work. And the reality is that as a member of the executive government, to be lucky enough to do that and be that, you can actually chart your own course. You can actually decide that the small, often ignored, uh, peak body for a rare pain condition gets the spot in your diary that would be got by a larger, better funded, um, more well-known organisation. You can actually make that decision. Now, the Greens will always fight to reduce co-payments and ensure that accessibility and affordability to the PBS, um, the access and affordability of medications on the PBS um, is, is something that is brought down uh, on behalf of the community particularly, as my second reading men amendment addresses today, it is essential that First Nations people um, have access to medications that they require when they require them um, in order to meet our obligations. I mean, let's hope we kind of think of moral obligations in this sense, but there are also you know, committed obligations under um, the closing the gap targets and making sure that First Nations people have the opportunity um, to access their medications uh, when they need them and where they need them uh, is a key part of closing the gap. Now, one such um, step, uh, step forward in this process uh, was the Closing the Gap Pharmaceutical Benefit uh, Scheme co-payment programme, which was established in 
2010 to improve access to affordable PBS medicines for First Nations people living with or at risk of chronic disease. Um, yet public hospital pharmacists are currently unable to supply PBS medicines to First Nations people under the Closing the Gap uh, PBS co-payment program. Um, and this, ha this hampers quite seriously Australia's efforts to close the gap in healthcare outcomes for First Nations people. It means that doctors can't supply medicine at the lower co-payment rate in hospitals uh, because they are excluded from the co-payment measure. It also prevents the provision of expert advice uh, related to uh, the new medication uh, regime by pharmacists who have uh, basically um, counselled them during a patient's inpatient stay. This results, at the end of the day, um, in inequitable, higher out-of-pocket out of costs and co-payments for First Nations people or in situations uh, in which the patients miss out on medicines altogether, uh, increasing the risk of readmission to hospital. So we have a situation where the system, as it currently functions, increases the rate at which people are readmitted to hospital precisely at the moment when we need to be freeing up capacity in our hospitals, particularly in rural um, and regional contexts. My amendment seeks uh, to ask the Senate to call on the Australian uh, government um, to in enable public hospitals and pharmacists to supply the public hospital, hospital pharmacists uh, to supply PBS medicines under the Closing the Gap co-payment program. Mm. Additionally, um, I want to note that the scope of the Closing the Gap PBS co-payment measure needs to be extended to cancer medic uh, medications and highly specialised drugs listed on various Section 100 programmes on the PBS, which are currently excluded from the programme. So my amendment, in, in addition to calling on the government to enable, the public, uh, to enable public hospital pharmacists to supply PBS medicines under the co Closing the Gap uh, co-payment programme um, to First Nations uh, people who are registered for the programme, also seeks to ensure that this is done immediately. Time is a critical factor here um, to improve access and equity in relation to medications. This is in line uh, with the call uh, for uh, national leadership uh, from uh, First Nations bodies uh, in Australia. Uh, the national, particularly the National Aboriginal uh, Community Controlled Health Organisation and the Society of hospital pharmacists who, in their recent budget submission, have costed this me measure at approximately, <laughs> at approximately $1.2 million. Now, um, I have the great uh, honour of being the foreign affairs spokesperson for the Australian Greens, work closely with my colleagues in the areas of defence as well, and spend a long time in the, in the defence and foreign affairs estimates with Senator Shoebridge and others, and I can tell you now, um, our defence programmes in Australia lose $1.2 million down the back of a couch before breakfast. Like, this is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of the Australian government, and yet it would change lives. I call on the Senate to support this amendment and for the Labor government to act immediately to ensure that these changes occur. And I move the amendment. Thank you. Chair. Uh, Senator Scar, and noting that we'll hit a hard marker, so you may need to continue your remarks. Julie noted, uh, Acting Deputy President. And uh, can I just say before I start uh, my remarks in earnest, if uh, I can uh, note the point which I thought was very well made by Senator uh, Steele John that um, the uh, Australians shouldn't have to resort to the media in order to get issues around what medications are listed or not listed on the PBS uh, traction with government decision makers. Australians in our country shouldn't have to resort to the media in, in order to get these matters addressed. And uh, I think that was a, a point that was, uh, that was very well made. 
This, this bill essentially addresses a loophole in relation to the application of penalties and uh, remedial action taken in the case where a pharmacy uh, has engaged in action uh, which has been inappropriate and in breach of the PBS scheme. And the issue in particular it addresses is that you can have a situation where a pharmacy maybe has a, a licence and a corporate name, but then it has directors. And there could be a situation where a suspension action is taken against a director, but the pharmacy under the corporate licence is still operating, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the director has been subject to some sort of penalty. So this bill essentially addresses that loophole which could uh, allow uh, a pharmacy using the corporate bar to continue operating notwithstanding the fact notwithstanding the fact that a, a director has done the wrong thing now in the first instance we should note that the vast vast majority of our pharmacists do the right thing uh, and this is an amendment which is seeking to address um, a small loophole but it does give the opportunity uh, for issues to be raised more generally in relation to the PBS, as Senator Steele John has done uh, and others have done, including Senator Dunningham. And I would like to take this opportunity to make a number of points. The first point is that the PBS and the provision of medications uh, at cost effectively to the Australian people is a core function of government. Now, uh, we should reflect on that because in this place, especially since the election, there's all sorts of legislation coming through where the government is looking to spend billions and billions of dollars of taxpayers' money on multifarious sorts of projects. And for every dollar, every single dollar that is spent on those projects, however well-intentioned, whether it be the National Reconstruction Fund, whatever, it else, whatever else it is, for every dollar that is spent on those projects, it is a dollar that can't go into our PBS system. There's an opportunity cost. There's an opportunity cost. And I say, I say it is core function of government to provide medications, make medications free on a cost-effective basis, affordable basis, to all Australians, and especially to Australians who are suffering from diseases and conditions which require medications which are life-saving. That is core business. So whenever the government comes into this place, and the, one of the next bills on the legislation list is the so-called National Reconstruction Fund, where the government is looking to invest $15 billion of taxpayers' money into various areas of economic activity, every time the government comes in with one of those spending measures, we should reflect that that is a dollar that cannot be spent on core functions such as our health system. There is an opportunity cost. There is no magic pudding. There are no money trees around Canberra. It's all taxpayer dollars. And if they haven't got any tax revenue, they've got to borrow it and pay the interest on it. So we should all reflect on that fact. Second point I want to make is I think uh, the previous government, and I say this from opposition, should be proud, can be duly proud of the activity, the number of drugs which were added to the PBS system under that government. 3,000 drugs under the previous government were added to the PBS list. 3,000 drugs. Thousands of Australians had their lives positively changed because of the drugs that were added to the PBS system, medications added to the PBS system under the previous coalition government. Thousands of Australians had their lives changed for the better because of that. And how did we do that? Through, through economic management, sound economic management. More than 30 drugs a month more than 30 drugs a month added to the PBS system under the previous government. Change people's lives. Change people's lives for the better. And that's what sound economic management does. That's what a government that is focused on the core functions of government can achieve. That's what a government focused on the core functions of government can achieve. In this context, in this context I'm obliged to raise an example of a situation which has happened under the existing government in relation to uh, an insulation drug called insulin drug, I should say, called Viasp. Now, I received a communication in my office before this last set sitting from uh, a resident uh, in the western suburbs of Brisbane in relation to the fact that this drug, Viasp, insulin, was taken off the PBS 
without any warning. So this is a drug that was on the PBS. It was on the PBS, and people were using this drug. Fifteen thousand Australians were using this drug in order to treat their diabetes condition, and then it was taken off the PBS without any warning. Without any warning. None. No warning. No consultation whatsoever. And this uh, a resident wrote to me and said this. I'm a type 1 insulin dependent diabetic and have been for over 52 years now. This could be your mother, could be your sister. This morning at 8.42am I received a phone call from my chemist informing me that as of 1 April 2023 my insulin that I use in my pump will be withdrawn from the PBS listing. This being the case, then, my insulin purchase on script will go from $30 per filling of five boxes to approximately $220 for the same—$30 to $220. This lady could be your mother, could be your sister, could be your wife, gets a call from the chemist. The cost of your medication to manage your condition, which you've been advised you should be on because of its particular characteristics, Fast acting. Senator Cadell, it being one thirty. Senator Scarra. Oh, sorry. I, I, I take it as a compliment, though, Madam um, Acting Deputy President. My good friend Senator Scar, it being one thirty, we need to move to a two-minute statement. Senator Cadell. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. My nine uh, short months in this place, I have risen trying to keep it very apolitical and never overstep the political boundaries. But I feel today, with two days to go until the state election, I may be about to be he severely heckled. Two days to go until the New South Wales state election in my beautiful home state, and so many of my friends are out there seeking re-election or election. And I thought I would raise where we go. The New South Wales Nats across the regions are facing many, many different opponents. We are facing the so-called shooters, fishers, and farmers, uh, which I regard as the uh, co-branded new country Labor. We are facing independents. We are facing all sorts of people. A couple of Liberals in a seat, I must say that. And even in one or two country seats, Labor candidates are standing. They must have got lost. But I, I noticed they haven't gone too far because the electric bus can't even get to outer metropolitan Sydney and back on that campaign. But I would like to say good luck to my good friend David Lazell in Upper Hunter, my good friend Nicole Overall in Queanbeyan in one of those seats facing Labor, and also my friend Scott Barrett in the in the trigger seat in the upper house, the Honourable Scott Barrett there. This is an election where they know a storm's coming. We are seeing the interest rate rises. We are seeing 1,700 extra a month in mortgages. We are seeing energy rates go up. We are seeing cost of living go up. A storm is coming and it is on the horizon. One thing the people of New South Wales, one thing the people of country New South Wales can't afford is more surprises. And so I urge you to get out there and support your New South Wales Nationals candidates to avoid the surprises we saw in Canberra of the interest rate rises, of the energy rises, of all these things that will make life harder for you. Stay the course, back the horse you know, support your local mats, and you will have a much better ride through what is to come all through this country over the next few years. Thank you. Senator White. Acting Deputy President, outside this parliament a rally is taking place that claims to be fighting for women's rights. A similar rally occurred in Melbourne last week. Let us be clear, what is happening out there today and what happened in Melbourne is not about that. It's not about women's rights. It is about using women's rights as a cover to further an agenda of discrimination and vilification of transgender Australians and other minor minority groups. And in light of that, I have two simple me messages to convey today. The first is to those people who have gathered outside this parliament to spread division and to attack the trans community in Australia. That message is this. You do not speak for me. You do not speak for the government, and, you, and I hope you do not speak for this parliament. For those opposite me in this Senate, today presents an opportunity for us to come together and stand against this hate. Daniel Andrews has made a strong statement as Premier of Victoria. John Prosciutto has made a strong statement as Victorian Liberal Opposition Leader. The question now is for senators in this place and the Federal Liberal National Coalition to join us in condemning this vilification of trans Australians. That includes Senators Canavan, Chandler, Antic and Price. The words politicians use have an impact on the lives of Australians, particularly vulnerable ones. We would do well to remember that. 
it shouldn't have, uh, have to be said, but this is, simply, there is, this is simply no place for hate. My second message is to, to the trans community in Australia, especially young trans people. My message is that I know that the hate is painful. I know that often discrimination and stigma seem to follow you down the street when you're just trying to live your life. I know that the suicide rate for young trans Australians is the highest out of any group, but I also know that you are loved and you are supported by me, by our government and by most people in this chamber. Chamber. You must not forget that you are valid and you are worthy. And even though this week has been hard, your rights are not negotiable. Senator Orman Payne. Pity Chair. The International Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report is another shocking reminder that the writing isn't just on the wall for climate change. It's already in the embers and the mud of the communities that are burning and flooding around the world. But just as we stand at the precipice of disaster, we still have a choice over whether we fall over that edge. This week, the IPCC has again warned us that there is a narrowing pathway through which we can preserve life as we know it on Earth. This pathway does not include 116 new coal, oil and gas projects and $11 billion a year in public money subsidising the fossil fuel sector. As the IPCC and the world scientists have made clear, if we're going to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of the climate crisis, action must start with no new coal and gas. I know that my community of Gladstone in central Queensland is one of the regions that was built off the back of the fossil fuel boom, and the workers who were a part of that deserve our thanks. If done right, our region also stands to gain from the transition to renewable energy and associated industries. That's why the Greens are calling for the creation of a National Energy Transition Authority, so that workers and the communities around them can capitalise on the opportunities presented by the renewable energy transition. We have a real opportunity to make sure that Gladstone and other regions like it can genuinely become an economic powerhouse while avoiding the catastrophic effects of climate change. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It gives me great joy to rise in this place to recognise the contribution, the outstanding contribution made by a wonderful Queensland citizen, Mr Surendra Prasad, OAM. And can I just say, uh, to Surendra, who celebrated his 80th birthday just last week. What an honour it was for me to be able to attend his 80th birthday celebration. Surendra has done so much for our state of Queensland and for our country. He's been a leader of our Indian, wonderful Indian diaspora in my home state of Queensland, including being president of the Federation of Indian Communities of Queensland. And in this capacity, he was actually a driving force behind bringing what's referred to as the Diwali Festival into the central business district of Brisbane and sharing that wonderful festival, the victory of light over darkness, with all of the Queensland community. In addition to that, he was the visionary behind the establishment of a memorial to Australians of Indian, history, of Indian ethnicity who died in service of Australia in our armed forces. And he made that memorial happen, I'm pleased to say, with the support of the previous government. So I congratulate him for that wonderful achievement. And in addition to all of that, in addition to that, he, he was also the founder and president of the Fiji Senior Citizens Association, which has done wonderful work in terms of helping all members of the Australian community and our Pacific family in times of need, whether it be at times of bushfires, floods, or cyclones. There is no better example, there is no better personification of our Australian values, the values to which we all aspire to, to meet, than my good friend, my brother, Surendra Prasad, OAM. Senator Green. Thank you. Um, it has been a difficult week for members of the LGBTIQ community in this country, and it has been difficult as a queer person in this parliament to watch anti-trans speakers with neo-Nazi links be supported by members of the Liberal Party in Victoria, but also here in Canberra. It's been difficult to hear a national debate this week, but we know that this has been building for many months. 
because the Liberal Party of Australia and their leadership, Mr Peter Dutton and, yes, Senator Simon Birmingham, are desperate for you to believe that it works like this, that somehow you have transphobes over here who are um, accusing gay people of grooming children, that in the middle you have neo-Nazis who are using violent extremism to um, attack vulnerable people, that over here we've got people who support the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and that all these ideas are separate. But can I tell the Liberal National Party of this country that the Venn diagram of these issues and these people is a circle, and you are in the middle of it, because you are supporting people like Senator Antic and Senator Rennick and Senator Claire Chandler and people who are trying to get Moira Deeming to be back in the party. Spewing this division and hate is not the way forward for our country. And if the Liberal Party of Australia won't stand up against these foul attacks on vulnerable Australians, then we will. The queer community and the politicians that stand with them have a direct message for these people. Our lives, our bodies, our families are not for you to weaponise for your political purposes, and it has to stop. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I rise today to speak on the recent reporting of the arrest of an Australian soldier for alleged crimes in Afghanistan. I am not rising to speak on the conduct of the soldier or any other of the allegations. I am rising to express my disappointment that this young man's name and photograph have been splashed around in newspapers and online news articles. I am worried that this very public process is denying this young man procedural fairness and natural justice. Too frequently we see the reputations of current and former soldiers dragged through the public domain with little to no regard for their welfare, let alone those of their families. The media and relevant authorities should factor in, th in the threat this poses to the immediate family members. What if extremists here decided to target family members of the accused? If you join the SAS, you are told your identity will be shielded from public for life. If these young men have a case to answer, I have no doubt they will. But that is for the courts to decide, not for the media pack. I want to appeal directly to the Australian media and ask them to show some restraint when they are reporting this story and if there are any further ones to come. Surely, surely the, rem the memory of the collapse of the Brittany Higgins trial can't be far from your minds. Wake up! Then in February this year, in the kidnapping case of four-year-old Cleo Smith, Channel 9 came very close to being in contempt of court after airing material that could have prejudiced the judge's consideration. According to legal experts, there only needs to be evidence, a story, a newspaper article or social media post for you media personnel out there don't know this could affect the thinking of jurors in their deliberations. Actual proof that it did, in fact, influence jurors is not required. Contempt of court laws are designed to, to ensure that everyone gets a fair trial. There have been calls from the legal profession for a review on the contempt of court laws now for 30 years. Let's get it done. Senator Henderson. As the Shadow Minister for Education, I welcome the release of the Teacher Education Expert Panel Discussion Paper. It is an important part of a wider discussion on how we address the alarming decline in student outcomes despite record funding for the education system. The Teacher Education Expert Panel was established to provide advice on key issues raised at the Teacher Workforce Shortage Roundtable last August and an earlier report on the Quality Initial Teacher Education Review released under the Coalition early in 2022. The panel will provide advice on four reform areas, strengthen initial teach training education programs to deliver confident, effective classroom-ready graduates, strengthen the link between performance and funding of ITE programs, improve the quality of practical experience in teaching and improve postgraduate programs to attract mid-career entrants. It is absolutely critical that Australian students are taught by the very best. One month ago uh, today, in my first speech as the Shadow Minister addressing Universities Australia, I highlighted the decline in enrolments for teaching courses, as well as the fact that only 50 per cent of students who commence initial teacher education complete their degrees. 
for those who do enter the classroom, around 50 per cent leave within the first five years. This is not good enough. We need to do everything we can to encourage mid-career entrants into the teaching profession. That's why a one-year DepEd rather than a two-year master's, which means two years of lost income, is the best way to get more teachers into the classrooms more quickly. These people have the life experience the, and they're motivated and passionate. It's disappointing this di discussion paper um, in, and the panel did not see a case for returning to a one-year DepEd, which arguably puts the interests of universities ahead of prospective teachers. We need to get on with making this change so that we can get more teachers into the classrooms. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. 56 people have died in truck crashes this year, including 15 truck drivers. Every one of those people was someone's mother, father, son or daughter. There is no job where you are more likely to be killed or seriously hurt than truck driving. And, Amazon aside, nowhere is this more evident than at Aldi. Aldi is the only one of the three big supermarkets which refuses to commit to ensuring that drivers are paid a safe and sustainable rate. Aldi is the only major supermarket which stands by outdated and disgraced business practices where they are happy to work their truck drivers into the grave if it makes them an extra buck. Drivers have told the Transport Workers Union that when they have complained about being forced to drive longer hours than allowed under fatigue laws, which is illegal, their managers have responded, and I quote, maybe you need to go faster and it's your job to manage your fatigue. Well, we've seen what happens with Aldi's approach to safety. An Aldi driver who crossed the medium strip on the Hume Highway had a head-on collision with another truck with so much force that the driver was thrown out of the cabin. Aldi is the only major supermarket that went to the federal court to try and silence its truck drivers and their union representatives from criticising these practices. And on top of that, Aldi lost the case resoundingly. Aldi should join the rest of us in the civilised community they should end their barbaric war on its drivers and the travelling public. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy. Protest is the language of the marginalised and those ignored by the political establishment. Protest is a tactic used by those who can't buy a political party and, and the decisions that they want, by those who don't control the media. Rio Tinto doesn't need to protest, but traditional owners of lands that are slated for destruction by their open-cut minds so often do. Rupert Murdoch doesn't need to march in the streets, but those demanding climate action from backward governments do and are. When climate protesters take to the street, they engage in peaceful marches and blockades. It's often because they, have, they feel they have no other choice. The science is in, the world's in desperate peril. To have a safe future for themselves, for the people and the planet, they are on the streets taking the urgent action. And all too frequently, they're met with violence and arrest from police forces. When Violet Coco blocked traffic on the Sydney Harbour Bridge for about half an hour, in, an, in aid of the future and of the planet that we all share, she was met with police who fabricated evidence in court in an attempt to get her a harsher sentence. But when Ryan Gosling and Hollywood did it, it wasn't even a peep. Climate protests, protesters are often violently arrested, charged and refused bail. And if they're released, they have onerous bail conditions that mean there's whole parts of our cities, whole parts of our states that they can't even, they can't even visit. No such conditions are imposed on violent right-wing extremists following what they may call protest, but what is too often direct violence and threats from marginalised communities. It's not a protest to have hundreds of men threaten and assault a small handful of activists and allies from Community Action for Rainbow Rights. It sounds utterly terrifying. And my thoughts are with those brave people who are standing up with young trans people and against hate and division. I stand with my party, the Greens, with all of those in the trans community here and around Australia and their supporters. We have your back. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, often Canberra is used as a synonym for the politicians who gather here. Uh, it is so much more than that. This great city is full of smart, forward-thinking people working to make Canberra a world-leading innovation hub. We should be doing everything we can to support them. 
and I'm not talking about handouts. I'm talking about the government being open to competitive local businesses through a proper procurement process. 2.5 million businesses are registered and trading in Australia, yet only 12,000 of those businesses receive government contracts. That's less than 0.5 per cent. And part of the reason for this is that foreign companies are being preferred over Australian competitors in government procurement. Not because the foreign company is cheaper or able to offer, or able to offer a better service, but because often they are simply familiar to government departments. We are missing opportunities to create new, thriving local industries. I've heard stories of contracts being awarded to foreign companies to start developing capabilities that we already have been developed uh, here by local companies. Canberra-based businesses are sometimes not even given the opportunity to bid for contracts. And this has to change. This can change. The owners of these businesses aren't asking for special treatment. They just want an equitable environment in which they can bid for government contracts. And it's on us in this place to give that to Australian businesses. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Tonight, 9,729 West Australians will experience homelessness, and one in four of them will be sleeping rough. Despite all of the rhetoric and all of the stifling hubris from the McGowan government, the number of people sleeping rough in Western Australia has increased by 114 per cent since they came to government. At 25 per cent of people sleeping rough, this is by far the highest in the nation, with second is Queensland at 9 per cent. These devastating numbers demonstrate that the McGowan government's inability to deliver important social programs for Western Australia. The facts are this, that today over 20,000 households or 34,000 West Australians are on the public housing waiting list. This is an increase of over 10,000 people in just over two years. Under the McGowan government, the waiting list has more than doubled, with many people now waiting up to five years and the average being over two years. At the same time, the number of social housing properties has actually reduced under the McGowan government by 1,155 houses. I can't even imagine how they can actually have the number reduce. And shamefully today, more than 1,900 of the remaining stock is sitting empty. And after three years, the McGowan government, three years ago, the McGowan government secured the East Perth site to build multi-storey accommodation for the homeless in the city. It remains unbuilt. Further adding to the pressure, median rental prices in Perth have soared from just over $400 to nearly $600, and the rental vacancies are now at an historic low. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. They've got plenty. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one amazing Queensland community, I'm a representative for all Australians, including those with an XY chromosome and those with an XX chromosome. A servant of men and women and those adults who choose to live as something other than their chromosome provides. Today, this Parliament House saw an exercise in democracy of which I'm very proud. The Let Women Speak rally on the lawn outside was conducted with a restraint that was sadly lacking in Belmore. I applaud the commitment to decent behaviour from those who attended to protest in favour of women's rights and those who attended to redefine women's rights. And I thank the AFP for their, fed, their calm presence. As senators, we have an obligation to pour oil on troubled waters, not kerosene on a fire. Yesterday, Senator McKim described our fellow Australians who choose to protest in favour of women's rights as, quote, trans-exclusionary right-wing dropkicks, turds. It is not a defence for the senator that this actually spells T-E-R-W-D. Just because he can does not mean we should speak, should address constituents in such terms. I remember the 70s when feminist protests, when women marched behind banners that read, if you see my gender, you do not see me. Gay rights campaigners, back when there was something to campaign for, marched behind banners that read, if you see my sexuality, you don't see me. In 2023, one group within our community has transformed that slogan read, you will see my gender or else 
This is not progress. This is division wrapped in a multicoloured bow. In the years ahead, for our, our society will be greeted with many challenges, social, economic and defence. We must face these challenges together, accepting our differences. The one thing the forces trying to reshape Australia fear the most is our unity. Australians facing our challenges united behind one flag as one community, as one nation. Let women speak. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to remember my friend, union sister and passionate activist, Michelle Hogan, who we sadly lost on March the 8th. As I speak, the union and women's movements across South Australia are gathering at the Waterside Workers' Hall in Port Adelaide to farewell and celebrate Michelle's life. I send my deepest sympathy to Rob, her partner and to her family and to her wide circle of friends. Michelle made the world a better place. We worked alongside each other and many others at the South Australian Labor Council in the early 1990s. Michelle led the Anna Stewart Project, supporting women unionists. Later, she became Assistant Secretary at the Labor Council and led it through many challenges. For 40 years, Michelle was a passionate activist in education, community services, local government and health. She was into celebration, never missing an International Women's Day or May Day. She contributed contributed consistently to a feeder union aid abroad, and she chaired the Port Adelaide National Trust. Most recently, she was chair of South Australia's Working Women's Centre, where she made such a difference and is so, today so deeply missed. Michelle was a builder, a thinker and a strategist. She was generous, kind, far-sighted and principled. She was, at the same time, a very funny woman. With her dry humour, she regularly pierced pomposity and paternalism, but I never saw her make a personal attack. She was not interested in climbing the slippery pole. She was ambitious for others. She was also, to so many of us, a friend of the best sort, listening deeply. She remembered what you were up to. She made you laugh. She had a beautiful, delicate rose tattoo on her always elegant shoulder, and truly, she fought for bread, but she fought for roses too. Her smiling face, her fabulous humour, her sharp mind and deep commitment to make the world a better place are deeply mourned, and we're grateful for her life and the beauty she brought to the world. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I spoke earlier this week on the disgraceful scenes we saw outside Victorian Parliament on the weekend. And now, today, outside this Parliament, there was, can I say, an extremely small rally against trans people in our community, a rally designed to spread hate. Shamefully, it was attended by some members of this place. So let me be clear, there is absolutely no place for anti-trans hatred on our streets. There is no place for it in the halls or on the lawns of this parliament. There is no place for it in our Australian community. And my message to trans and gender diverse people today is this. We hear you in this place, we see you and we stand with you. This is an opportunity for everyone in this place to stand together with the trans community. It is 2023, people. It's 2023. And it is absolutely extraordinary that the LGBTQIA community is still facing attacks today. After everything that they've fought for, after everything that they have stood up for, after everything that they've had to go through just to live with pride in our community, we will not stand for it on this side of the chamber. The government stands with the trans community. We will not accept one backward step on LGBTQIA rights on our watch. We will not accept one backward step on trans rights on our watch. And this is an opportunity for the coalition to stand with us on this. It's an, op it's an opportunity for Mr Dutton to stand with us on this. And he has still not stood with the trans community. He has not shown his support for a community who, let's not mince words here, are under complete attack. And I call on him to do that today. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, last week I had the pleasure of visiting the Vedanta Centre of Melbourne in, uh, in East uh, Ringwood in the electorate of Deakin. They were recipients of a $100,000 grant through the Community Development Grant Program, which was used for an important uh, renovations that enabled them to support more members of their community. The Vedanta Centre of Melbourne plays an essential role in bringing people together. 
uh, to practice their, their religion and other practices in the community. Uh, the Australian Government is committed to ensuring that all Australians are supported in their personal, spiritual and ethical development, and that means ensuring organisations like the Vedanta Centre have their facilities required for their growing membership. Everyone who comes to our great country should feel welcome and able to practice their faith, regardless of their background. And I was particularly pleased to hear how much of the, the work that the, the monks from the centre engage in their interfaith dialogues and meetings. This is an important way to demonstrate to the broader community uh, in, in Ringwood and, and that of the deacon electorate uh, and how they can all live in peace and harmony while still practising the different faiths that exist. The Vedanta Centre in Melbourne is a fantastic example of the positive role that faith organisations play in Australia by creating a sense of community and promoting service to others. This was particularly important throughout the COVID pandemic when we were forced to isolate from friends and loved ones. And it was inspiring to hear about the work by the monks at the centre to connect with people online and deliver food and other essentials to those in need. It was a pleasure to meet so many wonderful members of the Vedanta community, and I thank them again for having me at their centre. It being 2pm, we'll move to question time. I'll call Senator Hughes. You, the question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday in question time, you stated what is it that the Prime Minister Albanese hasn't done to help the Australian people? Minister, can you confirm that the Prime Minister has not decreased power prices for Australian families by $275, despite promising 97 times before the election that he would do so? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Farrell. Across everything, this bloke. Senators, I've just called the minister to his feet. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Hughes for uh, her, uh, her question and uh, the opportunity to talk again about um, what a terrific job our Prime Minister is doing um, when he's um, not uh, progressing the issue of. Uh, uh, recognition of uh, an Indigenous in voice to, uh, to this parliament. Of course, he's dealing with all of the issues which, regrettably, um, the former uh, government, your government, a government that you were part of, uh, uh, Senator Hughes, simply failed um, to do. Um, and so, um, bit by bit, we're trying to um, <coughs> restore the Australian economy deal with all of those serious cost of living pressures that every single family is facing right at the moment because of your neglect of things like an energy policy, things like dealing with the issue of, uh, of climate change. Um, each day the Prime Minister wakes up and thinks, how can I help Australian families to reduce, reduce and push down Push down, push down, push down, push down, push down, push down, push down the cost of living for hard-working Australian, uh, Australian families. Um, that's what this Prime Minister is focused on. Not picking up, not picking up sort of other, um, other uh, ministries from uh, other members of uh, his, uh, his cabinet, uh, but dealing with the serious issues that are facing Australian people as a result of those nine or ten years of neglect under your former, uh, former government? Uh, Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Oh. Uh, Minister, you said yesterday the Prime Minister has done so much to reduce the cost of living. Can you please name a single cost to Australian families that is lower now than when the Albanese government was elected? Uh, Minister Farrell. What's gone down, Don? So, What's gone down? thank you. Uh, thank you uh, order, 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 Minister Farrell. Um, Minister, please continue. Thank you, President, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Hughes for her uh, supplementary uh, uh, supplementary questions. Um, well, um, what did we do when we first came to? Um, 
to, uh, uh, to government. Um, we supported um, uh, a, uh, um, a rise uh, in the minimum wage for ordinary Australian workers. What was, what was your policy at the time? Your policy as... Um, Minister Farrell, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes. Point of order, uh, Madam President, relevance and in a bid to ensure we don't get another 30 seconds of ums and ahs. The question was very specific as to naming a single cost for Australian families that has come down. A single cost. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator, and I appreciate Senator you Hughes. redirecting the Minister Thank to the you, question. Senator Hughes. Um, the Minister did start off with a bit of a preamble, but uh, as you got to your feet, he had started to name some costs. You mightn't agree with them, but he was being relevant to your, que to your question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, Thank you President. And, uh, of course, Senator Hughes wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say, but let's go through some of the things that uh, have been the subject of downward pressure as a result of uh, the work done by the Prime Minister and the rest, and the rest of these wonderful people. Uh, so we've cut the price of the PBS medicines Order. from forty-two point uh, fifty down to thirty dollars. No, you don't like me talking about you don't like Minister me talking Farrell. about the things that have gone down because Minister we've been Farrell. doing some. The time for answering has um, expired, and senators, I was trying to draw uh, the minister to sit down, but there was so much noise in this chamber, he was unable to hear me. He is answering questions asked by opposition senators, and uh, I'm certainly entitled to hear the answer, as are other senators. Um, Senator Hughes, second supplementary. President, does the Prime Minister follow your rule, Minister, and not closely follow power prices or grocery prices? Is this why the Prime Minister Albanese thinks Australians have a pretty good 10 months despite their electricity bills, grocery bills, mortgage repayments and rent all going up? Does this show how, to, how out of touch your government is? Uh, thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Farrell. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hughes for her uh, second, uh, second, uh, um, uh, second uh, question. <clears throat> um, uh, look, I have to say I was a bit disappointed in the way in which um, the uh, <coughs> leader, in particular, uh, put up uh, items on his uh, his uh, Facebook uh, page uh, yesterday, about, um, seeking to seeking to se seeking to seeking to uh, misrepresent. Uh, my uh, views by cutting. Uh, uh, Minister cut Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator uh, Hughes. Point of, point of order relevance here. This is a very serious question affecting everyday Australians and their rising prices that they're facing everywhere. Uh, uh, and I would you, appreciate Senator the Hughes. Minister being relevant thank to the question. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Um, I'm glad that you order, Senator Watt. I'm glad you pointed out it's a serious question. I would hope all questions are serious, and I would ask senators to remain silent so that we can all hear the answers. I will direct um, the minister to your question. Minister. Thank you, uh, um, President. And as I was saying, um, my staff recommended that I perhaps request that this uh, Facebook page be uh, taken down because it is in fact in breach of the rules. But when we discovered that only, there were only 71 likes to this particular <laughs> Facebook page, um, we decided not to. Uh, minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order. Order, um, Senator Hughes. Madam President, this question was not with regards to Senator Farrell or Senator Birmingham's uh, social you. media. Senator Hughes, uh, I you would will... ask that the minister, in his last eight seconds, address mm -hmm. at least part of the question. Senator Hughes, um, when raising a point of order, please come directly to the point. You will note your last point of order. I directed the minister to your question, and I'll direct him again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, uh, um, President. Um, look, there. There is no person in this country who is more concerned about cost of living. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Farrell. Order. Order. Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please tell us how the government is? assisting Australian households to deal with cost of living pressures. 
Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Um, and I thank Senator Payman for her question. And I can um, provide an update to the uh, chamber on how the government is working hard and is focused on how we can make life easier for each and every Australian. We are certainly aware of uh, Australians who are facing tough times with some of the increases in the cost of living. And um, these, of course, some of them in relation to power have been caused by the ongoing war in Ukraine, which has driven up gas prices. There's continued disruption on our supply chains following years of chaos and uh, impacted, of course, by the pandemic, and that there are the successive interest rate rises that we've seen as the Reserve Bank, uh, which started on its tightening um, uh, arrangements uh, before the last election. But there are other factors that we can address where we are where we, and where we can we are. One of the very first acts of the Albanese government was to successfully argue for a minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which helped around 2.7 million Australians and was a real change in approach uh, between us and the former government on wages. Our first budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation. Uh, that's one of the most important things in terms of our investments. So they were things like cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicines, more affordable housing, and getting wages moving again. In addition, as, we, as winter approaches, we're providing and will provide through the budget energy relief to millions of households, uh, payments that those opposite opposed. Uh, these households will pay up to a third less than the re retail price when their energy bills come in. And again, it beggars belief that those opposite decided to oppose um, the laws that put in place those arrangements. And uh, of course, and I'll go to this more in the next uh, questions, uh, our investments Thank in you, early Minister. education the time and care. For answering has expired. Senator Payman, first supplementary. In 100. Order. Order. I have a senator on her feet, Senator Payman. In 100 days, cheaper childcare will be a reality for millions of Australian families. How will the government's investment in early childhood education and care assist with cost of living pressures, Minister? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Payman, for being on the same page uh, in relation to early education and care. In 100 days, cheaper uh, early childhood education and care will provide cost of living relief for around 1.2 million Australian families. The milestone comes as new data from the Department of Education reveals that childcare costs had soared by 49 per cent under the previous government. From July, the Albanese government is taking action to deliver that real cost of living relief. And we know for uh, parents of, who have um, children under the age of five just what a hit uh, those childcare costs are to the uh, weekly household budget. For the average family on about $120,000 a year with a child in care three days a week, the changes will cut costs by about $1,700 a year. The childcare subsidy rates will lift to 90 per cent for families on a combined income of $80,000 or less, and the highest subsidies uh, of up to 95 per cent for families with second Thank and subsequent Minister. children Senator will be Payman, retained. Second supplementary. Can the minister confirm, in the lead up to the budget, any further support from the government to combat the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Payman for her supplementary. We are taking action, and as this chamber knows, because we debated them in December last year. Uh, we want to take the sting out of how higher power prices through direct energy bill relief through the next budget direct support for households and businesses that, let us not forget, those opposite tried to block. There are encouraging signs that our plan on energy uh, prices are beginning to work, with big drops in the prices on the electricity futures market. We're also focused on growing the economy in the right way so more Australians can get the benefit from good skills, get good jobs and, enjoy, and earn good wages. That's why we successfully argued for the Fair Work Commission minimum wage increase in line with our inflation. So uh, we've got legislation around cleaner and cheaper energy. We've brought in a new pensioner work bonus. We're, we're working on the new housing accord and we've got important legislation before this chamber that will assist with cost of living pressures on Australian households. Thank you, Minister. Your time Ooh. has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. According to government analysis, by how much 
have rental rates gone up since the election of the Albanese Labor government? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Van for the um, uh, for the uh, the question. Uh, <clears throat> look, I don't, I don't I don't think we want to start this, uh, or certainly I don't want to start this process of uh, trying to score sort of political points on on cheap, 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 cheap political, <clears throat> cheap political uh, point scoring. Um, I I. Um. Uh, Minister Farrell, uh, Senator Birmingham. President, uh, I think the minister is impugning motives from Senator Van in what was otherwise a question entirely seeking a point of fact. Now, Murray is bringing the, uh, the, some, some talking points toward the table for poor Don. But I think you should bring him to order in terms you, of impugning motives on the senator who purely senator asked Birmingham, a factual please question. Please resume your seat. I Order! 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 Um, I don't believe there was an imputation against the actual senator, um, so I'm going to call the minister and remind him of the question and the need for an answer. Um, senator Van. Uh, point of order on relevance. The uh, minister has gone nowhere near the question. Uh, senator Van. Other than Senator Van, if you were listening, you would have heard me draw the minister back to the question. Minister Farrell. You're going more regularly. Thank you, no. thank you, uh, thank you, President. And um, what, what I, rather than sort of answering cheap political um, uh, questions, uh, what I'd like to talk about is what, what I'd Senator like Crash. to do is talk about what this government is actually doing in practical terms. Uh, to put uh, downward pressure on uh, on the rental stress that so many so many Australians are now suffering, um, and uh, obviously obviously one of the things one of the things that we can do is try and boost uh, the supply of uh, homes to rent, uh, and uh, substantial and significant investment in new social and affordable housing. It's, it's, it's these things, uh, Senator Van, which will result in practical downward pressure on the rental stress that Australians that are, that are on the uh, Australian people right Minister at the Farrell, moment. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, <coughs> Senator Birmingham. Order on the question of direct relevance. This was quite a precise question. I accept the minister is being generally relevant to the question of rental markets and rental affordability, but there was a precise question there about how much rental rates have gone up. If the minister doesn't know, he can take it on notice and provide thank context, you. but simply talking around the margins of it is not directly relevant. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Birmingham. I um, am not privy to what government analysis uh, Senator Van is directing us towards, but I will remind uh, Senator Birmingham, please. I, Senator Birmingham, I have taken your point of order in good faith. I am simply explaining to you I am not aware how broad or how narrow the government analysis is, but I will direct the minister to the second part of the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And a little bit of respect uh, from the leader for the chair uh, would be um, uh, would be appreciated. Yes, seriously. Yes, yes, yes. Seriously, a little bit of respect for the president. This, a little bit of respect. Now we know we know a whole lot of people across Australia. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Van. And again, direct relevance. I mean, the minister cannot just. Waffle on, um, on down a Senator different path. Senator Van, your leader was on his feet with the exact same question. I have directed the minister to the question. Chair, no, he hasn't I've, listened. No, it's not. You've you've raised a point of order. I've responded to that. Your leader raised exactly the same point of order. I've directed the minister to the question, um, and it's not for you to debate it with me, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And if your side stopped inter uh, interjecting, then I could answer your question because we know a Thank lot you, of Minister people Farrell. across Australia are struggling. Minister Farrell, their time has expired. Senator Van. Um, uh, given the success with that one, um, 
Can the minister, or according to government analysis, how much more is an average standard variable mortgage rate holder paying per month on an average mortgage since the election of the Albanese <laughs> Labor government? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, um, President, and uh, thank uh, uh, Senator Van for his uh, supplementary question. Well, again, I'm not going to get into gotcha questions. Um, the government, the, this government, this government is trying to put downward pressure on uh, a whole lot of uh, items that um, are making life difficult for ordinary. Australian uh, Minister Farrell, Senator Van. President, again, direct relevance. The question was quite narrow in its phrasing, um, and if the minister doesn't know the answer, he can take it on notice and come back to the chamber. Um, thank you, Senator Van. The, the minister did respond to the question, but I'll draw him back to the question again. Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, and. Uh, we, we understand the pressures that Australian families are under. We've talked previously in your previous question about the issue of uh, rental affordability. Now you're talking about the issue of, uh, of mortgage rates. Um, we um, have been working solidly to put downward pressure um, on all of, these, uh, all of these items that are affecting ordinary working um, Australians. Now, Thank you, Minister. Um, the time for answering has expired. Um, second supplementary, Senator Van. Thank you, President. Given the Minister has demonstrated he is unaware of or unconcerned by the cost of living pressures faced by Australians, is he aware that Westpac Business Bank forecasts advertised rents will increase by 11.5 per cent in 2023? And Minister, is it correct that this will be the biggest annual increase on record? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Van for his uh, second supplementary question. I, I completely reject your proposition, uh, Senator Van. This is a government that's deeply concerned about cost of living issues facing ordinary 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 Australian people um, we've, we can, we, uh, we every day we every day we every day focus on how we can put downward pressure on the cost of living based on the financial mess that you uh, left us and we inherited when we came to government almost 12 months ago. Um, we, we're, we're facing, Australians are facing these issues because of the inaction and um, the neglect of the former government in respect of all of these issues. Uh, bit by bit, inch Thank by you, inch, Minister. day the by day, we're has taking. Expired. Uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, um, Senator Watt. Minister, across the country, state governments are proposing actions to limit gambling because of the harm it causes to children and the community. In reflecting this, the Greens in New South Wales are taking a policy to the election on Saturday of phasing out pokey machines from pubs and clubs, introducing a mandatory cashless gambling card and creating a pokey super tax and reparation fund for affected communities. But it's up to the federal government to ban gambling advertising, which is something that is supported by 70 per cent of Australians. Minister, will the government move to ban gambling advertising anywhere, anytime, in the same way as tobacco advertising was banned years ago? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. And thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, thank you for giving us an election manifesto from the New South Wales Greens. Um, the uh, I'm not sure, Senator Rice, where, whether you were here yesterday when I pretty much answered an identical question from Senator Pocock. Um, so I could refer you back to my answer yesterday, um, but I'm happy to go through it again today. Um, there is no doubt that the Albanese government recognises the importance of gambling promotions being presented in a responsible manner. Uh, and we know the Greens know a little bit about gambling because we know who their donors have been. 
Uh, we also recognise there is ongoing community concern about the harms associated with online gambling, including advertising material, and it is timely for the parliament to consider what more should be done to address this issue. And I, I, I hope that we can rely on the Greens' support, despite their large donations from gambling uh, in interests. Uh, this is why we have established an inquiry on, into online gambling and its impacts on those experiencing gambling harm. And as I mentioned yesterday, that inquiry is being conducted by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, which, as I mentioned yesterday, is being very capably chaired by uh, uh, Peter Murphy, uh, one of our fabulous Labor MPs. The committee is considering the effectiveness of current gambling advertising restrictions on limiting children's exposure to gambling products and services, including through social media, sponsorship or branding, among a range of other issues. Of course, the government will consider the committee's recommendations when it releases its final report. The current rules relating to the scheduling and content of advertisements on television are contained in the co-regulatory broadcasting codes of practice. Those codes are developed under the Broadcasting <laughs> Services Act 1992 by industry groups in consultation with the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Uh, there is some work to be done here. The Albanese government is on the job. There's a House committee on the job, and Thank we look you, forward Senator to seeing Watt. its recommendations. The time for has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So, in terms of a ban at this stage, it's a no. Um, Minister, it was a Labor government that refused tobacco donations and introduced changes to tobacco packets that protected people to reduce harm. Will you commit to refusing gambling donations and taking action to protect people from gambling harm? Minister Watt. Well, thank you, President. Again, I'm rather surprised that the Greens are choosing to use a question about whether we will ban the very kind of donations that the Greens have been receiving. So, so you're asking a Labor government to ban you from taking donations from the gambling industry? Um, Is that Minister what this Watt, is about? Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Wright. Yeah, look, point of order, President. Um, the minister is misleading the parliament. The Greens do not Senator take Rice, donations not. from Senator gambling Rice. companies. Senator Rice, that's a debating point. Minister Watt. Minister Watt, please continue. Um, there's a briefing here. Minister Watt, I've called three times. Sorry, President. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so surprised that, <laughs> that the Greens are asking us to stop them from taking donations that they have been taking for a number of years from the gambling industry. Uh, I mean, let me remind you, Senator Rice, in 2022, the Queensland Greens accepted almost $500,000 in donations from a high roll $500,000 oh, $500, from a high rolling gambler, despite pushing for a ban on political donations from the gambling industry. Uh, uh, in 2019-20, the Queensland Greens MP, Mr Berkman, had been critical of the LNP and Labor for accepting donations from gambling interests, uh, but the highest donation in an election year in Queensland in 2019 um, was Minister, indeed to the Greens from Mr Turner. Um, Senator Rice, it's time. It is time, yes. yes. I'll, I'll <laughs> it's take time to, to your... ref refuse Second donations from da gambling companies. <laughs> gambling companies. <laughs> Order. Yeah, the gambling industry, gambling countries. Minister, yeah, uh, it's the Senator industry. Rice. It's the insidious, harmful industry. Senator Minister Rice, just please uh, resume your seat because I can't hear you and the chamber needs to come to order. 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 I, I haven't heard the question and I don't think Senator Rice has finished the question, but um, would you start it again, please? <laughs> I haven't Order. started the question. I'm just correcting the record. Minister, it is clear that what is needed at a federal level is a national gambling regulator, including to tackle the harm caused by online gambling, which is national and international. Will the government introduce a national gambling regulator? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Well, as I say, the, the government, uh, the House of Representatives, is conducting an inquiry into these matters at the moment, and I, I do look forward to its recommendations on what we can do about what is a very serious issue. Um, but, but I'm interested to note that Senator Rice um, seems to be enunciating the Greens' position is that they don't support gambling donations from companies, but donations from individual high roller gambles are fine. So. Does that mean that every time we hear the Greens say that we should ban 
donations from coal and gas companies, that would be okay for the Greens to take donations from Clive Palmer, who owns coal companies, or Gina Reinhart. So, so no to their companies, but fine for their. Uh, I mean, Mr. Turpey, the high roller gambler, has been. The, the Greens don't like it when they're held to account, and Senator McKim is chief among them. You come in here and mouth off constantly about what other parties should do, but the very minute your own hypocrisy is exposed, all you want to do is shout people down. You are a uh, joke, you are you, a Senator hypocrite, White, and you're your finally being exposed. Expired. Order. Senator Watt, I do remind you to direct your marks to the chair. Um, Senator Green. <laughs> Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you, President. My question is to the Special Minister of State, Senator Farrell. On, on this historic day, can the Minister update the Senate about the progress to recognise First Nations Australians in the Constitution and to deliver an Indigenous voice to Parliament? Yeah. Minister Farrell. Uh, yes, um, I can, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Senator Green, and uh, thank you for the question and your great interest in this uh, topic. And I should start by congratulating everybody in this uh, uh, parliament or in the Senate uh, for the mature way in which the issue of the referendum uh, legislation was dealt with last, uh, uh, last night, and uh, congratulate yourselves on, uh, on uh, passing of that uh, legislation uh, without any opposition in this place. But it is another historic day today, um, uh, a significant day in the journey towards uh, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. And we've had the opportunity for Australia to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia in our constitution. Uh, this will be a simple but powerful act. The proposition that, that it is to be put to the uh, Australian people has been built from the ground up through the work of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Uh, this process uh, is the culmination of years of discussion, consultation and hard work by, Australian, uh, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. As the Prime Minister said in his gracious and, and uh, patient ask of Australia, I want to thank the Chamber for the goodwill uh, of course, demonstrated last night um, in, the, uh, in respect of the uh, referendum machinery bill. This will be the first referendum in almost a quarter of a century where a new generation of Australians will be able to have their say. The government believes this referendum will be a unifying uh, moment uh, for Australia, and I'm certainly keen for that to be the case. It's about taking this country forward for everyone. We look forward to working with the Australian community to ensure everyone can have their say in a respectful manner on this important opportunity to recognise our first Australians. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, ahead of the voice referendum, what is the government doing to implement Labor's long-standing commitment to improve voter enrolment and participation? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and again thank uh, um, Senator Green for uh, that question and her interest in, uh, in uh, voter uh, enrolment. <laughs> and since we took office, uh, we've wasted no time on this issue. Last year, I asked JSCAM to investigate increasing enfranchisement and electoral participation, and look forward to work working across the Parliament on meaningful reform following its report. Last year, the government allocated. $16.1 million to the Australian Electoral Commission over two years to increase First Nations enrolment and participation in future electoral events as part of the referendum preparatory work. More recently, I approved regulatory changes making it easier for more Australians eligible to enrol to actually get on the roll. From the 17th of February, eligible Australians have been able to use their Medicare car and their Australian citizenship certificate numbers to enrol and uh, or update their enrolment. Thank Early you, AEC the time for answering has expired. Senator Green, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, it is important that First Nations people have their say at this referendum. Can the minister update the Senate about the steps the government is taking to improve Indigenous enrolment, particularly? Thank you, Senator Green, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, and I can say, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Green. I can say that early uh, AEC data from around the country shows that between 11 and 14 per cent of new enrolment applications 
uh, using those new methods of uh, enrolment that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, one outstanding uh, initiative from the Gillard Labor government was the Federal Direct Enrolment Update Program, which uses information uh, from the government agencies to assist with updating uh, elector detail, elector details <clears throat> and including eligible voters on the roll. Following trials of the new direct enrolment activities, uh, which used new data sources, mailbag addresses and email notifications of new enrolments, the AEC advises that over 15,000 Indigenous Australians were added to the electoral roll. Following these successful trials, the AEC advises me that these activities uh, will be included as a permanent feature of our enrolment program. The estimated uh, Indigenous enrolment Thank you, rates. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Um, this question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell, and it has no preamble. How many homes will Tasmania get under the Housing Australia Future Fund in the first five years? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Senator uh, um, Tyrrell, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, your interest in this uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative of the uh, of the uh, federal uh, government to uh, try and uh, increase the uh, number of um, uh, number of uh, and access to uh, homes by uh, ordinary uh, ordinary uh, Australians. Um, um, we Order. Thank you, thank you, uh, President. Um, uh, we're, in, we're ensuring, uh, through um, a range of significant policy uh, initiatives, that uh, Australians have uh, greater access not only to home ownership but also to um, uh, greater rental, rental uh, affordability. Minister Farrell, um, um, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. Point of order, um, Chair. Um, relevance, I ask for a very specific question. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Senator Tyrrell. I'll remind the uh, Minister of your que question. Um, thank you, uh, President. And um, of course, um, uh, as uh, unfortunately, as data has uh, shown, that uh, in the period from uh, 2016 to 2021, there was uh, regrettably a substantial increase in uh, Tasmanians uh, experiencing uh, homelessness, and I think this is uh, really what your uh, question is uh, directed uh, to. Um, Tasmania has a strong community housing provider sector and has taken many opportunities provided by the uh, National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, of course, uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. I know I'm new, but I thought it was a very plain question. Thank you. I have directed the minister to your question, and I will direct him once again. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. So, just recently, um, Minister Rick Collins was in Launceston to uh, turn the sod on the site of 48 uh, affordable uh, new homes for Tasmanians in need, with the Community Housing Order. Provider Community Order. Housing uh, <coughs> Limited. The Albanese government has unlocked up to uh, $575 million in funding from the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to be able to invest in new social you, Minister, and affordable— Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. The government's commitment that Housing Australia Future Fund will make independent decisions is admirable. With that commitment in mind, though, who decided the fund would allocate 10,000 homes to frontline workers? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thanks, uh, Senator Tyrrell, for her uh, her question. Um, um, the issue that uh, you've just raised, of course, um, was an election promise that the uh, uh, Albanese government took to um, the last uh, the last election. Um, um, so, in terms of who. Uh, who decided that uh, issue? Well, of course, um, it's, it was the Australian people because um, the Australian people elected the uh, Albanese government uh, to, um, to be the government of this country. And of course, what we are doing now 
um, with, with our housing policies is implementing those decisions which we took to, um, uh, to the people at the last, uh, the last election. So, uh, in terms of uh, who decided this, well, ultimately um, it was. Minister Farrell, the time for answering Sorry. has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, on, on, on current projections, in the next five years, 1,100 Tasmanians will be homeless. Does your government agree that reducing homelessness by building 1,200 homes in Tasmania is a good thing? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, look, <clears throat> to be honest with you, uh, Senator uh, Tyrrell, I think you're just focusing on one small aspect of what the government is proposing to do. Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you about some of the things this government is doing by comparison to what the previous government uh, uh, did not do. Uh, Senator, um, Minister Farrell, we, uh, please resume your uh, seat. Minister Farrell, order on my left. Uh, Senator Watt, I've just called the chamber to order, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, Ten billion dollars investment to improve housing outcomes in Australia. Uh, Twenty thousand social uh, homes, including four thousand homes for women and children impacted by domestic violence and older women at risk of uh, homelessness. Uh, Ten thousand affordable homes for frontline workers. Uh, $30 million for housing and services for, 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 for veterans. $200 million to repair, maintain and improve housing in remote uh, Indigenous Minister communities. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Tyrrell. Order, President. Look, I appreciate all that they're doing, but it was a very simple question, and I'm here to represent Tasmania, not Thank the you. Government. I will again uh, direct the Minister to your question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Uh, well, Senator Tyrrell, all of those things, all of those things are things that Thank you, this Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Yesterday, during question time, you declared to the Senate what the Prime Minister Albanese says he does. Yeah. Mr Albanese said not once, but on 97 separate occasions, that Australians were going to see a reduction of $275 in their power bills. Minister, when will Australians get a 275 reduction to their power bills? Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you. Uh, order on my right, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, the Senator for, uh, for his question, which uh, seems to be a repeat of uh, questions uh, asked uh, earlier, earlier in the week. And I have to say, I have to say, Order. on a day, a historic day, when um, um, the Prime Minister announces uh, the recognition of an Indigenous voice to Parliament, here I am at the third question, third question, uh, where we haven't had a single, a single question about the Order. big issue of the day. Order. Now, the um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Relevance. Clearly, my question was about electricity bills and the prices that Australians can expect to pay, and we're getting an answer Thank on the voice. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I will draw the minister to the question. Minister Farrell. Um, Prime Minister Albanese, just like myself, is deeply concerned about the issue of electricity. Electricity, President. The Prime Minister, Senator the Prime Cash. Minister, and uh, myself are deeply concerned about the issue of, uh, of electricity prices in this country for ordinary working Australians and businesses, for that matter. Now, the the reality is that the reason, the reason, the reason that we uh, find ourselves in a situation with escalating electricity prices is the ten, the ten, ten long years of inaction uh, by the former government on the, the uh, pressures in relation to uh, electricity prices and, of course, the issue of climate change. Now, what did we do as soon as the Prime Minister... What did we do as soon as we came into government? We took action. We took, we took action on electricity prices. We sought to put a cap on gas Order. prices. We sought Order. to put a cap on gold coal prices to push the price of electricity down and what did your mob do what did your mob do you voted against it 
You wanted to keep electricity you, prices Thank high. You, Minister, you wanted time to keep for electricity. Has expired, Minister, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. First supplementary. Thank you, President. Does Labor's Powering Australia plan say, and I quote, it will cut power prices for families and businesses by $275 a year? Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, look, um, we've taken all of the action that we've done in respect of power prices to put downward pressure, downward pressure, on electricity prices in this country to repair the neglect of the previous nine years of neglect from your, your, your government. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, yeah, point of order on direct relevance. The question asked very simply whether or not uh, the, the Lab is powering Australia plan will say it will cut power prices, power bills for families and businesses by $225 Thank a year. Thank you, uh, Senator it, O'Sullivan. I, I seek leave I will. To, Senator to O'Sullivan. Senator O'Sullivan, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan, you were on a point of order. Well, there was so much interjection, it was very hard to hear. The, um, I will rule on the point of order. I will direct uh, the minister to your question, and I will also uh, ask the minister to. Um, you are seeking leave now. Yes. I seek leave. Is leave to... granted? Well, I haven't. I haven't explained what. Leave is President. not granted. Order. Order. President, with respect, President. Uh, no, it's not with respect, Senator no, O'Sullivan. I asked. I asked if leave was granted, and the answer was no. It's. There's no point debating it with me. Please resume your seat. I have the minister on his feet. Thank you, thank you, uh, President. It is customary when uh, somebody is seeking to table a document to. Um, um, well, look, we don't know I, that. I, 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 I don't know. Order. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what the senator has got in his uh, uh, in his hand. Um, the the leader the leader yesterday um, had the courtesy to uh, hand me a copy of the document that he wanted to uh, uh, put uh, forward, and uh, I'm happy to look at any document which um, the opposition seeks to uh, to table and uh, respond. Thank you. So before I come to you, Senator Birmingham, Senator O'Sullivan, the minister has invited you to show him the document so he may consider the um, response. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, on indulgence, given the invitation of the acting leader of the government in the Senate, here it is, and perhaps you'd like to read the highlighted line to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Um, so I, we're going to go back to the question. I've asked the minister to um, respond to the question and to be relevant to the question. Minister. Love it. I'm ready, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, President. And, uh, um, look, Order. I, I, I don't think I can be any clearer about uh, the actions that this government has been taking to reduce the price of electricity in this country for uh, both. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Just, yep. just a moment, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Watt. Senator O'Sullivan. Point of order on direct relevance. The question was very tight, and we assisted the minister by providing him. Labor's policy. Um, Senator O'Sullivan, in relation to Senator Watt, seriously. Order. The minister has agreed to look at what you're seeking to table. Uh, in relation to your question and your last point of order, I have directed him to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Um, um, look, this government is serious about putting downward pressure on electricity prices. Um, we came to office uh, with um, a former government with something like 22. Thank you, Minister. Um, the time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Will the minister say the words $275? Uh, minister Farrell. No. I am going to sit the minister down again until there is respectful silence.
Speaker, on both sides, thank you, Senator Green. Senator Gallagher. Our minister, please continue. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, uh, the Senator for his uh, second uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, uh, this government um, is serious about putting downward pressure on electricity prices. I don't think I can. I don't think I can be any clearer than that. And from right from the time, right from the time, right from the time that we took office, we uh, started Minister taking Farrell, action. Minister Farrell, we please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, you are clearly out of order, and I would ask you to listen in respectful silence. Minister Farrell. Um, we started taking action on putting downward pressure, downward pressure on electricity Minister prices Farrell, in a way. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Direct relevance, uh, President. I ask the question, will the minister say the words $275? Because that's what they promised uh, to the Australian Senator people. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I will direct the minister to your question. Minister Farrell. Um, well, can I say this, uh, um, Senator? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, going to be have, uh, not, not going to have words or amounts put into my mouth. Um, we have been we have been the government we have been the government we have been the government with the opposition uh, uh, thank you, uh, opposed the to time cutting for electricity has expired. senator Babette. my question is to the minister representing the treasurer senator gallagher having previously denied a link between money printing and inflation rba governor dr philip lowe finally admitted during recent Senate estimates that the expansion of the money supply, low interest rates and government support during the pandemic has driven inflation. Prior to the 2022 election, the former coalition government ran up hundreds of billions of dollars of debt with little to show for it but some expired PCR tests and, of course, an artificially inflated property market where it's nearly impossible for first home buyers to get into the market. Now, do you believe that the irresponsible and unprecedented debt accumulated by the former government has contributed to the inflationary pressures that are currently being felt by ordinary Australians? And I will remind you as well that the Labor Party was also in agreement with most of this. Thank you, thank Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President, and I thank Senator Babette for the question and also for um, his, his advice that he would be asking a question relating to uh, debt and um, inflation. Uh, and I would agree with Senator Babette that um, the significant increase in government debt that was um, that was um, increased under the former government. Uh, a lot of that, double, uh, they doubled the debt before the pandemic hit, um, has certainly led to the budget being in worse shape um, than it needed to be, and that there wasn't enough to show for the debt that we currently carry, and that, that managing that debt burden is the fastest growing area in the budget, is managing the interest burden on that debt. So it is a big problem and it is a big issue that we are having to manage uh, as we work our way through um, the decisions we're taking in this budget. I think uh, the inflation challenge has certainly been made worse by the failure in energy policy, um, nine years of failure to deal with the reality of a changing energy market and the fact that we haven't been able to be ahead of that and have in place policies that have been able to deal with it has certainly contributed because uh, one of the biggest contributors to inflation, of course, has been energy prices, impacted by the war in Ukraine, but absolutely also impacted by the failure of those opposite to land an, an agreed energy policy. 22 of them, not one of them landed, and the fact that we are now dealing with uh, the results of that has certainly been uh, had an impact on inflation, which is why we took the steps we took at the end of last year uh, to put in place caps, to put in place the interventions that we did, um, unusual as they were, to make sure we were putting downward pressure on inflation and bills the at the same time. Has expired. Senator Babeb, first supplementary. 
Thank you, Minister. Now, I guess we're in agreement now that uh, increased government spending does indeed contribute to high inflation. So, why is the government, the Labor government, not responsibly attempting to heavily reduce spending to balance the budget and to actually make a start on repaying our nation's debt? Why all the big spending? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I thank Senator Babette uh, for the supplementary. Well, I would say to Senator Babette, the October um, budget banked 99 per cent of the revenue upgrades uh, that we received um, through that budget, through that budget update. 99 per cent. It's, it's unprecedented, and I think that goes to show the approach that the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, and I uh, take in terms of budget management, and it's not just how much you spend; it's the quality of the spend. Is the the invest are the investments you're making driving an economic outcome, an economic or social outcome? So our childcare investments, our investments in in cleaner and cheaper energy, our investments in in medicines. Uh, all of those things. It's about the quality of the spend. We don't want to pork barrel our way around the country right. like those opposite did. We need to make sure that every dollar that's spent is invested in the productive capacity of our country and improves the living standards of Australians. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Burbett, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So I guess it's pretty clear that governments, all governments, lack the courage to cut spending because it's unpleasant to do so. Now, will you rule out future taxes on the family home and will you confirm that your government will proceed with the stage three tax cuts to ensure that Australians can keep more of their own money and keep up with the rising costs of living? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister. Thank you. Well, on the question um, around uh, taxes on the family home, um, we understand the importance of the family home and it, it will remain exempt from capital gains tax. I think the Prime Minister. Um, and Treasurer have made that clear in recent weeks, and our position on stage three hasn't changed. On the spending side, um, I think we do need to acknowledge that significant amounts, the, the vast proportion of spending in the Commonwealth budget is in payments um, through our social security system and payments to the states and territories. Um, these are you know, significant parts of the budget. So when people say they want you know, to see big cuts to things, you have to be understanding that that means uh, big cuts to sort of social programs that people value um, or payments to the states and territories. So we are, going to be, we are fiscally responsible. We, are, we do have an eye on budget repair, but we're going to be cautious uh, about how we approach it because we know people rely on services that the Australian Thank budget you, Minister. funds. The time for answering has expired. Senator White. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Um, Victoria has one of the largest uh, Indian diasporas in Australia, and so they're extremely interested in the Prime Minister's Albanese's recent um, trip to India. I have met, had many constituents ask me about it, and I, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate further on what uh, Prime Minister Albanese's um, discussions with Prime Minister Modi uh, were about and uh, provi provide an update on how Aussie farmers will benefit from the Prime Minister's recent trip to India. Uh, thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And isn't it good that one senator in this chamber has some questions about agriculture? Uh, and I'm not surprised it comes from come, and India, and India. And it's not surprising that it comes from Senator White, who comes from good farming stock herself. Uh, and I know not that long ago attended a very important event with the dairy industry in Tatura, just outside Shepparton, and I thank her for doing so. Well, the Prime Minister's recent trip to India, where he, of course, was triumphantly accompanied by his diligent trade minister, Senator Farrell, was obviously a great success, and it really underscored the value of the relationship between our two countries, because this is a relationship that runs far deeper than just on the cricket field. India was Australia's sixth largest two-way goods and services trading partner at $34.3 billion last year, and that number is continuing to grow. And much like Australia, agriculture is a massive part of India's economy and its identity. 
And that's why it was so exciting to announce that Australia and India had agreed on two-way agricultural trade to provide new market access for Australian Hass avocados to India and access for Indian okra to Australia. This is a significant market access opportunity for Australian avocado producers, and the good people of India will now be introduced to the, to the wonders of smashed avocado, whether it be on a Saturday morning or any other day, uh, right, across, right across India. The opening of this new export market has been estimated by industry as having a potential market value of approximately $25 million. So it's not surprising that this deal, negotiated by the Albanese government, has been welcomed by industry groups across Order. the board, including. Uh, including the Australian Fresh Produce uh, Association, who said this new access is expected to provide a significant boost to the Australian avocado industry, supporting the sector's continued growth over the long term. And unsurprisingly, Avocados Australia backed in the announcement, saying it's a tremendous achievement, and our growers and packers are Thank very you, keen Minister. to prepare the their time businesses for, for India. Has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, thanks very much for acknowledging my family's history with Tatura, uh, where uh, my my grandparents were interned and did in fact work in. Uh, uh, agriculture. So I appreciate that acknowledgement of those great people. During his visit, uh, Prime Minister Albanese also welcomed the recent entry into the force of the uh, of ECTA. Can the minister explain how the ECTA is already be benefiting Aussie farmers? And ECTA, of course, is the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. Thank you, Senator White. Minister White. I'd, I'd be delighted. Uh, I'd be delighted, delighted to do so, Senator White. And again, it's, it's good to have people on one side of the chamber who actually have real experience in agriculture going back decades, rather than people who just like to talk a lot about it. Uh, I know some of us have got a little hobby farm outside Warwick. You know, we whack on the RMs on the weekend and get the old right on mower out and you know put on the hat. But there's a few people who actually care about agriculture and, uh, and know a little bit about it. Uh, previously, exports to India peaked at 3.38 billion Australian dollars in 2016 Order. on the back of then record grain and pulse production. But changes to Indian tariffs on grains and pulses resulted in reduced Australian production, Order. which had a massive impact on farmers across the country. The India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement came into force on December 2022, and it's already proving to be a win for Aussie farmers. Uh, not only is it opening up new markets for our top quality products, but we're also seeing the removal or reduction of tariffs on existing trade. This prevents, pre presents you, great Minister opportunities White, for Australian for farmers. The has expired. Um, Senator White, uh, order. Senator White, second supplementary. Thank you so much for that answer. Can the minister outline what the Albanese government is doing to support Aussie farmers, processors and exporters to take advantage of the new market access opportunities like those with India? Uh, minister Watt. Thank you again, uh, Senator White. And you know, whether it be the, the wilds of Warwick or the uh, the coffee shops of Elwood. We know the, co the coalition are very strong when it comes to, to uh, agriculture. The Albanese Minister government Watt. is focused Minister on opening. Watt, resume your seat. Once again, the interjections are disorderly. I would ask you to listen in silence, Minister Watt. Oh, just like an <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senator, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. May I remind you to stand and wait for me to come to you? That is a good reminder. The, a di direct relevance uh, to, to the question that was asked, as, as much as, as Warwick has some wild areas, uh, particularly McGrath, at my local pub, which seat. you should come to some Senator time, McGrath. Minister, um, Senator I'd McGrath. ask the Minister to... Senator McGrath, that is not a point of order. Minister what? Thank you, President. Uh, the Albanese government is focused on opening doors for Australia's agriculture and processing industries to grow and diversify their overseas markets. Uh, India's large population and diversifying Order. economy is creating new demand for premium and healthy produce, which uh, Australia is well placed to deliver on. Specifically, rising consumer incomes and increasing rates of urbanisation in India mean that opportunities are likely to be con concentrated in the rapidly growing high-end produce market. These are the types of opportunities that will present themselves because of other key free trade agreements uh, which are still being finalised, including with the UK and the EU. Uh, it's hoped that the UK deal will be finalised shortly, which would be a major boost to, our Austra to Australia's beef, lamb and, in particular, our sugar industry. And I want to acknowledge all the work Thank of people Senator from Daft Depot and others who has expired. As Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Um, uh, I regrettably ask that uh, further questions uh, be put on the notice paper.
and uh, happy to happy to accept um, the uh, Powering Australia policy, which I recommend all of the coalition to to read. To, to read. Thank you. Senator Colby. All answers given to coalition questions by government ministers today, um, albeit with some reluctance, Deputy President, because I don't think that we could, with any level of satisfaction, say that any, answer, any question was answered today. The government has clearly no respect for the process of question time, has no respect for the entreaties of the President of the Chamber, who repeatedly brought Minister Farrell back to the question, uh, entreaties that were continuously ignored uh, by Minister Farrell. And it's a real tragedy that questions that are being asked quite genuinely by members of the opposition around the cost of living, the government's promises to reduce power prices by $275—a number that uh, Minister Farrell refuses to utter—were um, ignored by the leader in the, of the government in the Senate, or the acting leader of the government in the Senate. It appears that the only thing that we have learnt, Mr. Uh, uh, Acting Deputy President or Deputy President, is that Labor's promises are effectively 100 per cent renegable. We hear a lot about 100 per cent renewable, but the Labor Party's promises are clearly 100 per cent renegable. They are not interested in the fact that they promised Australians a reduction in power prices by $275. They are not interested in the fact that they promised Australians cheaper mortgages. They are not interested in the fact that they promised promised no changes to superannuation. Uh, they are not interested in their promises that they, Australians would see lower inflation. Uh, they are not interested in any of their problems. The concern that Senator Farrell continues to express is not going to pay higher power bills. It is not going to pay higher mortgage costs. The concern is not going to cover the costs of additional inflation. This government went to the election promising the Australian people that it, it had a plan to deal with the Australian economy. And all we see during question time is this government trying to deflect the problems to somebody else. They don't have the courage to stand up in here and take the responsibility for the decisions that they've made. I mean, only a Labor government could spend $1.5 billion to see power prices go up. I mean, only a Labor government could do that. We, we know, because we remember, Deputy President, we remember that it took the coalition six years, six years, to get the budget back to an even keel after the last time Labor were in government. It took the coalition six years to do that. And they've started it in exactly the same way that they've left off. The Parliamentary Budget Office told us in the lead up to the election, and it's been proven since, they are spending more money. So higher spending, higher deficits than the coalition. So started the same way they left off last time. And so why would we expect any different? Why would we expect any different? During the time we were in government, they wanted to spend $300 for every Australian to get them, get them vaccinated. Six billion dollars extra that, that didn't need to be spent because Australians lined up to be vaccinated, Mr. Deputy President. So we're seeing the same chaos. But worse, but worse, a complete disrespect for the Australian people, a complete disrespect for the promises that they made to them just 10 months ago. All of those commitments. We have a plan to manage the Australian economy. Where's 
any sign of that plan. They promised a reduction in, it, in, in energy bills of $275. And the only thing Australians are seeing, Deputy President, is power prices going up and no sign of anything else. They promised that they had a plan to deal with inflation. And where's the evidence of the plan in the context of that? Because inflation is at, at recent high levels at over 7 per cent. And they pay no respect to the process in this place because we did not effectively get a single answer to a single question today where the minister did nothing but try and palm off responsibility, not answer the question, deflect responsibility to somebody else, but not being prepared to stand up and have the courage, as a government should, to take responsibilities, responsibility for the issues that are facing the Australian people, but much worse, continue to break their promises to the Australian people. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. We on this side understand that the rising cost of living is hitting a lot of Australians hard, and inflation is the defining economic cha uh, challenge in 2023, as it was in 2022. Australians also understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for addressing them. Australians are dealing with the repercussions of almost a decade of the Liberal National Party's inaction on modernising the energy grid and on building strong relationships and facilitating a community where everyone is welcome and their individual <coughs> characteristics and skills are accepted and appreciated. Because we know that people are able to, if people are able to fully engage in society and the workforce when, when, they, can be, then they, when they can fearlessly be their authentic self. A study conducted by BetterUp found that when people were able to show up authentically at work, the workplace experiences 54 per cent lower turnover and 50 per cent increase in team performance, all of which supports an increase in productivity. That's why it must be noted that the actions of some hate-filled individuals outside this building today and outside parliaments across the country throughout the week, including in my home town of Hobart, must be called out. This hate has been countered by love, acceptance and community. I'm proud to say that the views of the person fuelling this hate is not supported by the majority of Australians. The government certainly does not. This government stands with trans and non-binary folk. This is a government that believes equality is a core business. Unfortunately, some senators in this place have given oxygen to some, someone so damaging. The facts are so clear. 63.8 per cent of young people who identify as LGBTIQ plus have been diagnosed with mental health conditions. Compared to the general population, trans and gender diverse young people are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with depression. Even more distressingly, transgender young people are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide compared to the general population. Why there may be a handful of people trying to divide us, choosing to hate, choosing to discriminate and choosing to spread mistruths, there are many, many, many more standing in solidarity with trans and non-binary people. How can we tackle some of the most co corrosive issues in, in influencing the cost of living crisis if people, if people cannot be their authentic selves in society? Because the risk of doing so is just too great. To increase productivity, workers must feel safe, supported and valued at work, no matter who you are or who you love. Trans people have a right to live in safety, to thrive, and just like everyone else, trans people should be treated with dignity and respect. 
at every single stage of their lives. No one should ever have to experience such an invasion of their right to exist. So I want to make it clear to our strong trans and non-binary community, you are welcome here and you are celebrated here. Our message is simple to the LGBTIQ plus community. No matter who you are or who you love, you should be valued, equaled, uh, equal and celebrated. I also would like to give a call out to those people in my home t state of Tasmania in my, and in my home t town of Hobart and congratulate you for turning up and supporting your trans and non-binary people. I wish I could have been there with you, but unfortunately we were sitting. And I hope that the person fueling this hate understands that Australians do not stand with her. Senator Smith. Very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I thank uh, Senator Brown for her uh, warm and generous remarks, and I'm sure that many senators in this place uh, will support her. The matter that we're debating at this particular part of the schedule, though, is the question time. And it was quite revealing. Senator Farrell gave us an insight into the Prime Minister's morning routine. Yes. Senator Farrell said that the Prime Minister wakes up every morning and he thinks about what more he can be doing to help Australian families. That will come as very cold comfort to those Australian families who wake up every morning and ask themselves, why is the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, and why is the Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, making my family poorer? I think he needs to get up earlier. The cost of living crisis in this country is real, it is immediate, and the scale is serious. The best way to demonstrate that, of course, is with the data. So just think for a moment, a family who took out a loan at a fixed rate of 2.5% for a loan on a residential property of about $450,000, remembering that the average loan in our country is $600,000, is now was paying, was paying $2,060 a month. Now it is paying at least $2,900 a month on a variable rate of about 5.8%. That is an extra. That is an extra, eight hundred and forty dollars a month, or or ten thousand dollars a year, that an Australian family has to find. Now, Senator Green, I know, is sort of smirking and unsettled in her chair. Let's think about the scale. Uh, Senator Green, I've, I've... Oh. well then, through 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 me, th Senator Green, through me, I, I take the point of order. Senator Smith, please. Members, member, members should be able to sit in the chamber without a reflection of their personal demeanour. Deputy President, so this fact will make senators uncomfortable. This fact will make Labor senators squirm. How many people, how many mortgages themselves do you think have shifted from fixed to variable? I know that you'll be thinking, I've heard that number before, I think that's about 880,000 880, uh, mortgages. I can see Senator Ayres nodding. That is correct. That is, that is the 2023 figure. That is this year's figure. What was the 2022 figure? That was 590,000. What is next year's figure? 450,000. What does that mean? 1.9 million. 1.9 million mortgages shifting from fixed to variable in the term of this government, and what is their plan for a remedy? What is their plan for a remedy? 1.9 million is the scale of the problem. Not my figure, Deputy President. Figures released yesterday by Senator Gallagher in a question on notice to me that was late in being responded to was late in being responded to. Not one day late, not two days late, weeks upon weeks of late. So why was it that the government thought it necessary 
to delay the return of my question on notice that revealed, that revealed 1.9 million mortgages shifting from fixed to variable rates over the life of this government. I know that Labor senators find it tiresome to listen to coalition senators talking about these issues. The issues are real. The issues are serious. They're on a scale that I think will surprise many, many people. So don't listen to Senator Smith. Let's listen to the ACT Secretary Sally McManus. And what did she have to say? What did she have to say? She conceded, she conceded that real wages are going backwards, her word, by a shocking, Sally McManus's word, shocking, four and a half per cent, and that the wage rises of 2022 and early 2023 have now been, Sally McManus's words, eaten up by price rises and interest rate rises. The head of the Labor movement is saying that the government's lack of action, price rises, interest rate rises, are eating away those very, very modest gains uh, that people might have had in their wages. So when the Prime Minister wakes up tomorrow, I hope he will wake up with a renewed sense of urgency about the scale of the cost of living crisis that is impacting Australian families across the country. It's serious, it's real, it's on a scale that is unprecedented and Australians' families deserve better. Senator Green. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy President, what um, this government takes incredibly seriously is the cost of living um, crisis that Australians are facing. And we certainly know that um, there are incredible pressures on um, people around the kitchen table, and that is why we are taking action at the Cabinet table. But I want to make this clear that um, what I think Australians are, um, uh, take most seriously is being left Australian taxpayers being left with trillions of dollars of debt and without any economic dividend to show for it. Because that's what the former government left behind for Australian taxpayers, not, for, not just for our government to deal with and to manage, but Australian taxpayers were left with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it from the Liberal Party. They were left with a budget mess. They were left with a decade of no energy policy to actually deal with uh, cost of power prices or um, in increasing renewable energy. Uh, they were left with a government that was more interested in pork barrelling than they were to um, actually investing in our economy and fixing the care economy, providing opportunities for women to get involved in the economy and making sure that people could have real wage rises. We never saw that under 10 years of the former government. And that's why when we sit on this side of the chamber, we take these issues incredibly seriously. But it's hard to take the objections of those opposite seriously when they pretend now to care about real wages, that they care now to, to care about power prices um, and to take the Liberal National Party seriously when they start to care about budget management when they um, left Australian taxpayers with a trillion dollars of debt but were happy to go and spend that money, like Liberal national money, uh, using colour-coded spreadsheets. Um, that is what we are hearing from those opposite today. What does make me smile, Senator Smith, and what makes me happy is that we finally have a government that's getting on with the hard work, the hard work of addressing these issues. We know that since the Labor government um, uh, started, we've managed to successfully argue for a wage rise for minimum wage workers, something that people had been waiting for for many, many years. Um, we've delivered uh, legislation to drive investment into cleaner and cheaper energy to put downward pressure on power prices. Finally, after 10 years to have a policy in place, they had 22 policies. They couldn't land a single one because they're so divided on climate change. They don't think it's real. So that's why they never landed a policy. So we finally have a policy that we're implementing and we're delivering um, to put downward pressure on power prices. We actually built, brought a bill into the parliament in the last, um, uh, last year. Um, we, we called 
um, parliament back. We got everyone back to Canberra to um, put through energy price relief because we, we could s see this coming down the line. And we wanted to put a cap on gas prices. And we brought that legislation to the parliament. It should have been a unifying moment for the parliament. But instead, those opposite voted against, against bill, en energy bill relief. They, they voted against giving Australian families um, a bill relief on their energy power prices. But this government is delivering cheaper childcare, and that's about to start in 100 days. And I know, I know that it's really hard for those opposite to understand that childcare is an economic issue, that it's something that will deliver an economic benefit to our country to have cheaper childcare, to have women who are not choosing between a day's work or putting their child in childcare, to have that bill reduce over um, a certain amount of time is incredibly important. That's why we prioritise cheaper childcare. We're delivering cheaper medicines, delivering fee-free TAFE for more universities. We're actually expanding paid parental leave to make it easier for families. And we're delivering the Housing Australia Plan to have cheaper and more affordable homes, more funding for <clears throat> more funding to have cheaper houses, but also to make sure that we have housing for people leaving domestic violence situations. Our government is getting on <coughs> with, the job, with the job of reducing the cost of living pressures that Australians find themselves under, and it's no thanks to 10 years of complete disunity, disarray, denialism from over there on that side of the chamber. I'm incredibly proud of the work that we're doing and our Prime Minister uh, for the work that he is doing. We've got a long way to go and we're not afraid of the hard work, but it's no thanks to those on that side of the chamber. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And let's just start off with the uh, childcare smear that we had there from the other side. As a stay-at-home parent, I'm very passionate about childcare, and that's why I want childcare to be optional and not make it compulsory that you only get childcare if you put your child in a childcare centre. I say let's pay the childcare payment to the actual parents, to the parents, and let the parents decide how they spend childcare. Because, for example, nurses and police and all those people that work uh, shift work, they can't pick their child up at six o'clock at night. There's other people who work part time. They may only want to uh, use childcare three or four hours a day and not have to go driving 40 minutes to a childcare centre. Let's take all those parents out in regional Queensland that have to drive 40 or 50 minutes off the farm. So I don't want to hear from Labor, who only use childcare as a means to uh, pay the childcare centres so they can clip the ticket on union fees. No, 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 no. Our children are much more important than that. They are not a means by which you collect uh, union fees. Thanks very much. And then let's go to this whole issue of a trillion dollars debt. We actually had $800 billion in debt. And can I say that we were tracking very well, and I know my first year here as a senator, we actually had less than a billion dollars, uh, sorry, less than a million dollars in deficit, and we were, had the debt uh, back down to 500 uh, billion after Kevin Rudd's crazy, uh, Kevin Rudd and Julie uh, Gillard's uh, crazy expenditure. But unfortunately, we had state uh, Labor premiers uh, create a wall of hysteria. You know, it was like a raging bushfire that they just couldn't control day in, day out, COVID press conferences, one at nine, one at 10, one at 11, one at 12, scaring everyone about COVID, wanting more and more money. Uh, and we still haven't got an audit yet on all that money pa paid by the federal government to the state government as to uh, for cases, COVID cases in hospital. And if you go and look at the New South Wales health data last year, they have more deaths from COVID than what the ABS recorded nationally. So you've got to ask yourself what type of bookkeeping went on with this COVID hysteria and was it just the means by these autocratic health state health bureaucrats who were actually locking people down and collecting the money uh, in their back pockets, not to mention the billions of dollars on vaccines that you know, the, the premiers uh, all mandated on people and that they were going to be basically either you've got to take this vaccine that costs a lot of money that we're going to pay a faulty, foreign multinational for. Uh, and it didn't even stop transmission or infection. And we found out just this week from Atagi that there's actually greater risk of myocarditis for young people under 30 uh, from the vaccine than from the virus. From the virus. I mean, this was what you know I stood up for. And no one listened. So not only did we not get bang for buck, these people over here, the other side, Labor, have have a gall, have the gall to accuse us 
of racking up debt when they were fuelling the fire day in, day out with daily press conferences. But let's focus on the cost of living, shall we, this week, because heavens knows all we've been doing this week is talking about identity politics yet again. This is the great distraction on this side of the chamber. These people are only ever interested in command and control, and they do that by dividing the people based on the identity politics. And we've had enough of that. And we heard that here today in the chamber, where we're talking about cost of living, and suddenly we pivot to identity politics. And you know why they pivot to identity politics? Because they have no idea how to manage an economy. They have no idea how to manage their economy. I know in my home state of Queensland, the Bly Beattie government sold all of our infrastructure. I tell you where you control costs. If you want to control costs, you build infrastructure. You build power stations, power stations that provide cheap, reliable energy that drive down the cost of electricity. That's how you do it. You build dams that provide irrigation to, to, uh, to you know, irrigate more, more farmland so you can have cheaper food. You build better roads and you basically do it through good economic management and sound monetary policy. And we know that the other side of the chamber over there, you know, they're, they're not focused on the things that matter. They aren't focused on people. That is who put us here, the people. They are focused on empowering their bureaucrats, their fund managers in superannuation, their corporate executives. I mean, they've taken over the big end of town on that front as well now through superannuation. And if they were really worried about the cost of living, they would make superannuation optional. Let the workers, let those people, it's their money, let them keep their wages, let them pay off their mortgages. Imagine if we could uh, give access to the workers and uh, they could access their super and pay down their mortgages and not have to pay these high interest rates. That's the way you deal with cost of living. I put the question. Those for the question say aye against. No. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note to Minister Watt's response to my question about gambling harm. And frankly, Minister Watt's answers were pathetic, totally pathetic. We have got so much harm from gambling that is being experienced by people in this country. They're, the losses of gambling are the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare estimates that Australians lost approximately $25 billion on legal forms of gambling in 2018-19, the largest per capita losses in the world. We, the Australian Communications and Media Authority said that 11 per cent of Australians gamble online. In my home municipality of Maribyrnong, I know that the average losses per adult are $1,000 a year. And most of the adults I know don't gamble at all. So it means that the gambling losses of the people who can least afford to lose money are massive. There is such huge damage and harm being done to people in Australia today by gambling. My question to Minister Watt went to three very straight forward actions that governments can take to limit the harm of, of gambling. One is to ban gambling advertising. Seventy per cent of Australians want to see gambling advertised banned. They want it to be banned everywhere and all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet, in response to my answer about will the government ban gambling advertising, Minister Watt said that we have to make sure that gambling promotions were being presented in a responsible manner. Now, come on, that just does not cut it. We know that the damage that is done by gambling advertising is very similar to the damage that was done by tobacco advertising decades ago. And finally, governments were moved to ban tobacco advertising. We need to have a strong commitment to ban gambling advertising now. The second area that I um, put forward as being necessary to be limiting the harm from gambling was to ban donations from gambling companies, because we know the insidious harm and the influence that those gambling donations have. And we have got the stark evidence of the Minister for Communications, the minister who manages online gambling, accepting almost $20,000 in donations to her own election campaign before the last election. This is outrageous and absolutely shows the influence of the gambling companies on this government. And yet, in response to will the government consider banning donations, the minister went off on some 
complete deflection, trying to equate the fact that the Greens received donations from somebody who made money out of beating the house at gambling to their receiving of donations from gambling companies. It's like trying to equate getting a donation from a smoker from donations from the tobacco industry. It's a complete irrelevancy, and it just shows the lack of focus and the lack of commitment by this government to be reducing the influence of the gambling companies. And we know the insidious influence they have. Mm -hmm. The third area that I felt that I proposed to the government that we need to have action was to introduce a national gambling regulator, to be regulating the online gambling that is showing that is doing so much harm. Because online gambling it occurs nationally, it occurs internationally. We need to have national regulation to reduce the harm from on online gambling. Instead, what we got a commitment to was we've got another inquiry. If you don't want to do anything, we're going to look into it. We're going to have another inquiry. You talk to any advocate, anybody who knows about the harm of being caused by gambling, we do not need another inquiry. We need a national gambling regulator to regulate gambling in this country. There is a need for action on gambling at all levels of government, at local government, at state government and at federal government. At the state government level, there are state governments right across the country that are taking action, which is why in New South Wales you have got the opportunity, if you live in New South Wales, to be voting for the Greens on Saturday, who have got an election platform yeah. that would really tackle gambling issues, where they want to be phasing out pokey machines, introducing a cashless gambling card, Introducing a pokey super profit tax and banning political donations from gambling. These are the sort of measures that need to happen. These are the sort of measures that Greens in state and federal and local government are willing to take action on, and they're the sort of measures that this government really need to take seriously. I'll put the question, those for the question say aye against no, the ayes have it. Are there any motions? Sorry, uh, we've now come to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. No senator has indicated they wish to speak, so we'll come to consideration of documents. I'll just uh, allow me a moment, Senator Scar. The Senate now proceed to consideration of documents which are listed on page, pages four and five of the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I refer to document 6, 8, 10, 11, 12 and 13 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator. Uh, I take note of document number one, the Law Enforcement Joint Statutory Committee examination of the AFP's annual reports 2020 to 21 to 22 report, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. That was number one of the um, of committee reports, was it? We haven't quite got there, but no, that's fine. That was for my benefit. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I take note of document number one on page four and seek leave to continue my remarks. It's leave granted, leave is granted. And um, I think that's all, because I think Senator Scar, um, Senator Scar did the rest. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just just uh, give me a moment, Senator Poker. I know that you want to speak. I just have to organise myself. Are you, which one are you planning to speak on? Just to us, document five. Uh, that's, that's fine. I'll give you the call. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to, to, President, I rise to take note of document five, the final report of the Select Committee on Work and Care. Two weeks to this day, I had the honour of presenting the final report to the Senate. And since then, I've been overwhelmed by the public's response to the report's recommendations, particularly the recommendation for a four-day week trial and the right to disconnect. Australians are increasingly having to juggle work and unpaid care, and many workers are trying to balance multiple jobs to make ends meet, and technology is causing availability creep, bringing work into rest time. People are working more than ever, 
whether in unpaid care or paid work, but not feeling the reward. In fact, real wages are going backwards for many Australians, while the cost of living continues to rise. The public response to these issues is clear. We need a new working time regulation fit for a 21st century workforce. When Australia's labour laws were first set, they were based on the assumption that a worker had a wife at home, someone to care for the kids and run the household. Today, almost half of all workers are women, and neither they nor most men have a partner running their home. On any day of the week, four in ten workers are juggling uh, their job and care responsibilities. Despite all this change, we're still awaiting a 21st century workplace law that recognises this reality. This report sets out two things we could do right now to better regulate working time. Implement a right to disconnect and trial a four-day work week. The committee heard substantial evidence in favour of the four-day week. Notably, we heard from Momentum Mental Health, a not-for-profit mental health service currently participating in an international four-day week, week trial. All the organisation's staff have caring responsibilities, and the trial followed the 180-100 model—100 per cent of wages, 80 per cent of hours, 100 per cent productivity. The results today have been amazing. Productivity has been maintained. Some parts of the organisation it's increased. Client satisfaction, external stakeholder engagement, the number of hours of service delivery have all increased. At the same time, employees' sick days have decreased while measures of happiness, work-life balance and amount of sleep have increased. These positive results are reflected in the findings of the world's largest trial of a four-day week in the UK, released around the time of this report, which gives the same positive picture. In Unilever, an 18-month trial in New Zealand showed a four-day week brought about a 34 per cent fall in absenteeism, a 33 per cent fall in stress and a 60 per cent fall in work-life conflict. And today we've heard about a new agreement at Oxfam, where 90 employers have negotiated an enterprise agreement with a four-day week. So the evidence could not be any clearer. A four-day week is good, good for business, good for workers, good for carers and good for the economy. And it's worth considering a recommendation that received wide support in, in our uh, report for implementing a trial of a four-day week more broadly. Reducing working hours, of course, though, is just one piece of the puzzle. We also need to take, take action to reinforce limits on working time with a legally protected right to disconnect, a right to turn off your phone or your technology and look after yourself, your family and your friends. Evidence told to the inquiry told us that our, our constant connection to work through our phone has no limits but has many and varied negative consequences for people's health and for our relationships. It affects people in insecure jobs in particular, where they're constantly waiting for the phone to vibrate, telling them no when their next shi shift or hours might be. It also affects people in full-time jobs who have to check for texts and emails outside of hours, worried they might have missed an important piece of information long after they've knocked off for the day. As a result, as a nation, Australians are working massive amounts of unpaid overtime—$93 billion worth across the economy, an average of 4.5 hours per week each. This amounts to a an, an very massive level of uh, wage theft. The Greens want to see a legal right to disconnect from work and Labor have joined us in a majority report, which was a key recommendation of this report. On Monday, my colleague Adam Ban introduced a bill to the House that, if passed, would create a law that prevented employees from contacting employees outside working time unless it was essential or for the welfare of the worker. It's time to update our standards in this area, as has been done in France, Spain, Ireland, Canada and many other countries. So I commend the government for supporting the recommendations of the Work and Care report that workers and families we can't wait any longer. I urge the government to support our bill to implement a right to disconnect for all workers and to undertake a comprehensive four-day work week trial. It's beyond time that our workplace relations system and our labour law caught up with the way we actually live and reflected our 21st century workforce. Senator Stewart, John, are you speaking on this one? On the same document, Thank yes. you. And then could you consider at the end of your contribution whether you wish to keep it in the list? Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, now, the benefits of a four-day work week are undeniable. Uh, there is evidence from all around the world um, that speaks to this reality. 
The case studies uh, cite uh, numerous examples of improvements in physical and mental health uh, of workers, higher rates of employment retention, less sick days taken, increased focus and engagement while working, also known as enjoying your job, um, and all of this achieved while maintaining productivity in out and output in the vast number of the uh, examples that have been undertaken. So the case is strong. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, what I want to do uh, this afternoon is add a few specific benefits uh, for members of the disability community. Uh, now, managing a full-time workload is challenging for anyone, especially with the astronomical rises uh, in childcare costs, soaring interest rates, stagnant wages, and a general pressure around the rise of the cost of living. Uh, on top of this, many disabled people, many chronically ill people, have additional expenses. Medical appointments, medication, assistive technology equipment, the list goes on and on and on. It really is important to remember that many disabled people and chronically ill people don't receive any financial benefits or assistance with these costs. Many of us aren't eligible for the NDIS or other forms of support. And even when we are, it is rare, in my experience, that the supports available meet someone's actual costs. They actually cover the cost of being disabled. Put uh, this uh, together with the reality that many disabled people and chronically ill people uh, are in a situation where they are forced uh, to work beyond their capacity to afford care and the supports they need to live a good life, and you begin to see the picture of why a four-day work week would be so beneficial uh, for disabled people and chronically ill people. Uh, over time, the fact that we are forced to work beyond our capacity to be able to live uh, puts us at a much higher likelihood of burnout and the need to take an extended amount of time away from the workplace, or in some cases to stop work altogether, typically at a huge personal, professional and financial cost. Now, maintaining 100% of a salary for 80% of the work hours and having that become the standard as the Greens uh, four-day work week plan proposes will help correct this structural imbalance uh, that is not serving so many disabled people. By allowing people to take more time, to take the time needed to gain the energy to get better, uh, to be able to work through struggles in their lives while simultaneously having the funds they need to do that, that would transform people's lives. And hopefully over time we will be able to uh, support people to avoid periods of burnout all together and avoid being forced out of the workforce and onto the DSP or job seeker or, the, uh, or other allowance uh, payments. I hear constantly from disabled people about how difficult it is to access these payments when you actually need them and the way in which they force you to live below the poverty line. Now, one of the key barriers to successfully navigating uh, the workforce as a disabled person or a chronically ill person uh, that I hear from constantly in the community uh, is that struggle of juggling working for five days a week while also attempting to attend all the medical and healthcare appointments that you are required to engage in as a disabled person to maintain your care. Work from home options and starts of like flexi start and finish times obviously help with this tremendously. But I cannot emphasise enough how valuable additional accommodations are to the community and how important it is that these types of flexibilities that would be enabled by a four-day work week actually become the norm. Because even with these in place, we know that most medical appointments still happen during business hours. So we need to give people more of their week back. Uh, Senator Wishwilson, are you going to speak on this one or another one? So, uh, Senator Stilljohn, can I ask that you seek leave 
uh, to continue your remarks in the event that someone else wanted to speak. Oh, on yes, I, thank you. I'll seek leave to, uh, to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Scar. Uh, Deputy President, I wanted to refer to committee reports 9 and 11 and seek leave to, want to note those two reports and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So we've, we, do, we come to committee reports and government responses, and many of you have already uh, gone, gone advance of your deputy president. Um, so, uh, Senator Stilljohn. Um, deputy Pres, can I just clarify? I was also seeking to speak to the government response to the Joint Standing Committee's report into independent assessments. Um, just wanted to check that I haven't missed. No opportunity to do that. I think. Yes, we, we went, we've moved past. We've moved past that moment. No, no, number six. Oh, number six oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I've got to do some. Sorry, just bear with me. Uh, which 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 now? It. We haven't passed it. My apologies. I was page yeah. six, document six. Okay. I think. I'm going to give the call to Senator Urquhart to, to do uh, what, to move what she needs, uh, seek leave what she needs to do, and then I'll I will give you the call unless Senator Wish Wilson wishes the call on something. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to. T I was actually going to take note and continue my remarks on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which Senator Stilljohn, so if he could yes, uh, seek leave to continue. And Senator J Stars Ascar has done the other jobs for me. Thank you. Is there any, is there any more housekeeping before I give uh, the call to Senator Stilljohn? Okay, Senator Stilljohn, I'll give you the call on that matter, and then I'll ask you to um, seek, seek leave in your remarks. And then, Senator Wilsh 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 which one do you wish to speak to? Five relating to an order of production of documents. Okay, that's, methane, that's coming a little bit later. Yeah. Yes, no, thank you. Senator Stilljohn, you have the call. Thank you. Thank you very much. The era of independent assessments was a harrowing time for so many uh, in the community. And as a member of the NDIS Joint Standing Committee, um, we heard countless uh, stories of people's distress and concern in the face of that proposal. At the core, uh, this concern that the community had with independent assessments uh, was that the NDIA would require uh, them to have an interaction with a healthcare professional who they did not know and who did not know them to prepare reports that would determine how much support they got from their NDIS. Now, what concerns me in the government's response uh, to this uh, inquiry report, what really concerns me is that so many of the recommendations made by the committee uh, after hearing for, from hundreds of members of the community have been bumped into yet another review process. Recommendation 3, for instance, which clearly states that assessments should be carried out by health professionals nominated by a participant and or their nominee where appropriate and available. The government have not supported this in principle. Now that's a really big red flag for so many people uh, in the community. We heard uh, very, very clearly that uh, there is an absolute need to have a primary responsibility uh, for developing uh, reports related to the NDIS that should sit with medical professionals who know the participant, know their need. Let me say that again. The government has not supported that recommendation in principle. They have bumped it off to the NDIS review when it was so clear, so clear that the one of the primary problems with independent assessments was that it proposed to force a disabled person to interact with a medical practitioner who they didn't know, who didn't know them, who would then make reports that would influence how much support they received in their plan to live their life. 
the only, the only response that the disability community both expect and would accept from this government in relation to that recommendation is wholehearted support. Wholehearted support. And I would say really clearly to the government, if, you, if there is any thought in your mind that you can get away again with forcing disabled people to interact with medical professionals they don't know to make reports about their life, then we are going to go back to where we were before the election, with the disability community united against that proposal, because that is not OK. It is not OK to ask a disabled person to be dissected and have their life looked at and have everything that they need and all of their private support needs put on display before a doctor they don't know, before a specialist they don't know, who maybe doesn't even know anything about their condition. That is not OK. The disability community told you clearly, we would not cop that. And we will not cop it just because it would be a Labour government proposing it. So let's just make that very, very clear. Another recommendation uh, of the committee uh, inquiry report was that the, uh, there needed to be consultation undertaken in relation to uh, the definition of co-design. Now, I acknowledge that the government, so far, is better than the previous government in relation to co-design. Not hard, because they didn't do any. But, you know, there are some improvements in that, in that process. However, in its response, the government has stated that, it, that they will further consider specificity about the definition. Now, this is not certain enough of a statement uh, for the disability community. We know that when governments use the words consultation, they often do it when it's convenient for them and uh, when they don't consult when it is not convenient for them to do so. And I strongly urge the government to authentically consult with disabled people around this definition of co-design and accept the definition disabled people give you not the one you think would be most easy to implement. You have a special task for me, Senator Steele-John. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is leave yes. granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Now, does anyone else wish to um, speak to any of the committee reports? Otherwise, I intend to move on. Are there any minister ministerial statements? Minister. Table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the start-up year program. Senator Wish, Wilson. I seek leave to uh, contribute towards order of production. The documents. Yeah, to take note. The of the, take, take note. Take the documents. Yes. Do Thank you. You have the call. Document five. It's um, a very important uh, topic, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the government's released information around um, a methane pledge. Uh, which is a voluntary international agreement that Australia signed on to. And I was very pleased that the Labor Party did sign on to that uh, methane pledge. Um, but it is a voluntary agreement. And, uh, of course, I hope that Australia is going to be able to contribute uh, our fair share to the reduction of global methane. Uh, and, of course, agriculture is going to be an important part of that, as is tackling fugitive emissions uh, from uh, the mining sector. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, Liberal Party's angle might be for the order of production of documents, nor am I going to speculate on it, but I, I hope uh, that it's to uh, work with farmers and engage oh, with farmers yeah. on taking uh, climate Senator action. Senator Wishworth, just a point of order, Senator Urquhart. Sorry, just a clarification. I'm sorry I interrupted yes. you. Um, I just wasn't really clear what document um, Senator Wish Wilson was speaking to, so I'm just trying to get some in my head what he's actually dealing with. I think you might have been trying to do that too. Yes, I'm Thank sorry. you. Is this sorry, I thought you were responding, Senator Bush Wilson, to the OP, OPD of the Minister. No. It's, so um, can I just quickly say seek leave to speak because we've already dealt with six, but that's okay. I, I, I should quickly seek leave seek to speak on that matter. 
I seek leave to speak on that matter. Okay, we'll have to recalibrate the time, but uh, oh, I'm happy to start again. Sorry, sorry. No, no, thank you, you, thank you for indulging. No, no, thank you, you for indulging. Continue. Indulgence. I'm just going to give you five minutes, so I'm actually, right. I am actually particularly indulging you. Yes, you are very indulgent. <laughs> I, I, pre I appreciate that, uh, uh, Deputy President. I was just talking about how important the global methane pledge is, um, not just for Australia to uh, reduce its emissions, and of course, methane is a very potent. Uh, greenhouse gas, up to 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, and of course, the methane pledge has got to include agriculture and, and other sectors, uh, such as the fugitive emissions from mining. And I, I didn't want to speculate on what the Liberal Party's uh, you know, motives may be for uh, wanting to see the documents uh, relating to the government signing of the methane pledge. Um, however, I was hoping that it might be because they want to work with farmers to take action on uh, reducing uh, methane emissions and, of course, more broadly on uh, reducing emissions across the board. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Farmers for Climate Action, who had a fantastic event in Parliament House today, uh, and um, I'm hoping to meet them later this afternoon. Now, Farmers for Climate Action have uh, released this report, Farming Forever. Uh, which they've given copies of to various members of parliament today. And it's a national plan for climate change in agriculture led by farmers. Farmers for Climate Action have 7,500 different farms as part of their, uh, their network and represent over 35,000 individuals in rural and regional areas. And that is growing by the day. Uh, I went to one of their conferences in Launceston uh, and uh, there was 180 participants and they didn't have room for extra participants. And I was uh, chatting with a number of farmers there. And of course, they're a whole very diversified bunch. Some of them were big farmers, some of them were smaller, um, some of them had diversified portfolios and crops, but they were all really interested in what they could do uh, for climate change. Now, if I urge senators, if they haven't met with Farmers for Climate Action, to please meet with them personally and to read this report. If you read the report, um, it's actually got some survey results, over 600 survey uh, results from over 600 farmers who are their members randomly selected, plus uh, uh, various uh, meetings where they, uh, where they raise a number of issues that need to be addressed. Now, this is, of course, this is important in relation to things like methane reduction uh, across agriculture. Um, but I wanted to just read a few lines from their executive summary, uh, Deputy President. Um, they say climate change poses a serious and ongoing risk to the Australian agricultural sector's viability, which in turn impacts our long-term food security and sustainability of regional communities. And they say that agriculture is the most vulnerable sector to climate impacts and projected productivity declines uh, and are likely to impact all subsectors within agriculture. Uh, and they've said changes in seasonal conditions have already reduced farm profits by, on average, 23 per cent over the period 2001 to 2020. So I hope the National Party's uh, listening to this information and are going to meet with Farmers for Climate Action to hear this. Um, they say, currently a cohesive national plan to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change while improving resilience in agriculture to ensure, a farmer's benefit, to ensure that farmers benefit from the shift to a zero carbon economy doesn't exist, but clearly they would like it to. Uh, they say that, and rightly so, that the agricultural sector has been leading Australia in reducing emissions in some sectors. And they talk about how that, uh, some of their key farming groups are well ahead of where governments have been. Uh, and of course, they get provide a number of recommendations of what they would like to see from uh, leaders in, in politics uh, and how that farmers uh, can, need to get over a, a series of hurdles uh, around uh, what climate action actually looks like. But the point I'd like to make is uh, they're very willing. They're very willing participants in taking climate action. So a global methane pledge uh, relates to reducing methane emissions, one part of the overall equation. Um, methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas, but it's a voluntary agreement. And uh, at the moment we're hearing a lot about uh, the potential to put seaweed uh, as an additive uh, which has a borrow, uh, uh, borrow form in it. And of course, Tasmania has been at the forefront of growing asparagopsis, one type of seaweed that can reduce emissions. There's still a lot of work to do to prove that it can be broad scale and re can reduce emissions across the board. That's one exciting thing uh, that has been going on for a number of years. Uh, I know the government has a national seaweed plan, uh, which will help with that. 
Uh, I'm pleased to say the Greens have been uh, working with stakeholders in this area for some years now, uh, but it won't be enough. There's many other things we need to do to reduce methane in this country to make a meaningful impact uh, on climate change by taking climate action. And I look forward to hearing more from the government uh, in the next uh, 18 months or so on exactly how we'll meet our methane pledge. Now, thank uh, you. Senator, I seek Senator, leave Senator, to yeah, thank you. continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, President. Leave granted, leave is granted. Senator, Senator McKenzie, I believe that you have something to ask me. I, I do, uh, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave of the Senate to uh, take note of the Infrastructure Australia report, uh, document 8, on page 5 of the notice paper. Yes, we've already dealt with that, but with, uh, I, you're also seeking leave of the chamber to allow you to do so. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I give you the call. Thank you. When the Albanese government came to office, they inherited an ambitious infrastructure investment okay. agenda, the legacy of the coalition government. We were delivering a $120 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline of projects providing industry with certainty to help their forward investment and workforce planning. Our government had committed to more than 1,200 major land transport infrastructure projects, of which more than 500 had been completed, and more than 300 were under construction. And the new government will likely be able to cut the ribbon on many of these over the next 18 months. We've had more than 400 projects in planning in partnership with state and territory governments, and we were investing in productivity enhancing economic infrastructure in capital cities and in regional Australia. Not only was this an important element of our economic strategy to return to surplus, it was a vital consideration of how we would strengthen both the national and, importantly, our regional economies to help make the economic adjustment for the net zero commitment of the Morrison government. Unfortunately, in the October budget, Labor cut infrastructure investment, some $9.6 billion from infrastructure programs. At a time of high inflation and rising cost of living when it was important for the government to get control of its spending priorities, the government made cuts to the wrong areas. Instead of exercising restraint in recurrent expenditure priorities, Labor made cuts to productivity-enhancing infrastructure spending, job-creating national projects. 36 infrastructure projects were cancelled and many more delayed, with funding pushed way beyond the forward estimates, which begs the question whether they'll ever be started. Many of these projects were for regional infrastructure, intended to enhance freight efficiency, supporting delivery of products to ports and markets overseas. Unsurprisingly, many of the cancelled, cut and delayed infrastructure projects were targeted to coalition-held electorates. For example, in Victoria, six projects were cancelled in Aston, including three major road projects identified as priorities by the RACV back in 2018. The people of that region know Labor does not see that region as a priority. State and federal Labor have shown no interest in outer eastern Melbourne. Not only were there cuts to infrastructure building projects, there were cuts to road safety programs in the budget. $60 million stripped from black spot road safety programs over the forward estimates and more than $280 million in road safety program funding originally scheduled for this year has been deferred by the Federal Labor Government. These road safety cuts come at a time when road fatalities are increasing. The Australian Automobile Association is calling on the government to act urgently. On the 1st of March, Minister King delivered a speech at the National Press Club and I was looking to see if the minister had a positive message about restoring investment in productivity enhancing infrastructure in advance of their May budget. Unfortunately, it appears the minister was merely softening us all up for a further major cuts to road and rail infrastructure projects coming May. There was nothing but bad news for communities wanting to see their local roads upgraded to be safer, to respond to the pressures of growing populations and to move products to market more efficiently and safely. Minister King made it clear she plans to hollow out or streamline the list of infrastructure projects. So we can expect a further partisan purge by the minister of planned road rail upgrades that were funded by the former coalition government. Regional roads of strategic freight importance, congestion busting, urban road programs were specifically singled out by Minister King, but nothing in the 10-year infrastructure pipeline can be considered safe from the acts in this upcoming budget. 
There is every indication these programs will be cut, including regional airports program, something so critical to connect our regions to capital cities for work, for health and for education priorities, not to mention looking forward to welcoming so many tourists to our regional areas as a result of that program. The former coalition government saw the importance to the economy of bold infrastructure agenda, investing in future growth and tackling decades of underinvestment by states in infrastructure needed to support population growth. The Albanese government appears bereft of any ambition or vision for infrastructure and a lack of understanding of the contribution that it can make to strengthening our economy and ensuring that we grow to be safe, prosperous and stronger over coming decades. Senator McKenzie, can I ask? Thank you very much, Senator McKenzie. Really appreciate that. Um, now, just for the reference of the chamber, we will go back to the ministerial statement, and there was a statement provided by the minister in relation to an OPD. Were there any senators who wished to take note of that statement? Senator Steelejohn. And uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. I you believe are. that was something my colleague wanted to speak on, but he's. Not you here. absolutely can do that. Thank, Thank you, Steele John. Um, and are there any further ministerial statements? No. In that case, we will proceed to the consideration of general business. I call the clerk. General business notice of motion 195, standing in the name of Senator Babette. Senator Babette, you have the call. Thank you. I move the motion. Earlier today, earlier today, I moved the motion to create a select committee to examine excess deaths in our country. Before it was voted down by 35 senators in this place, whose names will live on in infamy. Now, statements were made by both major parties as to why it would not be supported. I've got to say the response was as predictable as it was unsatisfactory. Now, many of us here in this place, we claim to care about Australians, but hey, by the actions of what happened today, it doesn't look like we do. Now, the opposition at least expressed concern over the excess deaths, but they potentially are more interested in covering up the mistakes of the past. As for the government, well, don't worry, Australia. They said it's all being handled already by the institutions we have in place. Nothing to see here. That was the thinly veiled message. The fact that Australia is right now experiencing its highest mortality rate in over 80 years must be a cause for concern and it must be a priority for everyone in this place. It should be front page news. Now, according to Actuaries Institute figures released earlier this month, Australia uh, experienced an 11 per cent increase in excess deaths in 2022, the greatest number since World War II. Now, it's not all COVID. It's not all COVID. Only around a third of nearly 23,000 excess deaths, according to the most recent ABS report, has been attributed to COVID-19. Now, the remainder, a truly significant amount of excess mortality, is not recorded as COVID-related. In fact, it is largely unexplained. What's more alarming, what's more alarming is that the Actuaries Institute states that excess mortality is a significant percentage in all age groups in 2022. So we're seeing significant excess mortality across all age groups, even young people. Now, there is an urgent need to examine what is giving rise to this sudden and extraordinary increase in mortality. Australia is a sick country, and we know there isn't a simple solution. It is a complex issue. It requires investigation. Whether it's heart disease, cancer, diabetes or dementia, whether the underlying causes are diet, lifestyle, unexpected consequences of lockdowns or something else. There needs to be an urgent investigation and we must emerge with answers for the Australian people. We must. Now, when Australian citizens are dying in numbers well beyond expert predictions at rates not seen in 100 years, it is appropriate for us to, at the very least, 
inquire as to the reasons. Now, I don't know any member of parliament who could just shrug off excess deaths or dismiss the need for more investigation. Now, my call earlier today to establish this committee would have, at the very least, the very least, given us a better understanding and would have potentially, or well, hopefully, given us a practical way in which we can address what is now a deeply disturbing trend. Again, like I said before, that call went unheeded by the majority of those in this place. Now, only a few caring, dedicated senators decided to stand with me, and I thank them for doing so. We must find answers. We owe it to our family members, to our neighbours and to the people who we represent. Imagine if a Boeing 737 crashed. Imagine that, how tragic that would be. Surely the government would have something to say then. But what if a 737 crashed every two to three days for 11 straight months? 131 planes falling out of the sky. That's what we're dealing with here. The data from the ABS clearly shows this, albeit in a more silent way. Now, there were 22,886 more deaths in the first 11 months of last year when compared to the historical average, a 15 per cent increase. Year-on-year -year increases in deaths should be around 1 per cent, but yet we're seeing 15 per cent in 2022. While this is happening, the government, the health authorities say nothing, more importantly, do nothing. Like we heard today from the government, it's already being handled. Don't worry about it. It's not good enough. It's just not good enough. Now, our media, our media, largely silent on the issue. People dying, dying in big numbers. Forget the football results. Forget the latest woke outrage. This needs to be front page news. This needs to be on the nightly news bulletins. The media fronted up and ran hour-long press conferences with the health ministers to report one or two COVID cases in 2020, 2021. But where is the media now? We know that 8,824 of the 22,886 excess deaths reported by the TGA have been linked to COVID-19. That's around a third which means we have 14,062 excess deaths, excluding COVID as the cause, excluding COVID. It's a big number. We need to know why. Dementia deaths trending 15% above average. Diabetes deaths 19% above average. Interestingly, influenza and pneumonia deaths are down 15% for the year, which makes the numbers more alarming. Not sure if many senators here in this place want to turn their minds back to 2020, 2021. I assume most of us have buried those years in a deep, dark corner of our minds, hoping those years will just disappear. Well, they won't. Those years have set in motion a chain of events that could quite reasonably have con contributed in many ways to our excess mortality. If only we were able to set up a committee, if only we were able to inquire into the reasons why, if only my colleagues in this place had listened, if only they cared and supported my proposal just a few short hours ago. So many interventions were forced on our people in those dark times just past, so many actions that contradicted previous learnings and best practice, so many actions that were not supported by any evidence whatsoever. So much bluff, fear and intimidation. Our borders were closed internationally between states and sometimes our local neighbourhoods. Lockdowns were brutally enforced on people. Elective surgery was cancelled. Cancer screenings were delayed and missed. Gyms were closed. Outdoor activities outlawed. Elderly were brutally cut off from society. Jobs and businesses destroyed. Still haven't recovered for some of them. Families separated, people dying alone. Funerals occurred without loved ones to attend. Marriages were an afterthought. And novel drugs were introduced and mandated without any long-term safety data. The list goes on, and we all know that every one of these things could have adversely impacted our health and potentially led to death. We'll probably never know because the vast majority of those in this place thought it not worthy of investigation. 
The Australian people were initially told that mRNA injections would stop them getting infected with COVID, would stop them spreading it, and most importantly, stop them dying from it. We were told that we were selfish if we were not willing to be vaccinated and that we could kill grandma or kill grandpa. Around 97.5 per cent of Australians over 16 follow the government advice and have had at least one dose of mRNA injection, yet the only data that accurately identifies the vaccination status of those who got COVID, which was published in New South Wales for six months until December last year, showed quite clearly that the vaccinated are more likely to be infected, hospitalised and die of COVID. It is time for the government to be honest with the public. We need to see the vaccination status, age and their comorbidities of every person dying in Australia. More than 11 million cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in Australia and almost 20,000 deaths. It is clear, very clear, that the, at the mRNA injections do not adequately prevent infection, transmission or death. At best, they are ineffective. Safe and effective. Safe and effective. I'm sure we all recall being told that over and over again. In fact, I'm still hearing this same old line today in this place. We've even got government ministers still now pushing the herd immunity line. Still, after all that we know today, the science has let us down. Our authorities have failed us. It is time that we in this place remedy the harms that have been inflicted on our people, the harm to science and the harm to medicine. There is only one way to rebuild trust, and I keep talking about it. It begins with transparency. Mortality rates don't just increase for no reason. There's always a reason. I want to find out why. I want us to investigate. The majority of uh, senators decided that that was not going to happen. They instead wanted to keep us in the dark. Why don't we just put this matter to rest? What are we afraid of? It's time for the, for the government to admit. It's time to stop recommending these injections and it's time to stop them being mandated. They do nothing. This is why earlier today, this is why I proposed this committee to address the issue of mortality and everything else. We have a duty in this place to give people answers. At least I, I thought we did. I thought we did. Many of us have shown today that we're simply in this game for well, maybe power, maybe it's power, maybe it's to protect each other, maybe it's to protect both sides of the chamber. We have a duty to seek the truth and we just failed that today. We've denied the Australian people the opportunity to have answers and for our medical professionals to, sh to save lives. The Australian people elect us to represent them. That's what they do. They elect us to represent them in the big issues that we face as a nation. They deserve more from what they got today. May God help the Australian people because clearly some in this place are not. It is hard, it is hard to deny what happened over the last two years. We've all got eyeballs, we all can see what happened. We were misled. At best, we were misled. Misled by Big Pharma, misled by global organisations like the WHO and the UN at best. I call on everyone in this place to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. And I should congratulate Senator Babbitt on uh, trying to move the motion uh, to have a Senate inquiry into excess deaths. Uh, I think it is well overdue. Uh, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars. We shut people down for a number of years. We locked them down, we locked them out, we locked them up. Uh, we shut down our borders. People were unable to see loved ones. You know, I've got friends who you know, didn't get to see their sister died. Uh, you know, extremely traumatic uh, circumstances where, pe where people were denied their fundamental human rights, all in the name of keeping us safe. And yet here we are in March 2023, 
uh, three years since the actual pandemic, almost to the weekend actually, uh, since we engaged in this uh, experiment, for want of a better word. Uh, and it looks like tomorrow we will see close to 190,000 deaths recorded in 2022. Now that is almost more than 30,000 deaths higher than what was recorded in 2019. Despite the fact that we've only had a couple of percent increase in the population, uh, and at one point there we actually had a decrease in the population when everyone decided to pack up and get, get out if they could, uh, those of people who had other passports and things like that. So we deserve inquiry because the premiers promised that they would keep us safe. We had it heard it ad nauseum, back to back, every day for about two years, two and a half years straight. And yet this is where we're at. Now, I, I, I think that examining 22, 2022 excess deaths are very important, but I actually think it's also very important to examine excess deaths in 2021. And the reason why examining excess deaths in 2021 is so important is that there was next to no COVID in the community throughout that year. Therefore, we have a very clear delineated uh, set of numbers that can't be tainted by allegations of long COVID or anything like that. And I just want to uh, run through what happened in 2021. In 2021, we had 171,298 deaths. This is according to the ABS. In 2020, we had 162,592 deaths. And in 2019, we had 164,800 deaths. So because of the lockdowns in 2020, we had approximately 1,300, sorry, 2,300 less deaths because of the lockdowns in 2020 than we did uh, in, in the prior year. So, you know, then we go to 2021, we've had a jump of 9,000 deaths. So those people that want to claim that maybe this was a catch up, uh, you know, the, the jump in excess deaths in 2021 was a catch up from the lockdowns in, in 2020. Uh, I would argue that that is a fair point to make. However, 9,000 is much greater than the 2,300 deaths decline. The other thing we need to note that in 2021, New South Wales, the, the biggest uh, state in Australia, with a third of Australia's population, was actually locked down for almost three months, uh, in tandem with Victoria that was locked down for about two months. So Victoria was locked down for the same period of time as it was in 2020, plus we had three months of lockdown in New South Wales. So there is a fair argument to say that the number of deaths in 2021 should have actually been as low, if not lower, than 2020 because of the extended lockdowns in 2021. But they weren't. They weren't lower. They were almost 9,000 uh, lives higher. And if we break it down even further and we look at a month-by-month -month comparison, we can see that the jump in deaths from the prior year, so the jump in deaths in 2021, only started to accelerate from May onwards. So the first four months of 2021, there was no difference. And as a matter of fact, there was actually less deaths for the first three months. There was a slight spike uh, in April, which was the month of the vaccine rollout. And then the, the jump in deaths jumped dramatically from May onwards by over 1,000 a month, increasing to 2,000 a month in June, to 4,000 a month, uh, sorry, and then about 2,000 and then petered back to about 1,000 as the, uh, the early rollout um, declined, and then it jumped again towards the end of the year. So that's significant for a number of reasons. That 9,000 increase in deaths only occurred in the last eight months after the rollout of the vaccine. Number one, it wasn't seasonal. So you often, you know, uh, if you look at 2017, that was another bad year for the flu. It was a seasonal jump in deaths from July, August, and September. And that is because September's the, the, the month and not uh, June, because it generally takes about three to four weeks to record those deaths. So we have had a significant increase of three standard deviations from the mean, uh, which is a Sigma-6 event, which is a one in 1,000 event in 2021. Now, the other statistic that is really worth uh, noting in 2021 is that the, the jump in deaths actually occurred, the largest jump in deaths actually occurred in the states that had no COVID whatsoever. So the largest jump was in uh, actually WA, I think, in all places, uh, of about 9%, uh, followed by Queensland, which had a jump of 10%, uh, 
uh, and then the other states like Tasmania and South Australia. And Victoria and New South Wales, that actually had some COVID, uh, didn't have any, uh, had actually a lower uh, drop in uh, more, uh, mortality or a lower increase in mortality. And that would be explained by the lockdowns. Uh, which you know, tends to reduce the number of deaths, especially in younger people who have less, less accidents, less car accidents and things like that. So it's, it's really worth noting, asking yourself or asking yourself what happened in 2021 that didn't happen in 2020. And of course, there, the, and what happened, and, and we can refine that even more, what happened after April 2021, because that's when the spike in deaths happened, and what happened in those states that didn't have COVID. And of course, there is only one obvious um, conclusion to that, and that is the rollout of the vaccine. So if we then go to jump to 2022, we can actually see in the early months of 2022 that the jump in deaths spiked again from late 2021, and that correlated was highly correlated with the rollout of the booster shot, as well as uh, the rollout to young children and uh, teenagers. And it is worth noting that uh, just this week, ATAGI has admitted that the uh, risk of myocarditis is greater in people younger than 30 if they receive the vaccine than it is from the virus. Now, can someone please explain to me why ATAGI didn't identify this risk before they rolled out the vaccine to young children, number one? and why they ignored the advice of the Doherty Institute that the federal government commissioned in August 2021, where the advice was that they didn't need to give it to teenagers, the vaccine to teenagers or children, because it wouldn't make any difference to transmission. And this was throughout the period when they were trying to say it would stop transmission. As we all know now, it never actually stopped transmission or infection in the first place. But anyway, let's just put that to one side. So yet again, why weren't these risks identified? And why aren't we looking at the increase in excess deaths, which in, in 2020, I haven't actually counted the number of standard deviations from the mean in 2022, but it's actually more than three standard deviations. Uh, but we are looking at a very, very low probability. And it's worth noting uh, that just today, uh, it was reported in The Australian by a, an extremely good journalist, Adam Crichton, that the uh, number of excess deaths, uh, you know, Sweden, who didn't lock down at all, had, uh, has one of the lowest uh, increase in excess deaths over a three-year period um, than most other countries in the world. It's, Australia was fifth lowest and then Sweden uh, was lower than that. So you have to ask yourself, did this really, all these lockdowns really make a difference at the end of the day? Because we certainly don't see those, that reflected in the numbers from 2021 onwards. Um, so yet again, more questions to be asked. So if we now go and break it down by, you know, what are these deaths and was it the vaccine, because we've got numbers that you know, highly correlate to the vaccine, we need to look at the causes. Now, one of the things that the ABS needs to do, and I've asked them uh, a number of, twice now in estimates, as well as the TGA, is that they need to give the temporal association between the date of vaccination and the date of death both with reported deaths, reported and suspected deaths, to the TGA of 980 deaths, plus the 171,000 uh, deaths to the ABS in 2021, and the almost uh, soon to be close to 190,000 deaths for this year. Because we need to look to see how many people died within a number of days from the vaccine. We need to look at the average rate of daily deaths. So if we've got 170,000 people dying every year, for example, and there's 52 weeks in the year, you would expect about three, three and a half thousand deaths a week, which equates to about 400 to 500 deaths a day. So if suddenly we start seeing you know, deaths of six or 700 a day within the short time frame, you can start to draw a temporal association uh, correlation. And the other thing is we need to look at the type of deaths that has been occurring. Now, the biggest jump in deaths has occurred in dementia and diabetes. And that's very important because then if we know the type of deaths and where those increases have been, we can start to look at the biochemistry pathway and ask ourselves, well, is it possible to conclude from the numerical data and the types of, data, you know, types of deaths that we're seeing, could that be related to the vaccine? Now, Dementia is basically a vascular disease, 
and it could be caused by a number of things. But one of the causes of it could be uh, the addition of the spike protein into the circulation system. And we know from our uh, favourite document, the uh, Pfizer non-clinical evaluation report 2389-6 uh, uh, on the TGA uh, FOI site, that on the top of page eight, we know that the spike protein can be secreted from the cell membrane. And if the spike protein uh, that is created by the mRNA that the, the vaccine delivers via the lipids into the body cells, uh, and all, all body cells, by the way, if it can secrete the spike protein back into the circulatory system, that could lead to dementia. Because, as we know from page 45 of the uh, Pfizer non-clinical report, that the lipids can be found uh, in the brain and the eyes and the heart. Uh, and, you know, myocarditis, what is the cause of myocarditis? We asked that question to Professor Skerritt in estimates, and of course he said they're doing more research into it. You know, hey, I mean, we're doing more research into it now. Uh, and who can remember Anthony Fauci's uh, uh, comments last year when he was asked about the increase in, in, in menstrual bleeding? He said we have to do more research in that. And of course, you know, uh, you know Tucker Carlson went off his head saying it's just incredible that, you know, when we're dealing with the reproductive organs of the human species, that they decided not to research that before they rolled out the vaccine. So, you know, could dementia be caused by the spike protein in the vascular in the circulatory system? Quite possibly. We don't know that for sure, but you know, evidence seems to indicate that the spike protein has stayed in the blood much, much longer than what the trials, uh, animal trials, mind you, not human trials, uh, showed in the Pfizer non-clinical report. Um, so that's very important. And then, of course, the other thing is diabetes. Now, diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Uh, and yet again, do we ask ourselves, could the vaccine cause an autoimmune disease? And if we turn to page eight of our favourite document, the Pfizer non-clinical evaluation report, we know when we read that document that, has, that the vaccine has induced an autoimmune response. And it's actually induced the, the um, CD8 cells, which are known as killer T, cell, t, killer t cells. Now, those T cells uh, go and kill cells. That's what they do. So you get uh, you know, your helper cells, uh, your B cells, and they create antibodies, and they go and destroy the foreign body that's you know, in, in your body. And that's, that's the big difference with this vaccine. We have to remember that a normal vaccine will develop antibodies that attack the foreign object in your shoulder, in your deltoid muscle. This vaccine goes in, takes over your cells' reproductive organs in terms of pro, you know, develop, uh, making proteins, and then that protein can either sit on the cell membrane, uh, as stated in the document, and that can induce an autoimmune response from these killer T cells. Now, what's scary about this is that they also, uh, page 45 of the document shows that these uh, lipids can enter your spleen, your bone marrow and your lymph nodes. Now, these are responsible for regulating your immune system. Our bone marrow creates white blood cells, our spleen creates red blood cells, if we start messing around with the organs that are meant to protect us, our immune cells, well then we can start getting autoimmune problems. And it's very important to note that the virus itself couldn't get into those immune organs because those, the, the spleen and the bone marrow don't have ACE receptors, which the virus did. So we need to ask ourselves, is it possible that there is a correlation between the fact that this vaccine creates an autoimmune response and induces killer T cells uh, and then in, uh, to the increase in diabetes. And they, these are the things, and this is why Senator Babbitt quite rightly wants a Senate inquiry into excess deaths, and I'd like to conclude by supporting him in that move. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the many amazing people who make up our one Queensland community, I speak to Senator Babbitt's motion that One Nation supports I thank Senator Babette for his motion. Why, why are senators scared of the truth? Why are they paranoid about not having an investigation or an inquiry? If everything is honky-dory, wonderful, let's get it out there. Why are you afraid? In September 2019, three junior lab assistants from the Wuhan Institute of Virology presented to a Wuhan hospital with flu-like symptoms. COVID had escaped. 
In the four months after that reported event, 100 flights were leaving Wuhan's Tianhe airport every day around the world, going for around the world. On some days, five direct flights came to Australia. That volume of movement was enhanced with Chinese New Year, a time when, like our Christians, people travel to see loved ones. COVID was on the, upon the whole world and spreading at the speed of jet aircraft. There's no doubt the virus spread from Wuhan and there is no doubt it was the result of gain of function research as Nobel Prize winning virologist Luc Montagnier correctly stated in April 2020, right at the start. In 2014, President Obama banned gain-of-function research, yet Anthony Fauci, the genocidal maniac, confessed to Congress that his American National Institutes of Health moved the research offshore. They got around the law in their own country. Where did they take it? Wuhan. The ban was then lifted in 2017 to legitimise their continuing research. The Australian National Health and Medical Research Council's 2022 report says it funded 17 gain-of-function studies, 17. Some were conducted in the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness in conjunction with a scientist based in the Wuhan facility. It's clear that calling COVID the Wuhan flu lets the rest of the world off way too easily. COVID was a team effort and the blame must rest with many governments, including our own. The idea university academics should be allowed to engineer dangerous viruses in a lab just to understand them better is an idea born of hubris. In those who have not been questioned for so long, they believe they should never be questioned. And I'm thinking of Professor Skerritt, the Chief Medical Officer and the Federal Health Department Secretary when I mention those words. After spending time in the break travelling this beautiful country, I appreciate that many Australians are fed up with COVID. One Nation continues to pursue the government over COVID for a very important reason. Past actions predict future actions. At the heart of the issue is the question, what happens next time? Only a Senate inquiry or a Royal Commission can ask what happened. Why did it happen? And how do we stop that happening again? Had all the countries participating in this gain-of-function research confessed and agreed to effective oversight, the world would have endured only a bad flu and we would now be out of it. After all, the previous record holder for the world's worst flu, the Spanish flu, only lasted two years. COVID is far less severe, yet is now supposedly at three and a half years and counting. The Chief Medical Officer himself advised me in writing that COVID severity is low to moderate and less severe than many past flus. In writing, I have it. Sadly for the world and all those that government COVID mismanagement killed, a confession did not happen. A cover-up is what happened. There's no doubt in my mind that COVID has become Watergate for the 21st century. The cover-up has become worse than the crime. The cover-up involved repurposing an escaped flu virus falsely into a pandemic of the ages in order to open up a whole new round of drug patents using mRNA technology. Money. We all remember videos out of China. People dropping dead in the streets right in front of a perfectly framed camera shot. You know, because people film strangers just standing there. On the off chance, they will drop dead. We know those videos were fake, if it were not so obvious at the time, because the, the behind the scenes photos and videos are coming to light. This new material features dead bodies unzipping their body bags to have a smoke. A dead body on the street posing for selfies with the camera team. The videos are designed to spread fear and with fear, control. That's what our health authorities were banking on when they did not call out these Chinese videos at the time. And I do mean banking on. Nobody just drops dead from COVID. It takes a COVID vaccine to do that. Let me be honest. I briefly fell for it back in, in early 2020. We all fell for it. We all decided the precautionary principle was the right option because we're seeing hundreds of these videos coming at us. But why? Why are governments still keeping us on this unscientific and inhuman path? After two months around May, June 2020, it was obvious to me and many others that the level of harm from COVID was nothing like the risk these fake videos would have us think. Nothing. 
COVID was demonstrated to be a flu threatening only our most vulnerable. It's not too late to come clean on the extent of the cover-up. Yet every day that passes, every Australian suffering a new vaccine side effect and every unexplained death makes that harder. Senate estimates health sessions were a low point in accountability. A low point in accountability. I do understand the chair felt the need in Senate estimates to suspend proceedings the moment senators got into it with health bureaucrats to ensure nobody confessed to anything in the heat of the moment that they would later regret. And still, they did. In response to my question on a Freedom of Information request for the TGA Therapy Goods Administration summary of the 400,000 pages of patient data relating to the Pfizer stage 2, 3 clinical trials, Professor Skerritt confessed that nobody in Australia reviewed the patient level data on the Pfizer trials. Instead, we used the American Food and Drug Administration's summary of the data made without ever having seen the original source data. This is intolerable. A life and death decision taken on behalf of 26 million Australians and we took the FDA's word for it? Actually, the FDA itself did not even look. It took Pfizer's word for it. And that means so did our health authorities. They trusted Pfizer when it was glowing with tens of billions of dollars revenue in their dreams in the largest wealth transfer from Australian taxpayers ever. Here's why the, T the TGA made a criminal error in its judgment. When the world's leading virologists spent 18 months examining all 400,000 patient records, these eminent doctors concluded Pfizer's stage 2, 3 clinical trials showed the vaccine caused 18 per cent more harm than no vaccine and should never have been authorised. Never. The lid is starting to be prized open on a can full of corruption, cronyism, arrogance and hubris and lies amongst those we trusted to act in our best interest and who failed to do so. Senator Babette is entirely correct when he points at the very high rate of unexplained deaths and asks what the hell is going on. Our health, our health authorities have pursued a course of action that involves ignoring years of science on natural immunity and early intervention to make COVID worse than it needed to be, to create room in the market for a whole new class of drug, mRNA, unproven, untested. And now people are dying and the authorities are saying, nothing to do with us. Yes, it is. It is everything to do with you. Let me, list, let me break this down. One. Natural immunity is equal to vaccine immunity. The Lancet Journal in February 16, 2023 reported mean immunity against severe illness after being infected with COVID once was 90% at 40 weeks. 90%! The European Union COVID digital certificate accepts recovered from COVID is equal to vaccinated. So why are we still promoting vaccines to a population in which natural immunity is now most likely the dominant immunity? A health, second, a healthy vitamin D level reduces COVID infection 48 per cent, almost half. University of Southern Queensland statistician Dr Hogue and, and colleagues have studied the link between vitamin D levels and COVID-19 infection rates from 10 countries, 10 countries, and found COVID-19 infection was 48 per cent less in people with normal levels of vitamin D. Almost half. And still you sleep. The study found, quote, Vitamin D is known to strengthen the immune system and could possibly play a direct role in the prevention of COVID-19." End of quote. And yet we locked people up in their homes and aged care centres away from sunshine, away from sunshine, and used police and the military to keep them there. Number three, betadine worked. While health authorities promoted hand sanitizers on a meagre 6 per cent benefit, in a paper from March 2023, betadine containing povidone iodine was found to offer a 51 per cent improvement in symptoms. Our health authorities criticised betadine and every other early intervention. Why? Why? Four, interferon is an effective early treatment for COVID. February 9th, 2023, in the New England Journal of Medicine, a peer-reviewed paper found that interferon IFL-1 reduced the incidence 
of hospitalisation from COVID 50 per cent independent of the person's vaccine status. Interferon has been available off the shelf throughout COVID. And this data was known in 2020, and we should have acted on it on this information back then. Fifth point, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine work. How many more times could proponents of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine be shown the scientific proof these two prevent and reduce initial severity of COVID? And stop transmission and are a prophylactic to preventing, uh, pre preventing people getting COVID. Horse paste. The health authorities said, while knowing all along these early interventions worked, extremely effective, completely safe at treating COVID and preventing COVID and stopping transmission, stopping people even getting it. Health authorities knowingly and deliberately turned COVID into a pandemic of the ages. Here's why. A brave new world of medicine by gene editing awaited the pharmaceutical companies, and the pharmaceutical companies, the media and health bureaucrats signed on to the vision without reading the fine print that's killed millions of people around the world. It, didn't, it simply didn't matter that there were multiple treatments for COVID sitting on shelves in chemists ready to go. Doctors and nurses on social media, musical theatre performances might have looked like rejected scenes from the musical Little Shop of Horrors. Nonetheless, they convinced, deceived everyday Australians to get the injections and those that refused were forced, coerced or mandated into it. And now people are dying. Unexplained deaths in Australia are up 22 per cent. That's nearly a quarter. Maybe about half of those could be, could be COVID deaths, which necessarily proves the vaccines themselves are crap. The other half is unexplained. Unexplained. And how many bureaucrats, health bureaucrats, are we paying to sit on their asses and, and examine this? What are they doing? Nothing. Half is unexplained. It may be delayed treatment, lack of exercise, lack of social connection, or something else. It's without a doubt vaccines destroying the ability of the body to fight off COVID and the flu, leaving anyone infected, vulnerable to serious infection, fatal infection. Why would the TGA and their agencies behave so contrary to the interests of everyday Australians? Why? We need to know. A Senate Select Committee can answer that question and restore confidence in a new generation of health officials. I call on the Albanese government to immediately convene a Senate Select Committee into the Commonwealth's response to COVID-19. And I make the point, today, the 23rd of March 2023 is exactly three years since we had the first single day session of the Senate on Monday, the 23rd of July 2020. We all jumped into that and said to the government, open check, safety first, we supported them. But I said to the other government at the time, on the day, we want a plan, we want to see your data, we will hold you accountable. I pointed to Taiwan's success and to the success of ivermectin trials in Monash University's in vitro trials. Wednesday the 8th of April 2020, we had our second single day session. I repeated the same points. I then wrote to the Prime Minister and to the Premier Palaszczuk in May and June and July of 2020. And they misled us. They gave us rubbish. The Chief Medical Officer himself gave me a graph showing COVID had low to moderate severity. Low to moderate. He couldn't answer, he, he, he couldn't answer basic questions on it. I will hold you accountable, as I promised, on the 23rd of March 2023, and I will continue until you are accountable. So get the monkey off your back and hold, get these bureaucrats into an inquiry immediately. Thank you, Senator Roberts. And before I give you the call, Senator Canavan, I will remind senators to be particularly diligent in their use of parliamentary language during this debate. Senator, Cavan it's the, uh, Senator Canavan, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, can I start by congratulating Senator Babette for bringing what should be the most important topic uh, of our nation uh, into the Senate for a discussion. Uh, uh, I, I do thank him for 
uh, the courage and bravery he's shown on these issues. And I also do want to pay tribute to the work of Senator Roberts and Senator Rennick, who have gone before me and know much more about this than me. I especially want to recognise the tireless efforts of Senator Rennick, uh, uh, sometimes when I'm out and about with uh, 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 Jared or Senator Rennick, sorry, uh, Chair. Uh, 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 I see he just gets messages all the time from people right around the country, individual cases of people uh, who have been hurt by the vaccines, and he breaks having a coffee or dinner to speak with them, uh, to take up their cause and issue. And he's, I meet so many people for whom Jer is a hero to them, because he, he is one of the few of us among here who is, who is doing the work that a good politician should do, hearing from people's complaints and trying to help them. Trying to help them. These are people uh, through no fault of their own who have had their lives uh, destroyed uh, through vaccine injuries. And look, this has become such an emotional debate, but ultimately a vaccine is a drug. Almost all drugs, pretty much all drugs, have side effects. Uh, this drug has been developed in record time and uh, uh, has side effects, but because so much, so much social control and promotion went into it, we can't seem to even have the humanity and dignity to recognise uh, the tough circumstances that many people innocently have been put in to uh, by the rollout of the vaccine. It is an absolute disgrace that very few, few of us among here are even willing to recognise uh, their issues, their lives uh, that have been up, turned upside down. Uh, let alone take up their cause in the fight like Senator Rennick has, so I pay tribute to him. I don't have the answers today to uh, Senator Babette's motion. I'm mainly going to be asking questions, uh, but I do think very important questions, as I say, probably the most important question uh, in front of the Australian people right now, because as has been outlined from other speakers, we have an epidemic of excess deaths in this nation. Uh, we did go through uh, an epidemic of coronavirus, and according to the official statistics, 20,000 Australians lost their lives uh, to coronavirus. We were fortunate not to be impacted as badly as some other countries. I think there are questions over uh, those statistics because often we've seen uh, people being, uh, being categorised as dying of COVID when really they died with COVID, uh, not necessarily of it. But let's take the official statistics of 20,000. Uh, deaths uh, from Australians from COVID over the past three years. Well, well, if you look at the excess deaths, the non-COVID excess deaths over the past two calendar years, it's been outlined by my colleagues here to today, uh, that uh, over the last year we're looking at around 13,000 non-COVID excess deaths. In 2021, the year before last, around 8,000 excess COVID deaths. So that adds up roughly to a figure of 21,000 excess deaths not, not related to COVID over the past couple of years. More people, uh, uh, more unexplained deaths have occurred uh, over the past few years than occurred from the coronavirus itself. Yep. And that statistic and that alone should put this into stark relief for us all. Yeah. Because how much time, how much discussion, how much money, uh, how many restrictions were put in place by governments uh, to deal with the threat of coronavirus, which has tragically killed 20,000 Australians over the past few years. Look at the effort we put into that. And compare that to the complete silence that is existing in a vacuum down here over the 20,000 Australians who have lost their lives through unexplained ways over the past few years. Why is there this double standard? So the questions I ask today, Madam Acting Deputy President, are on behalf of those 20,000 Australians and their families who have lost their lives and no one can seem to give them any answers. Worse than that, no one is even seemingly putting a lot of effort into trying to find the answer. What is the government doing on this? 20,000 Australians have lost their lives and we can't explain it, more than normal. As big a loss of life as we've seen through coronavirus. And what is the response from the government? Because the first question I have for the government is where is your Royal Commission into coronavirus? Where is it? The Prime Minister promised uh, an inquiry, a, co a Royal Commission or a Royal Commission like inquiry into COVID at the last election. It is now almost a year since that election. 20,000 Australians have died inexplicably, inexplicably, and we still do not even have uh, the outlines of a terms of reference for this Royal Commission or Royal Commission like inquiry. Where is it? Where is it? It is an absolute shame, absolute national shame, uh, that we can have royal commissions into robo debt, uh, 
Uh, we can have royal commissions to do all these types of political different topics, which just benefit lawyers. But we can't have seemingly a proper inquiry into the heartache that has been caused on so many Australians, not just through these particular deaths being discussed here, but the lockdowns, the restrictions, uh, the border closures, uh, the failure to go to your relatives' funerals. All of those things deserve a proper inquiry. I know I give uh, the West Australian government their due. I disagree with them a lot over the last few years, but I give them their due. They have announced an independent inquiry. Premier McGowan has announced one over there. I believe it's the only one that has actually started yet, uh, three years on from the start of all this madness. But the, that the Prime Minister here of Australia made this commitment in the last election. In fact, he repeated the claim when he was uh, grandstanding a few months ago about the former Prime Minister Morrison's multiple portfolios. He repeated the claim that he would hold this inquiry. He's put to him, well, if you're concerned about all these different portfolios the Prime Minister had, and, 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 and notionally, at least initially, they were there to respond to coronavirus, why won't you have an inquiry into it all? And under pressure from the press, he said, yeah, yeah, we will have one, just not now. He said, with specific words, just not now. We're still dealing with, a, we're still dealing with an outbreak in August last year. Well, we're not dealing with an outbreak anymore, guys. We're far past coronavirus. None of us are wearing masks, or sorry, some still do, but hardly any of us uh, are wearing masks. Uh, uh, there are no border restrictions anymore. Uh, people are getting on with their lives. We can have this inquiry now. If not now, it will never happen. And the 20,000 Australians who have lost their lives through inexplicable reasons deserve that inquiry today. They deserved it last year. They definitely deserve it today. So where is that Royal Commission? And the, second, the next question I've got is where is the government's response to this motion, or anyone's response for that matter? Because, as I say, there seems to be this complete silence about the issue. And any time other senators in this place do raise these excess debts, like Senator Rennick has, or, or Roberts, Senator Roberts and Babette, and I know Senator Antich and myself have at Senate estimates, we're ridiculed. You're ridiculed you know, for daring to question the health authorities' wisdom, uh, uh, daring to, to, to uh, question the expertocracy's uh, advice. Uh, you're ridiculed for it. Well, where's the ridicule today? Where is it? Where is it? Because all I can see on the speakers' list so far, we've had Senator Babette, Senator Reddick, Senator Roberts, me, and next on the speakers' list is government open parentheses front bench closed parentheses. Who's that? No one's put their hand up. <laughs> no one's put their hand up. Who is this hapless member of the front bench? Is Senator Pratt? She's drawn the short straw. She won't put a name on the list. But she'll have to read out, dutifully read out, some talking points that have been prepared for her uh, uh, from some other hapless staffers over there in the blue carpet at the ministerial wing. They've had to put together a defence. It's hardly, hardly a rousing defence of the health bureaucracy's record over the last few years. Uh, because no one seems to be able to question and put back, so, well, like, why aren't we having the inquiry into this? 20,000 people have died, more than we, th we expect. Where is the inquiry into this issue? Uh, and I hope Senator Pratt can enlighten us because, it, as I say, it seems like the white flag has been put up here on this, so there's now no longer defending the potential shortcomings and side effects, significant side effects of the vaccine rollout. Uh, but it's not enough to be silent now. Uh, it's time for questions and ultimately answers for people about what went wrong. We also, um, we also deserve um, to know uh, where, how, how. The question should be asked is how have our health bureaucrats got things so wrong? We spent so much time in COVID, and I, I was guilty of this, I must say, early on, agreeing and believing the advice of the health experts. We said that we would have to just listen to the advice. They were the experts, knew what they were doing, and we'd do what they told us, and we dutifully did that. It turns out that their, so much of their advice was completely and utterly and and uh, tragically wrong. Tragically wrong. Uh, we know now that uh, uh, was just a report released in the last day that uh, the excess deaths over the past few, few years of different countries, uh, we have performed, despite all our border closures and largely being untouched by most of the worst COVID outbreaks, uh, uh, we have actually ended up with more excess deaths than Sweden. More excess deaths than Sweden by some margin. Uh, and I remember at the time all the health bureaucrats and experts were saying how terrible Sweden were and they were killing grandparent, your grandma and granddad. And it was terrible. But in fact, in fact, we know that the actual official advice about how to deal with an airborne pandemic did not call for lockdowns before the pandemic, before coronavirus arrived. All our official documents, including here in this country, uh, by the health experts said we shouldn't have lockdowns. You can't use lockdowns to control an airborne 
virus. It's not going to work. And despite all that, Sweden was about the only country in the Western world, at least, that, that actually complied with the initial advice of this. Everyone else became panicked, and we locked people in their houses. And I think some of the, the worst restrictions I kept, I still think about it, how we locked single mums up with two or three kids in an apartment in Western Sydney and told them you can only go outside for one hour. That's what we did. We told them you can only go outside for an hour. Yeah, fresh air was the best thing you could do. And, and, and they're, they're struggling with screaming kids in a house and we lock them in for 23 hours a day and we're saying we're protecting everybody. What a disgrace. And they too, uh, although not uh, suffering as much as those who have unfortunately died in the last couple of years, the unexplicable deaths, they too deserve this inquiry about what the hell went on and how did we get things so wrong. Because what really frustrates me is the double standards that we see from our health experts where they seem to be engaging in something much more akin to behavioural science or behavioural or discredited behavioural economics than they do about actual real uh, uh, virology uh, or, or, or pharmaceutical science. Uh, because I, I note that when Senator Rennick at Estimates uh, just a couple of months ago, he raised the case of a seven and nine-year-old child, ch two children, seven and nine-year-olds who had died after receiving the vaccine. And uh, the, the head of the TGA, Mr Skerritt, or at the time still head of the TGA, went to great lengths to say, look, Senator, you can't draw conclusions from isolated cases. There's only a couple there. You can't draw overall conclusions. There could be other factors. A perfectly reasonable point, may I add, from Professor Skerritt, that is true. Uh, a couple of cases is not enough to, to draw strong scientific conclusions. still think there should be an investigation, but the, you can't draw necessary conclusions. But uh, it's, it's, it seemed just a little unusual that Professor Skerritt would make such a conclusion on something like that. But when I remember, and, and just here I've got an article, that every time a single child tragically died from coronavirus, the health bureaucracy played it up like it was the worst thing ever. And there's an article here in The Australian that, that uh, Professor Skerritt at the time was grumpy and unloads a, about to people about downplaying COVID's effects on ch children when one child, tragically, very tragically, died of the coronavirus. And yes, that was, that's very concerning and should be investigated. But here we had a situation where Professor Skerritt was using one case to scare people to get their children vaccinated, uh, but refuses to use two cases uh, to, uh, to investigate the side effects of the vaccine itself. Because perhaps one of the worst things that we have done through this, this, this period is to vaccinate or force, almost pressure people, to vaccinate their children when there was almost zero evidence of the benefits of that. Zero scientific zero benefits. Zero. Uh, I can accept the potential risks or uh, weighing up the risks of vaccinating older and vulnerable Australians, but children uh, should have been left alone. They should have been left alone. The risks of COVID were always clearly low. They were lower than the flu. Uh, and I don't, I'm not saying the COVID itself was, was, was anywhere less uh, uh, worse than the flu, but for children it was. The evidence was always clear, and we don't force vaccinate or pressure people to vaccinate their children for the flu. But we did so here with an experimental vaccine uh, that we knew didn't st stop transmission. It wasn't going to save grandma. It didn't save grandma, yet we exposed our children to that risk anyway. And again, again, we deserve that inquiry. Because I would hope that we can get back to giving people broad-ranging advice on their health and respecting their intelligence. Uh, one thing that frustrates me the most over the last few years is the way our health bureaucracy all treated us like idiots. And we had to be force-fed uh, these scare tactics and propaganda rather than just be given the advice and treat Australians like adults that can weigh the risks and benefits up of different medical treatments. Because as I come back to where I start, every drug has a potential risk. And I worry that it seems like the pharmaceutical industry here constantly seems to push the drug option rather than the best health option among us. Because we could have told people to invest in their health in the last few years and, and exercise a bit more, eat a bit less, take some vitamin D. All of these things would have helped uh, reduce the risk from coronavirus as well as a lot of other diseases. But of course what they wouldn't have done, what that health advice wouldn't have done, is help the profits of pharmaceutical companies would not have done that. And, and most of all, if this inquiry ever does get up, if the government finally, finally, and I hope Senator Pratt can announce it right now, this inquiry, those, those pharmaceutical companies must be hauled in front of it to explain why they didn't provide more data and more evidence about the risks to people and seem to put their profits over the 20,000 people here who have lost their lives inexplicably in this country. Yeah. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. 
Well, those opposite who've put forward this motion, we haven't seen credible debate coming from others in the opposition who've been through the data and the science. Instead, we see the usual conspiracy theorists trying to attach a headline critique to what is actually very robustly unpacked by the ABS if you drill down into their explanations and the explanations of others into why we have some variations in our data. So I would encourage those opposite, if they want to get in deep and say, let's make sure we're referring to the evidence and the data and look at what's real, I would have expected a little more from you in your speeches in terms of actually looking at the said ABS data. What we know is that the Department of Health and Aged Care has an ongoing and continuous job to closely monitor patterns of death using the ABS data. It is validated mortality data. They also look through other provisional sources, including national notifiable diseases surveillance, the Therapeutic Goods Administration's Adverse Event Notifications Database, and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's National Mortality Database. So before I go on and unpack some of the detail behind some of the trends in the mortality data that we have as a nation, I do want to, through you, uh, Acting President, um, reflect on Senator Roberts' remarks where Senator Roberts impugned the chair of the Community Affairs Committee, suggesting that the chair had suspended uh, the Senate Committee's estimates hearings in order to prevent uh, evidence coming out. I was there on that evening, afternoon, and senators were disrespectful to the chair and witnesses. They were speaking over the chair and the suspension of the hearing took place in order to restore order and for no other reason. I remind through you, Mr President, that when we look at our estimates committees, just because you don't like an answer to a question that you have asked and you disagree with it, is not an excuse to create disorder in the hearing. I note we have been called upon by the uh, Jenkins Review to ensure that we have a respectful workplace, and it was indeed very hard work that afternoon uh, during that session of questioning. Anyway, I will now drill down into the data. And indeed, ABS data does show that we have seen an excess mortality in 2021. But if you drill down and look at the explanations for it, they are actually very reasonable. The overall age standardised mortality rate for 2021 was, in fact, the second lowest since 2015. So logically, uh, that would show that we need to adjust for age demographics. How many people are of a certain age? How many people uh, have certain conditions in order to do uh, a true reflection? You can't just say, well, more people died this year than any other without ac accounting for the age and health for all of those people. So records began... Uh, the age standardised mortality rates, we know, are an important comparative measure as they take into account the fact that we do have an ageing population in Australia. The most recent ABS reports show a higher number of deaths than the baseline in 2021 and 2022. However, data released in February this year shows that in the later part of 2022, there was a notable drop in excess deaths. A recent study comparing Australia to the rest of OECD
countries shows excess deaths in Australia was, in Order. fact, Senator Pratt. among the Senator lowest Pratt, in— please resume your seat. Oh. Senator Canavan, you've had your opportunity to make your contribution. Please follow the standing orders. Allow Senator Pratt to make a contribution in silence. Senator Pratt. Thank you. A recent study comparing Australia to the rest of uh, OECD countries show excess deaths in Australia was among the lowest in 2020 and 2021. The pandemic, as we know, has changed many Australians' lifestyles. This, in fact, presents a challenge in interpreting excess mortality data. We know, for example, that where there were fewer road deaths, a remarkable decline in road deaths in Western Australia, for example, in 2020, 2021. Uh, but those were more significant in states where there were significant lockdowns. So when we compare deaths against expectations during a normal year, whatever that is, we expect to see natural variations in excess mortality rates. In 2017, Australia experienced an excess mortality rate of a significant, statistically significant, 2.6 per cent. But again, the ABS sees that as a natural variation. The following year, we saw an excess mortality rate of minus 1.4 per cent. Excess deaths were negative in 2020 at minus 1.2 per cent. So yes, we did a good job at looking after ourselves during COVID. And again, we can attribute, uh, you know, closed nightclubs, less traffic accidents, um, a whole range of things that saw uh, excess Order. deaths uh, decline. It is therefore really important that we follow this data. It's where, you know, the history of progress in terms of how we manage our nation's road rules have come from. We have driven down road deaths by looking at the data and addressing the causes of such death over many years, and there's more to do. So in 2020, we saw excess deaths were in fact negative at minus 1.2 per cent, followed by excess deaths at 3.5 per cent in 2021. ABS publications such as Provisional Mortality Statistics report provide some cause-specific insights such as patterns of deaths due to cancer, dementia, diabetes, and whether they are in fact above or below expected ranges. But I tell those opposite, this data does not take into account changes in basic things like population size, age structure or other factors influencing mortality. So for those reasons, the ABS states that the Provisional Mortality Statistics Report is quite straightforward. They say it should not be used as an official excess mortality estimate. But what it does point to is specific pockets and trends of issues that indeed we do need to be aware of in our population. The ABS publication on excess mortality is released annually for the previous year. The most recent analysis released in March of 2022 for deaths occurring up to the end of 2021 saw patterns of excess deaths attributed to cancer, dementia, and diabetes. And that shows expected variations with some weeks and years being higher or lower than baseline mortality rates for those uh, conditions, for the excess deaths for those conditions. For example, from cancer, they were higher than expected in 2021, but remained within the expected range 
Deaths from dementia were in fact below expected deaths in 2020 and above expected deaths in 2021. And deaths from diabetes in 2021 exceeded expected upper threshold range for mortality for one week and were below expected threshold for two weeks in 2021. So, while we can't, you know, exactly say, given all of that data and all of that overlaying information, what the exact cause of non-COVID-19 related excess deaths actually is, at this stage there are several possible reasons. One of them is, of course, the long-term health impacts of COVID-19 itself, or where COVID-19 has worsened another health condition causing death. And I was really pleased to bump into um, a range of health experts who've been working on this issue very seriously, including the very well-respected Dr Fiona Stanley, who is a remarkable health epidemiologist. They are drilling down into the data around deaths, but they are very much drilling down into the data of the impacts of long-term uh, COVID symptoms. They've said that long-term COVID impacts are, for a small proportion of the population, very real. And they also say very strongly that the severity of long-term COVID impacts can be reduced by reducing the severity of the disease, including by uh, getting vaccinated, which I hope and I know uh, the majority of Australians will continue to do. There are delayed deaths from existing underlying health problems due to the absence of many respiratory diseases in 2020 and 2021, which otherwise would have caused deaths in those earlier years, in turn impacting on the long-term averages and trends in this data. One of the benefits of COVID uh, masks, etc., was that we saw and the, the caution that everyone uh, has been taking meant that we had a much lower incidence of the flu and a whole range of respiratory illnesses that kill people. We've seen reductions in the timeliness of emergency and routine health care and diagnostic testing for elective surgeries, which also would have had uh, an impact. So I would encourage those opposite not to point to uh, a single, you know, to stay on your conspiracy theories uh, in relation to COVID vaccination. I would have much more respect for the arguments you put forward if you actually drilled down into a balanced set of data and could even begin to mount an argument that looked at specific sets of data alongside the other significant trends that I have outlined today. There being no further speakers on this motion, I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Babette be agreed to. Do those that opinion say aye? Aye. To the contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. Given these standing orders, there are no divisions after 4.30, so that will be deferred to the next day of sitting, and I propose that the Senate do now adjourn and uh, call Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. And uh, Before I start my remarks, I note uh, President Sir Minister Farrell, who has had a big week thus far this week. So Good to see you here at the end of today's sitting day, Minister Farrell. The Gulf of Carpentaria has been hit with catastrophic flooding during the course of 2023. And whilst it is usual for the Gulf of Carpentaria to experience large rainfall events, the latest events in the Gulf of Carpentaria have been catastrophic. And this needs to be, given it's one of our most remote communities in Australia, this needs to be recognised by everyone here in this place. And 
just to underline the significance, the catastrophic nature of the rainfall events which have occurred, we should bear in mind that communities have been without supplies in the Gulf of Carpentaria region for months. For months, communities have been cut off. The road network has been consistently cut off. The airstrip in Burketown has been flooded, and this has restricted planes from taking off and landing, meaning smaller capacity helicopters are the only way to bring essential supplies into the community or evacuate people for medical emergencies. This week, a delegation of senior representatives of the Gulf of Carpentaria community arrived in Canberra to discuss their concerns and provide their perspectives on what is happening in the Gulf of Carpentaria and how we should respond, how we should respond as the nation's parliament to what is happening in the Gulf of Carpentaria. I'd like to pay tribute to Councillor Ernie Camp, Mayor of Berkshire Council, Councillor John Clark of Berkshire Council, Mr Dan McKinlay, CEO of Berkshire Council, and Mr Troy Fraser, CEO of Doomadgee Aboriginal Shire Council. I'd like to thank you, each and every one of you, for your leadership in the community at this extraordinarily difficult time. I'd like to thank you for coming to Canberra, for leaving your communities in order to make the forceful representations which you've made in Canberra during this time, and thank you for the passion for your community. And it was actually an absolute privilege and honour to meet with each of you during the course of this week. And the passion, the uh, the concern you have for your community just shone through, shone through the meeting which I had the honour of attending with each and every one of you. So I want to take this opportunity to put on the record of this place what this community needs moving forward. And I think everyone in this place, everyone in this place needs to give careful consideration to the reasonable, to the very reasonable requests which are being made by the representatives of this community. First, the need for Gregory Burketown Doomadgee Road Flood Resilience Works. The need for this re these resilient works have been demonstrated by the most recent catastrophe, and there is a, there is a need to raise a number of crossings in this region uh, to, assist, to assist in the reopening and access of these communities to the broader uh, road network in Queensland. And the estimated cost of those works is a cost of up to $75 million. But this is absolutely essential. We can't have a situation where communities in our country are isolated for months and months on end. These roadworks are necessary for these communities. There's also a need for waste transfer stations to be constructed in both Burketown and Gregory. We also need to look at the opportunity for people in this community to access health and wellbeing facilities, community facilities of the nature which we all take for granted, which we all take for granted when we come to a place like this, including a 25 metre four lane pool, swimming pool. We've got one in Parliament House. We've got one in Parliament House. The communities in the Gulf of Carpentaria deserve to have the same facility in their region. They deserve that facility in their region. The Burketown Airport runway needs to be raised. So it's flood proof. That is such an obvious request. Nothing further is really needed to comment upon it. And in relation to the Doomadgee Aboriginal Shire Council, they need an, a Doomadgee Disaster Evacuation Centre. They need somewhere safe where, in the event of an of a extreme rain event such as this, they need somewhere safe where everyone can come in from the outstations and find safety and find support. Again, that is not too much to ask. We have many such centres in other places of Queensland, and the people of the Doomadgee Aboriginal Shire Council deserve the same facility. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise in the same parliament that failed to prevent Australia from going to war 20 years ago, a war based on lies. And right now, the same forces that campaigned for that failed devastating war in Iraq. Powerful forces in the media, the weapons industry and the political class are again baying for war. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives have been lost since that first failed war. Over a million Iraqis are still displaced as refugees, and their government still cannot provide basic material needs or basic security, all from a war of aggression that our country took part in and that was based on a proven lie. 
unless we learn from that history and demand accountability, then we are at serious risk of repeating it. We should be building a safe, peaceful future for Australia and our region, and instead the Albanese Labor government is seeking to permanently handcuff us to the United States military's aggressive warfighting plans in our region. The Albanese government has now officially adopted a hand-me-down coalition war plan and jettisoned any pretense of a foreign policy based on peace and diplomacy. And that is a national strategic surrender by Labor to the coalition. Unless this deal is reversed, Prime Minister Albanese will go down in history as the PM who drove us towards a war we never chose and one that no Australian wanted. That is, provided the war is not so cataclysmic that anyone will be able to write history after. First, let's deal with the big lie behind this AUKUS submarines deal. It's a lie to claim these nuclear submarines are about defending Australia. They are all about projecting lethal force well beyond our maritime approaches into the South China Sea. This is worth repeating and repeating often. These submarines are, des are not designed to defend Australia. They are being specifically designed to threaten other players well outside our immediate region. There is no question that this will inflame regional tensions and further drive a regional arms race. In fact, since this announcement, I, and I note others who have spoken out against it, have been asked by senior journalists across the, across the media spectrum, including from the ABC, that given myself, the Greens or others don't support the $368 billion plus being spent on the AUKUS submarines, then what would the Greens do to prevent Australia being invaded by China? Not one credible analyst, not one, has said that that is the strategic risk faced by Australia. Not one. War is not inevitable, and the Greens join a growing chorus of former prime ministers, former foreign ministers, defence experts and millions of people from across the political spectrum who are pointing out the sheer recklessness of this deal. This deal marks the demotion of Australian diplomacy and the bypassing of Foreign Minister Wong and foreign affairs for an international posture literally driven by defence, defence hawks and, in this case, the US and UK arms industries. We've seen Indo Indonesia and Malaysia express very real concerns about this project. Um, very real concerns. We are, we are impacting negatively our relations with, with, with some of our key neighbours. And what are we getting in return? At best, at best, eight submarines at the cost of damaging relations with some of our key neighbours. How will that make us safer? We cannot crew, maintain or deploy these nuclear submarines without the express consent of the United States. That, that is the very definition of surrendering sovereignty. Um, the next big lie is, of course, the cost of this deal. Having backgrounded key journalists the night before the announcement, the government is now refusing to publicly back the $368 billion figure. That was always, it seems, intended as an interim backgrounder to a handful of chosen media to bridge us towards what the real cost is. Because last week I, like millions of Australians, went to bed one night with a reckless $200 billion deal for, for, for for the AUKUS submarines and woke up with a $368 billion problem, secretly backgrounded by the government. And now they're telling us that that's not even the figure. It's 0.15 per cent of GDP, whatever that may be. What a bizarre way of costing a project and what a way of handing a blank cheque to defence who have now been told by the defence minister that this reckless project is too big to fail. Thank you, Senator Shubridge. Senator Polly. President, the Albanese government has a three-point plan for addressing the inflation challenges in our economy. It's about relief, repair and restraint, responsible cost of living relief, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, direct energy bill relief, repairing supply side constraints with our fee free TAFE policy for students across the country, cleaner and cheaper energy, the National Reconstruction Fund and more affordable housing with the Housing Australia Future Fund, 
responsible budget with spending restraint, returning almost all revenue upgrades to the bottom line and keeping spending essentially flat over the next four years to not add to inflation. That's our plan. We understand that the rising cost of living is hitting a lot of Australians hard and it's driven by the illegal invasion into Ukraine. One of the very first acts of the Albanese Labor government was to successfully argue for the minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which helped around $2.7 million, $7 million, sorry, 2.7 million Australians, because we were always, always better when we back Australians to have better pay and conditions. We will back Australians every single day. Unlike those opposite, all those opposite want to do is drive down wages. We had nine long years of exactly that policy from the Liberal National government of those days. Our budget focused on responsible cost of living relief. They didn't put extra pressure on inflation. That's our commitment as a government of responsible economic managers. Cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicines, more affordable housing, closing the gender pay gap, getting wages moving again. That's what the Australian people know they can count on a Labor government. Rating agencies have affirmed our AAA credit rating and pointed to the fact that our budget, our first budget, didn't add to inflation as a factor in their decisions. Terms of trade are improving. We have the Trade Minister here with us in the chamber tonight, and what a fantastic job he's been doing in rebuilding our trade with our foreign neighbours and across the globe. You couldn't get a better trade minister, unlike those uh, that were in government for nine years. The best trade deal that those opposite ever did that they claim credit for is running manufacturing out of this country. Now we have acted to take some of the sting out of the higher power prices, including through direct energy bill relief in the next budget direct support for households and businesses that the opposition tried to block. Tried to block. There are encouraging signs our plan is beginning to work, with big drops in prices on electri electricity future markets. We are also focused on growing the economy in the right way, so many Australians can benefit from the good skills, get good jobs and have good wages. Manufacturing will come back to Australia with our national reconstruction policy. All week, all week, those opposites have come into this place and given their best brother's grim impressions. We've had scary fairy tales about what this government is and isn't doing, has and hasn't done. But the reality is those opposite are the opposition that are best known for saying no, and they're quickly becoming the no alition. That's who they are. They have nothing positive to contribute to our national debate. What they want to do is come in here and try and rewrite history, smudge over the failings and the chaos and the mismanagement of a government where the Prime Minister couldn't even trust his foreign minister and five other ministers that he felt he needed to take control of. So those on the other side, what they're going five, five. The Prime Minister, well, it could have been six. We will keep, uh, I think this will unravel for some time to come. But we have a Prime Minister who is a leader and has his confidence in his cabinet and his minister. And that's why we are a government that the Australian people know that they can trust. Thank you, Senator Polly. I propose that uh, the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.